My, my feelings didn't go from here in, they went from here out. And um, it's like a, a beautiful um, surrounding to your body that puts you in touch with everything else that's alive. That puts you in touch with everything else that's alive. you in touch with everything else that's alive it's alive it's alive what's up to all my robert bly fans out there i hope you're doing good from the bottom of my heart because we are on this journey together i'm here today to give a presentation and book breakdown on the sibling society which was first published in 1996 when robert bly was 70 years old. And no one could foresee what digital technology was going to do to us back in the 90s and how the sibling society could evolve into the utter mess that it is today. I'm super excited for this video because I'm bringing to you guys multiple Robert Bly interviews on the sibling society that have never been published before on YouTube. And I'm going to be interlacing them into this video with chapter by chapter breakdowns, more edits, and a bunch of other fun stuff. And of course, I'm going to be updating some of the outdated information in this book because people under 30 like myself have progressed and degressed in ways that are unusual. And I hope that I can update some of Robert Bly's great ideas to serve us better today. But I need to tell you guys about the free Robert Bly course I'm launching right now. It's been in the work for months. I moved websites and had to relaunch it and it is 20 times better. I'm calling it a course, but it's really an attempt on my end to create the greatest free resource of Robert Bly material ever. Here's some of the features. There is going to be a Discord where you can discuss Robert Bly related material with other free thinkers in a sensor free environment. Second, I'm going to be posting, of course, book breakdowns of all Robert Bly's social commentary books and, uh, and poetry books, along with assignments that I will quote unquote grade, but really just look at and give you encouragement with. And then I hope that you take that information and distribute it, distribute it online or you can post it on the course. Third, I will be compiling all the information, all the, all the Robert Bly related information from Robert Bly and other people I can in creating a well-organized resource center for people who are interested to find Robert Bly stuff easier. Last but not least, I'm going to be interviewing you guys on your experience with Robert Bly and how he changed your life because I feel like it's important to create a testimonial section for why this work is important. And more importantly than that, I'm going to be motivating you guys to create creative works of any type were inspired by Robert Bly because if we can flood the internet with that, we can continue his legacy, which I feel like is really important. And this is open to everybody. If you are a musician or a sculptor, I'm not just looking for speaking or writing. So all the information of course is located in the Robert Bly course. So go check that out once again in the link below and let's get started with the Sibling Society presentation. Peace. So what is the Sibling Society? Bly states that it's a world where we are more adolescent in tone and horizontal in terms of direction. Horizontal as in looking around us, not looking up or down vertically toward our ancestors or toward the shadow or the underworld. There is this loose analogy to the ri sibling rivalry in families. And let me know down in the comments below if you've had a sibling rivalry. You know, I've experienced this before, the favorite child, the non-favorite child, and envy starts to get created. For instance, like I'm the youngest in my family and I had so many more liberties than all my other siblings had. And they were very envious and would be so angry at my parents. Like, why can Ian do this, this, or that? And this is the result of us moving out of the idea that Foucault pushed of the dis disciplinary society that we were living in before. If we were traced, look back, looking back in history, we lived in a very disciplined society where if you screwed up, there were consequences. And we, since Woodstock, have, had, have started to loosen those bonds. Naively, however, we think that by loosening those bombs, all, those bonds, all our problems will, will go away. But this is Power dy Dynamics 101, though. The beautiful theorist Boing Toon Hall talks about this in his book, The Achievement, excuse me, The Burnout Society. And he says the contrast of the disciplinary society is the achievement society. And we're going to be drawing of, on his work today. He's an absolute genius, all of his works. Go check him out. I know you guys will love him if you guys like this channel. And of course, I'm gonna be doing some book breakdowns on him very soon. So let's hear a quote from that text. Quote, this disciplinary society is a society of negativity. It is defined by the negativity of prohibition. The negative modal verb that governs it is may not. 
By the same token, the negativity of compulsion adheres to should. Achievement society, more and more, is in the process of dis discarding negativity. Increasing deregulation is abolishing it. Unlimited can is the positive modal verb of achievement society. Its plural form, the affirmation, yes, we can, epitomizes, the achi epitomizes achievement society. Society's positive orientation. Prohibitions, commandments, and the law are replaced by projects, initiatives, and motivation. The disciplinary society creates man madmen and criminals, but the achievement society or the sibling society that we've entered now creates depressives and losers. I want to blow your mind with some mental health statistics from the past couple years about where we've abandoned our young people. 26% of 16 to 24 year olds answered yes to the question, have you seriously considered committing suicide in the last 30 days? 44% of high school students felt sad or hopeless for an entire month. And this was both the first two were in 2021 that they were polled. And then anxiety disorders between 18 and 25 year olds doubled between 2008 and 2015. I'm sure the numbers have doubled or tripled since then. Robert Bly was a seer, a prophet about what was going to happen to our society. And people like me right now, and I know you know what's going, where this is all going to go to, but who is going to listen to us? And throughout this video, I'm going to be offering different solutions, but let's hop into the first chapter of the text. I've been going over a little bit, but that's really the general idea of the sibling society and its definition. I feel very weird being the person that's coming here and proclaiming that we need to value the old values a little bit more. When I was younger, I was the absolute destroyer of that idea, a fan of Nietzsche. I also am a yoga teacher. I also am a very open-minded individual in many different ways that don't re really align with the typical conservative talking head saying, you know, we need to re repair the social fabric of society and reinstate the old institutions that we've created and that have been around for 3,000 years. But at some level, that's what Robert Bly and I am here to do today. And it's very odd. And the first chapter of this book is called The Woodstock Moment. And Woodstock is one of those big events. The, the, the whole hippie revolution is very odd because it really kicked off in, in, in a generational way postmodernism. Because if you look at the Frankfurt School, Hork, um, Horkenheimer and Adorno and all those guys, Deleuze, they, and Gut Gutier Gutierrez, whatever, they were doing their best works 20 or 30 years before, but the social theory, you know, the theory takes a couple decades to infiltrate the, the masses. If we look at gender theory and critical race theory, most of the texts that people are relying off of now were written in the 90s. Recently of the sibling society, another book has recently come out. It is an anthology. The soul is here for its own joy, sacred poems from many cultures. The sibling society is in a sense, the second book of major cultural criticism from Robert Bly. The first, of course, was Iron John, and both of them were published by Addison Wesley. Now, I notice that it's 10 years since Iron John. Is that? No, I think not. I think it's only five years. Five years? 1991, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And is that, has there been a cultural shift? Is the sibling society addressing a phenomenon that comes after Iron John? No, I think um, the sibling society being an adolescent society, I think we're in the fourth generation of siblings now. I think my generation was probably the first. We came back after the Second World War. And it was as if the war was too adult. Too many men died. We had to get back in and do the same thing tomorrow. After the war, we wanted something simple and easy, so we got a lawnmower. Fled the center of the city. So we can go on and you can think about that. Um, uh, the Woodstock generation had its own form of adolescence. The Reagan generation had its own form of adolescence. So the adolescents now have simply inherited three or four different sorts of adolescence. They're sort of drowning in it. Is this, you know, Vico speaks about the age of the gods and the age of the titans and the age of the fathers and the age of the sons. Is this sort of like the needle being stuck in the groove of the cycles that we've got age after age of adolescence? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I think so. You know, one can say that uh, all this began in 1789 when the French decided to kill the king and the god, and God. And then uh, they killed the aristocracy, and um, the Russians did a lot of that in this century. After that, you get rid of the great leaders one way or the other. And uh, then uh, you get rid of the grandfathers and grandmothers. We do that by sending them off to Phoenix or somewhere. And then you get rid of the adults. 
You get rid of the parents and then the adults. So it's been a steady movement. Maybe we'll get rid of the adolescents and have only children. I mean, who knows? <laughs> but, you see, it isn't peculiar to any one cause. It's simply proceeding in a regular line down, cutting off everything except... Well, then Vico, of course, said we'd end up in democracy. Well, we're one step below democracy now. Because in democracy, you have to have intelligent readers. And Woodstock was such a crazy time because by that time, over 90% of households in the United States had televisions. And people started going on trips together. And I love the analogy of what digital technology is doing to us today is akin to a psychedelic trip. But it actually works a lot better because, you know, I don't know if you've had this experience, but when you maybe take psychedelics with someone, you really want to get on the same level and you're experiencing the same thing. You're going on this trip together. But with digital technology and social media, hundreds of millions of people can get into the same wave algorithm, algorithmic wavelength and go on a trip together and it's controlled and sober. And the Woodstock moment really started that. We started to loosen up. And when you went on a trip, when you take psychedelics, of course you were going to realize that a lot of the stories, a lot of the things that we were programmed to think that are important are absolute BS. It's going to help some people escape abusive religious or relationship situations or gain the courage to express their sexuality. But as we saw with the, the Woodstock moment, most people did nothing with that power. The Woodstock, 300,000 people showed up at Woodstock to protest the Vietnam War, but none of them did anything to stop the Vietnam War because it went on for years after. What if 300,000 people showed up at the White House and staged real protests for the unjustified Vietnam War? And that's what's so weird about the Industrial Revolution, that people were inventors, right? Very logical and creative at the same time. They were these somewhat rigid men doing these inventions, unless you were Wilhelm Reich. And, but that paved the way, all this rigidity and this logic and with these inventions, paved the way for people to loosen up, for guys like Elvis to come. And that's what the cultures and the masses wanted. We don't want to be that guy or to be, you know, in a relationship or idolize the dude that's in his garage working for 90 hours a week on some small progressive invention. Elvis getting up there and saying, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. You know, that that's rev, that anyone can get that. Everyone went on that trip. This still happens today when we, when we like, look at the, look how beautiful this phone is. Oh my God, this is a P, but I don't, I don't freak out over the invention of the phone. But if I hear a new album or there's a new um, movie I really like, I get really into it. And we were ready to keep up with the speed of the loosening up. And obviously you can see that today. And with the mental health issues, that is the obvious indicator that we should be actually becoming more in tune with our environment and doing a better job because we are loosening up. I know I've done that. Maybe you've done that too. All the, all the progressive things that have society has given us and the ideas have helped me out way more than if I was living in some rigid Christian society. But you and I are probably the anomaly in that way. Most people use the idea of loosening up and the idea of infinite achievement to hide away in a victim's mentality, to stay in horizontal thinking and live in a sibling society. And I feel like I have a lot of good perspective on things that are happening on the ground today because I've been a school teacher now, a high school English teacher for five years now, I think. And just in those five years, I've seen a dramatic shift happen. I've basically never been out of school. I was in high school, then college, then teaching. And you know, from when I was in high school in 2012, it's gone crazy. And by crazy, I mean that when you and I think you guys you most of you guys are young enough to understand this that most people when they are in high school are idolized by their parents and by everyone else it's all about them right like you your parents pick you up they drive you to sports they help you study everything's about you and at some point like I'm, you and I you and I had to learn that it's not all about us and there's other people in the world and we have to learn to we've learned to it was very easy to be loved but we had to learn to reciprocate and love others and love the world and love our even ourselves but most people never did never did that work and we have this very narcissistic culture now and that affirmative um mindset has only gotten worse as I'm sure you've seen in the school system that basically any opposition of who you want to be and how you want to be treated is shot down. Obviously, we shouldn't be beating students or being mean to them, but there are certain values and strictness that need to be enacted on children because I view it like this, that, you know, from the ages of like, we'll say from like 10 to 18, when you're 
when you're like somewhat conscious, your parents, if they do a good job and most parents are not even present, they give you a framing. Like even if you're a Catholic or like in a very weird um, system that you, if your parents do, they'll give you a certain framing of reality. And if it's really deep, then that will help you later on because a lot of people in the world don't have any framing of reality. So if you get a very, like an atheistic or a very psych, if your parents are physicists or something, they'll, they'll, they give you something and then you have it for the rest of your life. But you have to accept that. You have to become a student in a very weird school because most parents don't understand and, and people in general don't understand how to teach and the empathy to understand, you know, let people grow. So they kind of just force it. They do this very strict forcing. Like this is how it is and this is what we're going to do. And that's effective in the sense that a lot of people by the time they get to college have at least one good framing of reality and then if they study hard in college they'll maybe gain two or three more and then when they um, get a job they'll understand a career framing of reality and then they'll understand maybe a relationship framing of reality and have kids understand that angle and you know it goes on and that, and that produces you know good people but now more, uh, more and more kids are staying at home not caring about the university system has tanked, the public education system has tanked, parents can get in trouble for trying to enforce, uh, even get their kids taken away for trying to enforce their values onto them. And it's become this weird thing where parents are trying to get love from their children, as Bly states, we're still in chapter number one here, the Woodstock moment, that parents uh, want love from their children. And of course you want your child to love you, but do you need that affirmation from your child? You are here to once again impart, you know, love and justice, but also this your fr certain framings of reality to prepare them for the world. And having them love you is not the most important thing. And Bly tracks this to Robin Wood, that Robin Williams movie, Mrs. Doubtfire. And the same thing as Bly states is happening in school. The students and the, 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 the state are running schools now, not teachers, not free thinking. In the coming chapters, we're going to be tracking the transition because at one point in American history, maybe I'm sure some of you guys are old enough to understand this, or if you grew up in a small town, the schools were very optimistic. People were optimistic. They, there was order and values. And once again, I am not a supporter of religion or any of these things, but I don't think that you can get rid of them immediately without a, a good replacement. Like the systems and institutions in our society have been created and implemented for at least two or th 2,200 years, really since the Greeks. And you know, some of them are outdated and um, prejudiced, but slicing them away in the matter of 20 or 30 years is obviously a terrible idea. And what's even crazier is that we can't understand the ramifications of what we've done, right? Like, okay, I mean, people should admit, okay, we were wrong. Like all these ideas and what we're doing, look at what's happening with the mental health numbers. This is a crisis. There was the so-called crisis two years ago. The real crisis is that, you know, 26% of 18 to 25 year olds say they seriously contemplated suicide last month. And there's a, an actual shortage of mental health care and the people who are going to provide the mental health care are functioning in a restrictive cognitive behavioral therapy point of view that's all affirmative and actually not able to help these people even though they need help. You would think that's like th th that and like the opium crisis are like the craziest things on our hands and we should be doing something but obviously the underlying forces don't really care about people they care about control. But we are now going to move on to the Jack and the Beanstalk story and that it's a really informative story about vertical thinking and how we got to where we are now and Let's get started. We'll be reviewing the 1807 version of Jack and the Beanstalk, and it's similar to the story where we heard ad infinitum as children, but there are some very cool variations I've never heard before. So, of course, the story starts, starts off with Jack and his mom. They're impoverished and they don't have any more food. So Jack's mother said, you know, you need to go sell this cow so we have some money. Jack on the way to sell the cow meets a man and the man tricks him in a sense and sells him these magical colored beans. And he comes home and his mom is like, WTF, Jack, you've ruined everything once again. So she throws the beans into the garden and they go to sleep. And when they wake up, there's this big beanstalk and Jack climbs to the top and boom, that's the start of the story. However, there are some themes here that are even more common today, such as Jack is called indolent, 
careless and extravagant because his mother never was strict or firm with him. And we see this all the time in our society now when the father is not present and single mothers are running the household, the, the children are free to do whatever they want. And I know that is a gross generalization, but it's true because I've seen it happen all the time in my personal life and I'm sure you've seen it too. A single parent can function as both parents or do a great job, but it's just a lot harder. And the, the classic masculine feminine dynamic, even if there are, you know, two mothers or two fathers or whatever seems to be pretty effective in the raising of children. So when Jack gets to the top of the beanstalk, of course, he's entered the liminal space, the other world, a, a different dimension. And Bly gives a little bit of credit to the Marxist quote that Marxists will say that the giant is the patriarchy or that he represents the landlords. I enjoy saying that too, but that's not everything because we want to figure out why in the last 30 years, we've moved from the free Woodstock movement to the world of Columbine because this, you know, was written in the 90s. And since the 90s, we've moved into something even scarier because the Columbine shooters, if you've ever looked into it, were somewhat normal human beings. They were, I, I don't want to say that, excuse me. They were absolutely psychopaths, but they went, the week before they went to the prom and they were involved in social groups. Like a lot of the, these crazy killers now are very, very detached and on drugs and have a ton, of, a lot more problems. And things have, you know, obviously gotten worked worse just because of the rate that they are happening. And now I'm going to start to read from the text um, so we don't miss, miss any parts of the story. And if you guys want to get this book, it's available for free on archive.org. You can rent it out like a library. That's why I'm viewing it right here so I can read to you guys or just go buy the book on Thrift Books or somewhere. I have an affiliate link down in the description below if you guys want to support me, but you know, I won't get that much anyway. But let us hop into this because this is where the story moves into a, a, a version that I've never heard before. And it's the conversation with the crone. So however he walked on, hoping to see a house where he might beg some Thing to eat and drink. Presently, an infirm looking woman appeared at a distance. As she approached, he saw that she was old, her skin much wrinkled, and her tattered garments proved poverty. She accosted Jack, inquiring how he came there. He related the circumstances of the beanstalk. She then asked if he recollected his father. He replied he did not, and added that there must be some mystery relating to him, for he had frequently asked his mother who his father was, but she had always burst into tears and appeared violently agitated. Nor did she recover herself for some days after. One thing, however, he could not avoid observing upon those occasions, which was that she always carefully avoided answering him, and even seemed afraid of speaking as if there were some secret connected with his father's history which she must not disclose. The old one replied, I will reveal the whole story your mother must not, but before again, I require a solemn promise on your part to do what I command. I am a fairy, and if you do not perform exactly what I desire, your mother and yourself shall both be destroyed. Jack was frightened at the old woman's menaces, and promised to fulfill her injunctions exactly. And the fairy thus addressed him, Your father was a rich man, and his disposition was remarkably benevolent. He was very good to the poor, and constantly relieving them. Such a man was soon known and talked of. A giant lived a great many miles off. He was in his heart envious, covetous, and cruel, but he had the art of concealing those vices. So the giant meets with the father, joined the father in a setting, appeared to be delighted. He really was so. Your father recommended a favorite book and was handing, handing it down. The giant took the opportunity and stabbed him. He instantly fell dead. The giant left the body, found the porter and nurse, and presently dispatched them. You were then only three months old. Your mother had you in her arms in a remote part of the house and was ignorant of what was going on. So she says that the giant spared the boy's life and the mother's, but made her swear to answer no questions on the matter, insisting on the silence on this and other events. The mother and son escaped. Having gained your father's confidence, he knew where to find all his treasure. He soon loaded himself and his wife, set the house on fire in several places, and when the, when the servants returned, the house was burnt down. And that's how Jack ended up being poor. She closes her conversation with Jack by saying, I need not add that I inspired you with a strong desire to ascend the ladder. So the first analogy here is that there is this giant looming out in the distance when we open this portal of openness during Woodstock and these events. We didn't see it, you know, they didn't see it and we don't even see it now. Now it's like really present in our reality, but we still don't understand it completely that there is this menace, there is this being and you know, and you can tell like religions like when there's smoke, there's fire, like when you, Satan, right? And all these different things, like there is an adversarial energy present in the universe. Every single story, every single monumental piece of art had an element of this otherness out there. And when you look at the 60s, this is this, this will blow your mind. What happened in the 60s is that everyone was getting exploited. All, the, all these dumb people were out there and they were getting exploited by people who knew how to take advantage of them. And so many people, especially women, got abused, raped, um, put in a 
abusive and terrible situations for years during the whole hippie movement. It was actually a really bad time because so many people were rough around the edges. Look at Hell's Angels, what happened in Los Angeles. And what happened is that after after the movement died down, there was a huge Christianity revival because everyone was so screwed up. And this is how things like Jonestown happened. Um, Jim Jones was up in Ukiah, uh, California, north of San Francisco in the late 60s. And everyone was so burnt out from all the drug and hippie culture that he sent his followers down to San Francisco and gathered them all up. And they were open. They needed, and it, there was a structure provided, right? Like the Christian church had values. They were sober. They were community, even though they were crazy and doing basically Maoist re-education stress sessions. At the start, it was a much better option than what people were experiencing. And you saw this happen all around the country that people got roped in to actually really crazy religious, the religious revival movement, because it was really just another way to avoid this otherness, to avoid confronting this. And we, and we're going to figure out who the giant is in a second, but Quote, President of the giant in the house, in our psychic house, is connected with some other house being burned to the ground. So next in the story, Jack goes to the castle. He meets the giant's wife. She takes him in. She gives him some food. The giant comes, fee, fa, fo, fum, and he, you know, he hides away from the giant. And now we're going to answer the question, who is the giant? End quote. We can take the giant to stand for our, our archaic, brutal underpinning. On our human plane, we live among sunlit windows with red geraniums on them. We live surrounded by cows and milk and kindness, by conversation and codes of politeness, by loving parents and cared for children. But on the second and older plane, which is firmly enconced at the top of the beanstalk, at the base of the skull, there are stones that have never been shaped, piles of dirt loosely thrown together, and most of all, appetites on a scale that is not human. There are immense hungers and gigantic angers in cages where people are kept to be eaten a little later. Children are especially favored as food there. And if a human being should wander off and wander into that instinctive plane, he or she had better be ready to hide. Now Robert Bly gets into this big analogy of the tripartite brain, and we don't need to go there. And all, you know, in most, so if you like look behind me right here and you see the chakras, right? You know, the chakra systems, of yoga, Hindu system of depicting the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, the relaxed state that we should be in, then the fight or flight response. And unfortunately, in our society now, people exist a lot of the time in reptile consciousness. And I actually really love talking about the brain. We're not going to get too deep into it. Obviously, read the book, but I want to give you guys some perspectives that the, um, there's been studies done on people who are like on engineers, CEOs, and people who are very left brained, who are who are very you know logical in their life, very cutthroat, and their brain brain actually had um, showed signs of atrophy in all of them. And on the other side of, of studies, they would study people who would meditate a lot. Um, people who were monks, for instance, and they are, you know, very right brain oriented and they had atrophying in the brain that most normal human beings didn't have. And a secret, for instance, that like, if you look at Silicon Valley, why did they get into yoga and all this spirituality and meditation stuff? It's actually just a very um, smart way of self-preservation that if you, you, if you know that you are very logical and that there, there's this other side to you, then you need to obviously balance it out. And a lot of monks, um, I know a lot, I studied under an Indian yoga master and he actually um, turned me on to this concept that in their ashrams and stuff, the, at least the really good ones, they spend an hour to two hours a day doing mental math, not for any reason except because they've understood just through anecdotal experience that they need to actually have some logic in their life and they don't want to do it for any reason. They don't need it for like anything else other than just brain development. So they have these Vedic math exercises, which are really cool. And obviously there are many other ways to balance out logic. But when we eat bad food and we exist in this capitalistic and schizophrenic society, we are thrown into the sympathetic nervous state, other, um, AKA the fight or flight response all the time. Cops, let me give you guys an example. Cops are the most, oh, are uh, per capita, the most overweight profession, right? And obviously cops, um, you know, there's the joke that they eat donuts all day. And obviously cops sit down a lot, right? Cops sit down and they kind of have to eat bad food, but so does everybody. Everyone sits down a lot and eats bad food. So why are cops most overweight? Because on their at their job all throughout the day, they are worried about getting killed. So they have this cortisol, this infinite cortisol dump, especially if you're in the field and every single day you're walking up to a car or a house and you feel like you're going to die. You're always in this activated sympathetic nervous system response. And it's actually very damaging because adrenaline is dumping and adrenaline is one of the worst things for your brain. I I was really into martial arts and I knew this, I, and I live in Las Vegas, fight capital of the world, and I knew this pro MMA fighter and he had to take multiple months off because he couldn't get out of the sympathetic nervous state. His whole 
life was fight or flight. He could, he would go home and he couldn't get out of it because he trained, you know, six, seven hours a day and would go home and study fighting that eventually that, that became his body's normal response. And he was getting sick like once a week and all these health problems started to manifest. So he had this really good functional medicine doctor and the, the guy told him like, Hey man, I'll, you just have to do yoga and relax because every single time you do anything, even like small things, you're putting yourself in the state and it's starting to damage you. And a lot of people do this all the time. So if we look at the common, a common citizen, what is road rage other than activating now when you get when people start getting angry they start entering this reptilian base consciousness and that's what the chakras for instance are an analogy for that we have to rise up and out but nine Bly states in one of these chapters that um the sufi said that 97 percent of people are functioning in that state all the time and when you are in base consciousness you are very easily controllable because people know how you're going to react. People know exactly what can get you off. But when you're functioning at a higher plane, you become an autonomous human being. When you rise above lust and gluttony and even all the seven sins, you know, all these reli all religions at the base have these core messages that want to lift you up and above that. Then obviously the metaphysics of them start to branch out. That's what the giant represents for us. This looming being in all of us and it creates problems. And when you start to free yourself, right, when you start to so our society, in a sense, and government, in my opinion, doesn't want to free us, right? Because to free us, we first have to manage and get over this giant within us. We have to, so instead, our society is a structure to control us, to make sure that we don't let the giant or reptilian consciousness get released, that we're programmed enough to stay nonviolent and stay in our space, and we throw in prison any or kill anyone that can't keep it together. Because if we all went up to the higher chakras, if we all went up to the Anurhana chakra and we're existing there, there would be no need for government. If we all got out of reptilian and base consciousness, there would be no more violence. There would be no more problems. You know, if I'm talking, I'm saying like on a global level, if everyone just did it one day. So governments have this weird incentive that one, if they just don't do anything, then we'll become violent. And two, that if they actually try to help us, then that is the end of them. And of course, people are going to be upset. You know, if we all woke up one day and we looked and I guess we wouldn't feel that vengeful, but we'd be like, man, why have you, well, you know, why have we been oppressed for so long? And obviously, like if you look at the French Revolution in history, the first people in the Russian Revolution, the first people that get whacked off are the leaders of that government. Let me know, let me know your guys' thoughts on this and on this brain stuff. You guys ever think about this? You know, reptilian consciousness, higher con, you know, and you can view this and from many different perspectives. You know, this is Christ's consciousness, right? You know, trying to lift us out. You know, Jesus was one of the first real champions of this cause in modern history. And that's why he's still an important figure to look at today. The Buddha and many others were onto this concept. You know, this is what secret societies are about. Secret societies understand that this exists. So they initiate people and they get him out of this. And then, you know, then the question becomes, right? So let's say you're out, like I'm out, you're probably out too from base consciousness. So what do we do? Do we either use this power to create the life of our dreams? And that might require some manipulation or jumping around and using all this knowledge, or do we try to tell everyone and wake them all up? But that's such a hard process, right? And secret societies throughout history through the hermetic thought process decided, no, we're just going to not tell anyone. And we're just going to make this really occulted information. And and, you know, just run our little groups. And in a sense, that's how they've become immortal that, um, you know, this is we're, we're going off into into outer space here. But, you know, Elon Musk, right, and others, actually Elon doesn't. But, you know, we are people say we're moving toward trying to immortalize ourselves and become immortal with AI and technology. But at some level we have because secret societies, especially ones that are familiar and, and have bloodlines, have such intense rituals, especially if they involve psychedelics or um, start at a young age that and this is what we're missing in this book that's what we're going to talk about in the sibling society iron john talks about this but if you have a really good ritual and you you know if your community has values and your children go through very deep life-changing rituals that maybe involve pain sex drugs you know any of these types of things they and they get imprinted with certain information and you know um archetypes that through the ritual they should most of the time become a certain type of person and have a certain worldview especially if these rituals keep going and progressing and they're done enough and of course there's variations and outliers and people that don't and then there's variations in personality so they're not the same but at some level certain families and cultures can be immortalized you know through children if there are rituals present because it's basically the same people with the same worldview it's just a different time with different technology and maybe a different ruling government or something and that it's really weird because once you escape out of base consciousness you can enter into this very open you open enter you open you open you go into this land where anything is possible and you can create your own reality and of course people because we're, we're talking about structure here and hierarchy when you escape out of some of these first levels of 
consciousness, right? And you enter into it, it's very scary. So a lot of people need constraints in that, like existing in nothingness and oneness without any constraints is hard. And obviously that leads to drug use and lust and overdose. So what constraints do we want to put on ourselves? And that is really the question for you and your life. And what I'm trying to do here is try to talk about the best solutions and things that we can do to conclude really the first part of the story. Jack is there. He sees that there's this hen that lays a golden egg. He steals the golden, um, he steals the hen that lays the golden egg and he brings it home to his mother. And then they become rich and live happy for months after. And this, the golden hen, according to Bly, represents the sun or the feminine radiant energy. For centuries in the West, the young had learned music through hearing, even learning folk ballads, Bach, Mozart, opera, polka tunes, dance music that the previous generations had loved. The music industry soon, soon saw that huge profits would flow from urging each generation to have its own music. Media heroes such as Elvis, Prince, Michael Jackson, and Madonna became, through the number of eyes trained on them, people with that mana that comes from the attention of millions. The parents didn't stand a chance. These people were a thousand times more excited than one's parents. The siblings understand the new music, and soon that's all they hear. Six and seven-year-olds are now listening to rap music that spouts active hatred of women. In fact, our children get most of their values from music, videos, and films. And even though we regret that, regret that situation, we have not found a way to change it. Mother and father still do teach some values, such as empathy, discipline, helpfulness, honesty, and community responsibility. But by and large, the parents are overwhelmed. Business maneuvers to substitute themselves for the parents has worked. Like the German Blitzkrieg, it took place so fast that no one could stop it. Most mothers remain in the house, but they have, like the fathers, the feeling that they are disposable. So now I have to update what's happening with parental abandonment. And we've been tricked, unfortunately, into giving up as parents our children to the state. Public education system, medical system, and many other things take precedence over parents who are trying to raise their kid with a certain set of values. And we're not talking, I mean, obviously I'm not talking about abusive parents, anyone that's violent toward their children or like yelling or crazy. That's good that those kids are getting help. But because of this replacement, people now see mothers and fathers as disposable. And because of the sexual revolution, the number of Un, um, of single mothers and parents and divorces. I mean, it's insane how many kids don't have a solid family structure. And, I, and once again, I'm not here to spat out some, you know, you need a mother and a father. Like, but if you really need two people, if not more, you know, that's what they say. It takes a whole, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And we've already, that's already been cut away with our suburban environment. So we don't have anybody. So then, okay, we have two people, right? Maybe two mothers, two fathers, mother and father, even two non-binary people, whoever. And what happens though when now one, now we're left with one. And if that person is able and maybe has a good job and can stay at home, but suddenly a lot of options start getting taken away. For instance, the public education system is not a good place for children and not even just because like I'm not here to say like because of what they're teaching and ra the radicalization no just like on in terms of learning like your kids potential is not maxed out like it should be so okay what do we need then okay let's send them to private school good private school though can cost 15 to 30 thousand dollars a year for one kid and if you're a single parent unless you are making at least six figures a year but even if you are if you're a single parent and you have two kids and you live in a state that taxes you six uh, percent and the government taxes you 36 percent and you know you have ninety thousand dollars left and but 30, 30, 40, 30 or 40,000 of that goes to private school, suddenly you're, the money starts running out. And if you are working and you are a, a, um, as a single parent, then you don't have time for homeschooling or setting or putting together some conglomerate. So what do you defer to? To online school, to public education. And I have seen for the last five years what happens. I, you know, I've, there are kids from the ages of, from sixth grade to 12th grade have thousands of hours in school. And that thousands of hours and most of the time they read less than five books each most of them read zero most just don't read books use summaries just pass exam but even the most advanced kids like the ap kids in school during those thousands of hours read less than 10 books during their whole high school tenure i've also read books and and, and the idea is very simple that if you have a private tutor for instance let's we'll talk about math and science if you if a child had in, let's say in sixth grade a math and science tutor they would only need about 100 to 200 hours of private work with that tutor with a little bit of practice and studying themselves to hit the same level to, to you know to reach the pre-calc or calc one level that you know uh high schoolers that excel reach so if they need we'll, we'll just call it uh, at the higher end 250 hours for math 250 hours for science 200 
50 hours for maybe learning an instrument. But then we have 7,000 hours left. Though in those years, what did we do with those 7,000 hours? So, you know, all this time is wasted. It's absolutely crazy because when you teach to a group in public schools, you have to teach to the weakest link and follow along. And there's interruptions and bad kids and standards and walk arounds. And then you have to test and retest. And then there's standardized testing. And then there's Christmas break. And then everyone forgets everything every year, every, every summer. You have to review again. So the reason I'm saying this, though, is that you need people. You need actual quantity numbers to do a good job at raising children in the best possible way. If you're a single parent because you have some abusive a-hole ex, that sucks, but you know, you should hope, you know, hopefully there's grandparents or friends around who can help help you because that's what's so that's what I meant that we've abandoned our children. We've abandoned them to digital technology and social media and the education system and to the government to let them and to the military. And there's all this wasted potential. Let me blow your mind. That if you that most kids, like once again, if you I, they have thousands of hours of free time from sixth grade to twelfth grade, but from the time a child is a child is in seventh grade, by the time they graduate college, so from twelve to twenty-two, if they sleep eight hours a night and spend forty hours at school, so let let me so let's say you send your kid to public school, right? So if a child sleeps eight hours a night and then they spend forty hours a week or so doing school, they will have thirty-seven thousand. 800 hours over the next 10 years outside of school and um sleeping and i understand a lot of that gets sucked up by th through commuting and other things but th what, what what is happening with those 37,000 hours let's even cut that number down to 10,000 hours right so we have school and what school teaches us and the thing if school was really really good if school was really good and actually taught kids a lot. There's tens of thousands of hours for them to develop and become who they want to be and learn financial skills and social skills. And as parents, if parents had the time and created the life with their kids, they could spend time learning things together. That's what's so beautiful with having, you know, parents, especially if you have two parents and you could, you know, take walks with your kids, take trips and do bird watching, um, arts and crafts, reading, studying, movie watching, sports. You could do things together or with them and learn and grow together. It, you are a companion and something that's helped, you know, preparing them. And it's kind of weird that like parent, now this thing's kind of happening that parents abandon their kids also that we are told and, you know, we are where they hold on to them forever that, you know, when you're 18, the, the numbers are so arbitrary, right? When you're 18, suddenly you're supposed to go into the world and do these things, but we are humans and we are supposed to develop and learn. And it's so sad. Do you think that this is an irreparable process? You speak in the book, for instance, that one cannot go back to a paternal society however attractive nostalgia might make that possibility, that it's not a viable possibility. Right. Um, but, but what is the possibility of healing constituted by? Well, I would, I don't know. I would say that, um, that it's easier to lose things than to gain them back. It's easier for children to lose their respect for adults than to gain it back again, lose their respect for teachers than to gain it back. So I would think that um, that one of the jobs of the adults would be to gain back their respect. And someone said to me, you know, Robert, uh, we each could stop trashing other people in our conversations. <laughs> that might be helpful. You know, uh, uh, Kierkegaard said he thought that the ancient world was a, a, was a world of really uh, gratitude and enthusiasm. And that what we have now is a culture of a sort of a kind of brooding reflection that never leads to action uh, combined with ingratitude. So any one of us can begin to overcome our feeling of ingratitude. Uh, what will happen after that will not be a reinstallation of the old culture, but possibly something more resembling human culture. One of the things that moved me very much in the sibling society, you mentioned in the introductory chapter that the glance of the sibling society is a sidelong glance. Mm -hmm. um, that this is one person looking into who's in the next car, mm -hmm. and that this is the glance of envy. Much later in the book, you say that the look upward is the look of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And you make a distinction between horizontal and vertical thinking. Could you make that distinction for me? Well, we could go back again in a way to the French Revolution, in a certain sense, there's two ways to look at the vertical, three ways to look at the vertical. One is, it looks upward to the parents, the grandparents, the leaders, and God. 
That's a vertical line. There's another vertical line that's not necessarily connected with religion, and that's the vertical line going up through the ancestors. And if you know someone like uh, Meladoma Somme in his village in West Africa, it's highly vertical. And they're always thinking about the ancestors. And they say when the ancestors die, it's a really good one. Then he turns into a tree. <laughs> it's those trees you're seeing when you're standing in the village. Those are the real ancestors. Huh? That's a good vertical look. And uh, third thing that uh, I was more and more touched by uh, is that there's something about vertical, law, vertical attention which is connected with longing. So the confusion has been between longing on the one side, which is an emotion, and uh, hierarchy, which has to do with power. So a lot of the movement has been to destroy hierarchy, but since they're entangled with us, the Christian church, among others, dis mixes them. Therefore, when hierarchy goes, then sadly, the vertical attention goes with it. So I'm very interested in what is longing. Why is it that all Japanese poetry is a matter of longing? Whenever a Japanese poet reads, it's all full of longing. And, uh, you know, James Hillman often says, well, we're a culture that likes a full basket. But if you go to a museum sometime, you will see an empty basket. One of the most beautiful things in the world is an empty basket. So I think that uh, one of the things we need to recover is the longing. And sometimes if I give a poetry reading and I mention longing in it, then young men and women will come up and say, look, I've been feeling longing for three months and no one <laughs> talks about it. That's what I am is I'm a longing person. I notice, though, in terms of vertical thinking, that there's another consequence of the vertical in this book. You say in your introductory reading of Jack and the Beanstalk, that the beanstalk, that vertical climb, is what leads to the destructive giant. And also you say that the brain, the tripartite brain, is at the top of that beanstalk spinal ladder, that the, um, that the lizard brain seems to be at the top. Is this an inadvertent ambiguity or... Part of no, I don't think so. I arranged uh, <clears throat> the the three brains, and that's the work done by Paul McLean, as you know, with the old brain, the reptile brain, the medium old brain, the mammal brain, and the new brain, uh, the new one, or the neocortex. Um, and the giant seems to be definitely connected with the lowest of the three brains, the reptile brain. And there's something in modern life that constantly activates that brain. Action movies do it. Anything with tremendous fear in it will activate the lower brain, which is a survival brain. Apparently the reptiles don't have the other two. So that uh, McLean would say in jest when you go in to see your psychiatrist, uh, you must remember there's an alligator lying on the, so on the sofa next to you. But the question is what to do with the, <coughs> with the, uh, the beanstalk. And I said one implication, one possibility is that when Jack climbs the beanstalk and finds something at the top, he's at the top of the spinal cord. Well, that would be the lower part of the, of the reptile brain, which is right here. If you go farther up, you come up into where <laughs> the saints are. <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting that the crone, you know, the crone is the one we've thrown away. And Marion Woodman talks about the loss of the crone in the culture for, for women. And the crone is the one that was always in the uh, traditional societies, uh, keeps all the knowledge, knows everything that's happened. The menstrual blood, instead of going out, goes inward and becomes wisdom. But that's very beautiful. And at the end of her little talk to Jack, which is left out of most of our books, she says, and I am the one who inspired you to climb the beanstalk. To me, that's very interesting, that some of the spiritual climbing that both young men and women do seems to be inspired by the crone. And if we lose the crone, we're going to have a lot of flat people around. It strikes me, in fact, that we don't know where to find the crone. I grew up myself in a house with my grandmother, who lived to be 101, so I had her downstairs mm. to talk to. See, that's why you're sitting here right today. Yes, <laughs> it, it is, um, because she said, you're always good when you're reading. Did she say that? Yes, she did. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, but the, I think the fact that we don't know where to locate our wisdom characters, where to find them when we need them. You know, always, even in the Disney versions, 
the conscience, Jiminy Cricket, tells Pinocchio to whistle for him. But where does one locate the wisdom figure? And is it true that poets who were once the figures of rebellion, at least when I was a boy in this culture, are now the wisdom figures? <laughs> That's a wild idea. <laughs> That's very wild. Disturbing. Um, <laughs> imagine such a change in such a short time. Uh well, I think that's right, because the poets are some of the few that have held on to the vertical look and the vertical longing. Why is that? You can't become rich writing poetry. You know, it turned out you could become rich writing novels, and it's a bad thing, you know. And, um, and a lot of novelists have proved how bad it was by writing really bad stuff. Um, but I think in poetry, we've been saved so far. You can get a few grants now and then, but in general. So you may as well look vertically since you can't become rich. Uh, that's one way of putting it. Or to say that we try to let uh, sink into us Gerald Manley Hopkins and Thomas Hardy and those people that James Wright used to teach you when you were in Buffalo. So I think uh, poets uh, should feel some honor in this. Don't you feel that? I think that it's, well, I think that anything that rescues us mm -hmm. from the present in its current form, from the economy and its tendrils, is something that we should feel honorably about. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask then, when you say that you don't make money from poetry, is it then that you, make, you have become both a poet and a figure of wisdom? Has that been a turn to make money? No. Uh, my teacher was Yeats. And uh, I um, have always had uh, the European view of what a poet is, which basically being a poet does not excuse you from taking part in a national debate. So <clears throat> that's the way the Russian poets feel. That's the way uh, Havel feels. So because Yeats um, you know, went and looked for mythology at the time the Irish Republic was beginning to try to give them some grounding in what they might become what they had been in the past, that had the great effect on me. So I'd, when I felt that the men were in some trouble, I started to look for mythology that might help him, them. And my teacher, Marie-Louise von France, the Jungian analyst, had already done work, such as I and John, with female stories. You know, her introduction to fairy stories, the feminine in fairy stories. She hadn't done much with the masculine. So I filled that out uh, just out of my devotion to her and uh, my devotion to Yeats. And uh, I was stunned that anybody read it and that it became a bestseller. It was astounding. It still is to me how we have abandoned our children. And that's why these problems are occurring. And something that I didn't mention earlier that Bly says is all, is the problem, is that there is this interior ju judge that gets created in the achievement society we were talking about. You become a depressive and a loser because you, you are the contrast, you are the loser, you are the person that didn't achieve. And you've been abandoned, there is no hope, there is no purpose, there is no life story or great war to go and fight. And then you are being reinforced with violent video games and music and watching people around you gain social status and get laid and do and get all the rewards for actually diving deeper into that and playing out the sad boy or the sad girl persona or the violent persona and we've become weak i mean obviously if you looked at you know from 2020 to 2021 and how we acted and how we submitted and you know maybe not you but everybody else we were shown how weak of a society america is and if people aren't even courageous enough to not wear a mask when they don't want to wear a mask because they will get accosted by some random NPC, then we're not then we're not going to be very successful in turning any of this back. And there there is like a hundred hours of us needing to talk about solutions to even get to the point where we even can start fixing these things because we don't even have the basic human autonomy, critical thinking skills to even start attacking this problem now. And like that's really one of the updates that I need to give here is that like guys like Robert Bly are far and few between. In my in my school district that I teach in, there were there there last year there was a ton of like violence is skyrocketing in the classrooms. It's it's scary. And I know this happens everywhere. Just in my district alone last year, there were three videos out there, two of which where a student was attacking a teacher. Like one was a female on female student, and then one was a male on male student, and the teachers were both older older post 50 and they were just getting beaten down and people were recording and not helping. There was another video of a girl 
um, punching another girl in the back of the head. The girl's head was down on the desk and she was just getting punched really hard in the back of the head 30 plus times. You can look it up um, online. I think, I guess I won't say the name, but, and the teacher didn't even help the student who got punched. There were people sitting one inch away just looking at this girl getting punched in the head 30 times in a row. And the adult in the room was just saying, stop it. No, no one is thinking this girl is suffering brain damage that might last forever. A teacher at the school my sister works at was raped in her classroom by one of her students. This was after school, but we've hit a level where people don't even actually care to be humane or to help people in the most simple situations. And we actually enable those people to do more. I mean, you could see this obviously, I mean, with school disciplinary stuff and with retail crime in cities and allowing people like in the city I live in Las Vegas you can steal up to $850 and it's a traffic ticket and with every single one of these problems that are piling up, we have to solve all those before we can escape base consciousness, base consciousness. And if we want to solve those problems, we either have to enter the political arena. And guess what? Guys like me, people who are sane, never enter the political arena because that you know that's a conundrum. And we're obviously not going to take up arms to do anything because that's a stupid decision. So the only thing that I'm left here to do is speak online to other people critical thinkers who agree with me because it's not like the people are, who actually need help are going to make it 37 minutes into the video like you just did. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, stuff going on at you and it feels like, okay, we just need to abandon hope. Like time to shut the, the camera down and it's all over. But it's really, really weird that we almost, we have to play into the game. We have to play the culture war. We have to get on TikTok and like try to recover some of these lost souls because we can. And here's the glimmer of hope that guys like Robert Bly are making a revival. People like Jordan Peterson and Jocko and other random strong men are actually gaining a bunch of young followers that there are still young, young all these young people who don't have hope are looking for that beacon. They're just, they just need someone who aligns with them. And like, obviously a lot of the people that like a jock or Jordan Pearson are the white male degenerates or like purposeless beings. But you know, if enough momentum can start to happen, then there can be a di diversification of thinkers in the purpose market. Thinkers, psychologists, philosophers, of all types who can speak to all different races and cultures and help people in those areas start to find purpose. Because right now the solution is just throw money at it. Say we need to throw money for mental health workers and programs into lessen um, prison sentences. And it's like that, uh, I mean, anyone with a brain knows that that's, that's going to help, but that's not going to actually solve the problem. The problem is going to get solved by leaders coming in and leading the people into, into its self-motivation and individuation. And parents are the people that are supposed to do that. We should not need a Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is very appealing to a lot of people because your father probably wasn't as smart or as cool as a Jordan Peterson. He probably, you know, like my dad, super cool guy, very smart, but he's just like a very sentimental Pisces type. And like, he helped me and still supports me in this channel is watching this right now but he didn't lift me up all the way. Fathers back in the day used to lift their sons and mothers and the community used to take people up and if those people didn't respond, they drugged them or they exiled them. So where have all the parents gone? We've lost them. The people don't, to be a father is a skill. You have to, to raise the children, that's a verb. You have to raise them up. You know, most people are buried. Most people don't even understand the skill. There's so many dumb lines that are out there. And like this happens on in the Robert Bly, Jordan Pearson sphere too. People will say, there was a book on raising children. I would have read it. You can't read a book or, you know, uh, I know exactly what my child, you know, it's like, no, you actually don't, man. No, this is a skill you should be reading. You should be getting mentored. You should be talking to people. You should be thinking about it. You should be acknowledging your mistakes and working on your communication skills and your empathy, loosening up your body through yoga or meditation. Like there is a lot going on for you to be a good parent, which is a very stressful thing in today's society without harming your child too much, because that's what is the unfortunate thing. It's you're going to hurt your child. And I'm knowing I'm setting the standard high, but you were the person, you know, and I, I get pushed back from parents sometimes on this channel when I kind of go on this rant and they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? I have to, you know, go to work and do all this. And you were the one who stuck your penis into someone or opened your legs when you weren't financially ready or emotionally ready to have kids because it's very obvious. We have um, literally tens, if not hundreds of millions of stories and 
accounts of how hard it is to have children throughout history. And if you aren't doing your job, you have already screwed up because you were underprepared. And the same excuses you are making now are the same reasons you made that first mistake and are going to continue to enable you to make further mistakes down the line. And so many people get stuck there forever. And if you're not doing that, like, thank you for being a great parent. Like to all the great parents out there, I hope, you know, one day that I'm a parent and that I, you know, have a big family and I can do a really good job. But we need to get back to the Jack and the Beanstalk story, you know. I had to go on, you know, that 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 is the updated version because the education system since Robert Bly is gone crazy, the school shooters, the um, single parenthood rate, and just the abandonment of parents. Like, I was out at the, you know, I God had to go to the godforsaken ball the other day, and I was walking around and I saw multiple families where there was four, three to four kids and they all had individual iPads, multiple families. Like I, you see this with phones all the time, but now the screens are getting bigger. The kids were walking around with iPads and it's like, I'm not trying to be the Luddite weirdo, but it's like, dude, we have lost strength as a community. Robert Bly wrote this book in 1996 and Jordan Peterson and a couple others are the only people out there who are speaking their mind and actually actively trying to change millions of people's lives and opinions. And it's sad. What are you doing? What are people doing? Like the, the, he, the people were angry back then. But the things are a thousand times worse now. Kids have a, the, the 10 million genders now. Like what the hell is going on? All right, I'm tuning my feels though. Let's let's enter the story once more. Robert, save, save me, save me. After the first encounter with the giant, the mother and son live well for two or three years. They have money, they do all right. In one version, the son, mother and son kill the hen by reaching in to get the gold a little ahead of time, like credit cards, I suppose. The hen dies and the two become poor again. Soon Jack, against his mother wills, prepares to climb the beanstalk a second time. Jack, finding that all his gar arguments were useless, pretended to give up the point, though resolved to go at all events. He had a dress prepared, which would disguise him and with something to, to discolor his skin though he thought it impossible for anyone to recollect him. In a few mornings after discour discoursing with his mother, he rose very early, put on his disguise, changed his complexion, and unperceived by anyone, climbed the bead sock. He was very fatigued, so Jack meets the woman again and asks for some lodging. At last, she consented, and as she led the way, Jack observed that everything was just as he found it before. She took him into the kitchen and hid him in the, an old lumber closet. The giant returned at the usual time, and he walked so heavily that the house was shaken to the foundation. He seated himself by a good fire, saying, I smell fresh meat. The wife applied it was the crows, who had brought a piece of carrion and laid it at the top of the house on upon the leaf. Jack, secure in his lumber closets, watches now as the giant orders bags of gold and silver coins to be brought to him. He counts each coin and his old greed is pal palpable. So Jack steals the gold, the dog's barking at him. He goes down the beanstalk and he finds his mother at his neighbor's house, apparently dying. She revive, revives with the new gold. The cottage is repaired and well furnished. The two live happily with each other for another spell. For three years, Jack's heard no more of the beanstalk, but he could not forget it, though he feared making his mother unhappy. He would not mention the beanstalk, lest it might remind him of taking another journey. Notwithstanding the comforts Jack enjoyed, his mind dwelt upon the beanstalk he could not think of anything else. It was in vain and endeavoring to amuse himself. Jack now climbs the beanstalk a third time and once more disguises himself so completely that the gi giant's wife does not recognize. So Jack's in a in a, in a copper lid and so there's a harp that starts to play. The music was very fine. Jack was delighted and felt more anxious to get the harp into his possession than either of the former tre treasures. The giant's soul was not attuned to the to harmony and the music lulled him to a sound sleep. Now therefore was the time to carry off the harp and the giant appeared to be in a more profound sleep than usual. Jack quickly determined to get got out of the pot and took the harp. The harp was a fairy and it called out loudly, Master, Master, Master. The giant awoke, stood up, and tried to pursue Jack, but he had drank so much that he could not stand. Jack runs to the beanstalk with the giant after him. The moment Jack set his foot on the beanstalk, he called for a hatchet. One was brought directly, so he soon reached the ground. Just at that instant, the giant was beginning to come down. But Jack, with his hatchet, cut the beanstalk close off to the root, which made the giant fall into the garden. The fall killed him. Jack's mother was delighted when she saw the beanstalk destroyed. He heartily begged his mother's pardon for all the sorrow and affliction he had caused her, promising faithfully to be very dutiful and obedient to her for the future. He proved as good as his word and was a pattern of affection and behavior and attention to his parents. His mother and he lived happily together for many years and continued to be always very happy. That's the end of the story, but I think it's clear that as a nation, we have not arrived at that part of the story yet. We do not know how to steal gold back from the giant. As people, we have no idea what to do about greed in general, nor the giant, nor the television that eats more and more of our lives each day nor the increasing hunger for new goods that children and adults feel. The message of television is always appetite, and as Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. There's no evidence that we will keep guns away from children, 
prevent addiction in children. Children in the inner cities are hiding in the closet now, exactly like Jack. So there it is, the Jack and the Beanstalk story. It starts, and that's what Bly says. It starts, our society first removes the father. The father has become powerless. We don't have any rituals. The men in our lives, the fathers are weak. They don't, you know, in every single level, they look weak. They don't look strong. They don't do manual labor. They are soft. They cry. They um, are dumb enough to marry people and mothers who abuse them. And this is on the flip side too. Like both sides have, we've now been abandoned completely by both energy sources. And on top of all this, we have opium and guns. And what do we do about that? That's a whole other conversation, but it's gotten so bad that Robert Bly is calling, you know, as someone who's taking this more conservative, repairing social fabric approach for gun control. And I know that's obviously very controversial, but let me guys, let, excuse me, let me know what you guys thought of the Jack and the Beanstalk story. I know I took us a lot of different places, but we are moving on now to the next chapter. This my shit. Uh-huh. This my shit. So the next chapter in the book is called Swimming Among the Half Adults. And this is getting back to the idea of the sibling society. And I just made that little edit for you guys because at some level it was accepted that, you know, in college and late high school and a little bit of after college, the fraternity, and like you were going to be a half adult and act an idiot because you've been constrained for so long, but then you'd kind of come back too. And that's obviously a flawed thing because like college is supposed to be taken seriously. It shouldn't just be a frat party, but, but it worked for a little bit, right? That there was just kind of this relaxed period, but but now we see the John Belushi generation, the 70s and 80s group, never have grown up. Still, you know, I know so many guys in their 50s and 60s who have gone through a wife or two, who are still chasing after young girls, don't, you know, have read some history of World War II, think that they think they're smart, still watch football, still engage with the, and, and in their man cave and hang out with the boys. And they are the ones in power, really, in our society now. And it's very scary. And there's a new generation who are even more entrenched in that mindset because they don't have, they can live within the phone, like the whole barstool sports generation of people right now, and mostly millennials in their 30s to 40s, are now in this weird subverted fraternity culture because they know it was silly, but now they are more on this solo dolo mission in this weird post fraternity reality because fraternities in a sense are kind of out, but everyone is still acting like they're in one. And you see this because adults, like an adolescent thing to do, right? For instance, is to attack the canon, right? To attack some of the cultural icons. And that's maybe not like the most common thing, but you know, when you're an adolescent, you know, there are certain things and structures and you want to rebel against. But usually that's a short lived process because you are going to be consumed and thrown into that. And it's a very serious thing in the community. But now adolescents can in, in a sense last forever because I have friends who are pretty smart and they found some nice you know jobs as you know salesmen or in the creative um, engineering circuit and they go to work they go home maybe they read a little bit but then they just you know get baked drink you know maybe do a little mid nature and they just game girls and that's going to be their life and I don't know if they're ever going to have children and they're living this weird adolescence even though they are smart and woke and Maybe they've even read some Robert Bly. They're basically a bunch of teenagers who think because they make six figures a year that they are an adult. But in reality, when you look at them though, they are lacking emotional skills, um, even phys physical capabilities that men should have, you know, the tactile skills and many other things. And then there's this other crazy phenomenon that's happening that I know a guy from Alaska and he is like the, um, a man's man, right? Like he is, he is smart. He reads, he, you know, chews tobacco, he smokes. He's a wildlife firefighter. And then in the, in the winter does carpentry and these types of things. He gets into an occasional brawl, kind of woken up out of base consciousness. He's a listener of this channel occasional. He's depressed. He's a sad boy. He's emotionally manipulated of manipulative toward women and unavailable and plays all these weird cards and he's basically a teenager also and of course I'm, I'm just speaking about men here but if we go look i'm sure as you know if you're a woman or if you know dated women you know that the whole you know women are just as bad they're dealing with just as much superficiality and you know just other adolescents they don't have emotional control they don't have any form of respect and the problem and it's like okay like i can deal like 
there's people in the world and if you're consciously like some of the people i just talked about they are consciously rejecting the some parts of our society through critical thinking and through reason or through their emotions but a lot of people just are rejecting and stripping everything down for instance the canon you know the western um literary canon they've never read it they don't know anything about it they don't understand that it's actually not supposed to be anything at all that the canon is supposed to be really be a place of self-exploration that you're supposed to read shakespeare and a lot of those old authors on your own and explore what it does for you and how it's influenced you because it's influenced so many other parts of life that's supposed to be some championing of western culture like everyone thinks it is it's really just th some really great works that have been compiled together that everyone should read and Bly says quote english departments always have wordsworth killers and lawrence killers but a change has taken place at modern language association conventions papers whose language excludes everyone but the postmodernist sibling are now presented and i saw that i spent way too long in the university system and in the english departments and the attacks and the immaturity and the problems and the the petty fights like you would like there are like i would be witness to phd scholars who you know get big book deals and are revered in the community edit and run some of the largest author author specific or multicultural journals out there having the most petty insane arguments that you could imagine like i was back like in my in my classroom now just going after each other about books and these things and you know about you know and there'd be like the old staunchy canon guy saying like i think we need to teach chaucer and shakespeare and they'd be like no we need to teach you know the new multicultural literature and that's all we need we don't need any of this racist canon stuff and they would just be red in the face and it was really odd to see you know people who are supposed to be you know at the top were just entrenched in postmodernism, going after the very stable english department institution that was you know a pretty good thing for like 100 years and the sibling society is a place where people don't need to mature and it's very kind of weird and we, i'm going to talk about this in another video but robert bly at some level is to blame because he really kicked off and brought the men's movement into existence and it would have happened no matter what the problem was is that okay here we go that robert bly created the mythopoetic movement but when you go to a robert bly event it, it, i wasn't there i was like three years old but for those who were there i'm sure when you were there you there was a sense of lucidity presence and maybe you had a sense of motivation you felt a change even small in your body to see all these other people who agree with you who like poetry and music and were into what you're into and a change happen but that change required work you had to go home and read and spend time in nature and have a different perspective on life and mature at some level you went to this event and saw older men and like robert bly and um all these other figures but what that created was a men's movement and this idea right that hey we're going to but what happens is that a lot of people weren't going to be able to reach that that ideal once it got those ideas got spread out once the idea was incept uh was created then a bunch of other people fell off and those are the people now who are the incels who are all the weird channers in on the internet who don't want to engage with women who hate women who hate society who believe in this weird logic consciousness and that's what's now taken over the men's movement and without that initial initial contrast you know in because you know robert Bly was doing it right but to do it right actually creates the other side which is now an absolute disaster it's the biggest joke of all time it's like i, I they've literally ruined the name like we have to come up with something new but we can't like i like i'm i'm trying to start again the men's book club and i i got some random emails from people like just giving me crap about it and i'm like hey like watch my videos like i'm not a one of these crazy radical types of figures but but i but people now associate like videos like this and anything that has to do with bringing a social fabric back or you know reinstituting some form of values with them because they like i mean dude don't get me started on all you guys know what happened i'm sure but and then on the other side we have all the crazy radical feminists and they none of them want to mature none of them want to make decisions they want to exist in emotions they want to you know like uh, uh say like the radical like we're going to castrate all men or men are going to say you know women are useless we don't need them and and it's getting so petty and so dumb now and it's setting a new standard because even if you don't believe it or don't enact it you hear it like growing up and being an internet kid I never believed that. Like I, I've always tried. I mean, I always have treated women with respect and tried to connect with them. I've never been a part of hookup culture before. But every, but everyone around me was like hooking up with people or like very distant and had a negative view of women or just view, viewed women as a, a a vessel for sex. And the women in my life just viewed men as these dumpings that they can manipulate and use and abuse. And it has an effect. It, you get jaded though. You kind of at times I'm like you know I'm viewing situations. I'm like man, this like you you start to lower yourself in consciousness the blight st starts to say that most men now never even reach the oedipal wall because if you don't have a father present or a strong father
father figure present, then you have no one to wrestle with. You know, you have no one to get up there because at a certain age during adolescence, you have this confrontation with your father because you feel like your own man. You probably maybe beat your father up physically and mentally. You're starting to have ideas and you have the future potential of your life and you're going to do things differently. And you guys wrestle with each other and there's tension and problems. You probably had this with your father at some level. I know that I did. You know, I was trying to chart out my own life where I wasn't going to be a logical being like my dad. My dad was a professor of statistics and like, you know, very unique, a very unique individual, but I wanted to chart a more unique and, you know, artistic path than that. So we had a form of, you know, we had a form of tension in wrestling, but most people never reached that now. And quote, when the son used to meet the father at, at, at the top of the Oedipal wall, their mutual anger sometimes had the sorry result of fistfights or even murder. But with many fathers absent, millions of males linger passively in a dangerous, frightening, and inarticulate fantasy world. Such a person is not free of aggression. He tends to radiate that aggression that is diffuse, non-directional, and inconsolable. The names of rock bands, they call themselves suicidal tendencies. Crash test dumb dummies, arrested development. And if you look at, like he says, like the Beatles, if you look at the Beatles affectionate lyrics, they're being now replaced with rap. You know, if you go listen to the Beatles, man, like I am, I love violent rap music, man. Don't get me wrong. And, you know, put me in there, man. Like I love it. But, you know, I listened to the Beatles are like very nice music. And I'm like, oh my God, like that. I mean, that was like literally the peak of music. If we're looking like at the Beatles, if we're looking at like Abbey Road and like some of the things and even like some of the darker stuff, like the wall, like in the late seventies, what Pink Floyd was doing, like we literally explored the light and the shadow where we need to go. But now it's just released really insane levels. And now women don't get to experience the electro complex because they've been thrown into the lie of feminism because I believe in first wave feminism and that women are equal. But I don't, the worst thing that you can do to people in this society is throw them in like, oh wow, now women are equal. Now they get to go into the workplace. No one, why, why would we want anyone to go into the modern workplace? That already ruined men. That already turned men into violent, um, violent beings or like um, introverted weirdos. Why would we want to throw 50% more of people into that. We need to create a more caring economy and world where people can function because women now are losing their ability to care for their daughters and teach daughters about caring. The, the, the great motherhood ability to care with a capital C is not present in a lot of people's lives because the mod it's, you can't have that in the modern workplace where the, um, where the fight or flight response is getting activated all the time. We talked about that earlier, but when that is getting triggered all day, you can't have that triggered, man. Have you ever been in a fight before, like almost been in a car accident or something, been in a car accident, you still, you feel that adrenaline dumping all day? Well, that happens on a small level when you're in a workplace where it's hard and you're fighting for your job and doing hard deals or like doing engineering work. You're like doing this logical work and then you go home and then you're supposed to learn to be caring. No, it doesn't work that well. So what, and everyone, like we see movies where we think we need to care. So everyone's just acting. Everyone acts like they need to care, but that kind of comes off as this very weird, aggressive type caring. Like you don't do that to my daughter or, you know, and it gets, and, and, and parents start controlling their children's lives. They think caring is like helping their children in every step through life. And that's obviously not the answer either. And what's now happened that Bly starts to talk about is that we have lost the ability to develop our neocortex and our brain the way that it needs to. Because Wordsworth said that we don't go from childhood to adolescence and adulthood. We go from childhood to nature to adolescence and then to and, and then to adulthood. And you know, I, I've been here obviously like just slamming down political commentary. And thank you for being here if you're still here. But you know, I run this spiritual ecology course on this page. I'm very much into nature. I write mostly eco poetry and nature oriented things and nature changed my life nature and robert bly helped me help me get motivate me to get into nature more and do more things in nature and nature when you you go out there you can stare and be involved in it for hours and see and feel things that aren't available now we're going to read some um a poem a part of the preludes by wordsworth to, to talk about this my heart leaps up when i behold a rainbow in the sky so it was when my life began so it is now i am a man so be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each, each to each by natural piety. My heart leaps up when I behold. Well, I call to mind, twas an early age, ere I'd seen it nine summers. Twas my joy to wander half the night among the cliffs and the smooth hollows where the woodcocks ran along the open turf. Oh, when I have hung above the raven's nest by knots of grass and half inches inch fissures in the slippery rock, but ill-sustained and almost as it seemed, suspended by the blast which blew amain, shouldering the naked crag. Oh, at that time, while well, on that on the perilous ridge I hung alone. With what strange utterance did that loud dry wind blow through my ears? The sky seemed on a sky of earth, and with that 
and with what motion moved the clouds. Television is stealing the neocortex observation time and giving a little useless information in return. A child who watches three to four hours of television a day or TikTok from the age of two loses thousands of hours of playtime, which means that he or she suffers a serious loss in the neocortex. And that's like, I am going to homeschool my children. And from those ages, you know, from a certain age, like we're going to learn and we're going to be thinking and spending very deliberate time learning. But until they really reach, you know, middle school or adolescence, that adolescent age, I am not going to be enforcing strict standards. I'm going to, I'm doing right now. And like, you know, I'm launching paid stuff. And like, if you'd like to support me, like my dream and what I'm trying to do is be able to, you know, live out somewhere in nature where my kids can spend time playing and like, I can be out there with them and like, give them that time, give them years of that time. And before we move on to the history, uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic and all that because it helped them develop and help them see and help them feel and know something deeper. You have all of your life to engage in these other things, but the mo those developmental years, why wouldn't you want to give it the most pure thing, which is nature and the love and the hummingbirds and streams and playing with your siblings and having picnics with your family, snowshoeing, hunting, fishing, skiing, even like all those different things. And like, I, I didn't, I grew up in a suburban house, man. Here I am still here, not in my parents' house, but in a suburban neighborhood. And I want to be out. I know you want to be out too, if you're not already out and we can do this together, man. Like I'm here to support you. You're here to support me. And like, we need to first start. If you're going to have children, start with that. Like do whatever you can. If you have children right now, take a pay cut, do whatever you can sacrifice what you can to help give them that nature. And if you can't drive them out there every single day, man, like I only live a couple minutes from nature, drive them out there Get, spend as much time as you can letting them have those experiences man because it's important it's really weird to think like even people like me i've tried to i've spent since i graduated high school thousands of hours in nature that we live in a world where people have spent less than 100 hours in nature their entire life can you even trust a person like that in the neocortex with its fast love of light insects and other creatures that bring fire and fire fireness to the girl or boy and that love is also liveliness and heat in the industrial society, human beings are more deeply cold each year, dumber and increasingly open to miscellaneous information produced by anonymous entities. Some schools now accept free computers with the understanding that students will turn in, will in turn accept commercials and newscasts prepared by the vendor. <laughs> and you know, if you go read the TikTok terms of agreement or terms of service, and like they basically can see everything you're doing on your phone on any app, you know, for it's like we're giving up so much now. And it's sad, man, they just go drive around your local high school when like PE is happening and like see how how mopey people are to be outside chat and they like are supposed to run a mile and everyone just walks with their heads down around the track it's utterly embarrassing like you have to force people and these kids to do anything and then kids sit out every kid's got asthma and a problem and uh, they don't even dress they'll like take the f for the day so they can wear their street clothes and it's like really sad and why says that we're lying to ourselves about the internet renaissance that's going that's going to happen and he was right you know here we are 26 years later and the internet re renaissance didn't happen we were promised something better but what we got God, was a whole generation of people who are eating their own neocortex, who can't focus, who can't think, who can't love, who can't feel, who don't appreciate the good things in life and value anything. But now it's really crazy because now we're in this conundrum where the only way out is through the internet, through videos like, like this, not to like be cocky or anything, but through people making educational videos and trying to wake people up to motivate them to leave is the only way that we can do that. I would rather be out there in nature right now and never have to worry about this stuff again. But this is like, I'm so sad and I feel it, like I, I was already out there. I had my life figured out. I had a life where I was spending 85% of it in nature contemplating my life and could have done that for the, the next seven years, but out there. I had this, the giant was there though. I felt the need and the urge and I felt the pain and suffering of everyone else still out in the city and I, and I came back and here I am again, back from Wyoming in Las Vegas, Nevada. You're trying to spread the word and create light and joy. And I real, and then I realized once again, though, that I only could do it through the internet and the internet now is we have to use the demon to get out because we can't do anarcho privatism or aggregism. We're done. The corporations will eat us up. They, the, 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 the enforcers, the police and military are now so dumb and programmed that they will take you out if you try to do anything about it. Inflation and rising house prices and all these things are making it now impossible for people to live out this lifestyle without having to sell out to the machine first. So if you are going to sell out, that's what I'm trying to do here is create a dream, turn a dream into a reality, change millions of lives and hopefully give myself a life and you should do, you know, it with nature and hopefully you do something similar. And that brings us to the end of the chapter and we are now going to talk about the Ganesh story in Hinduism. And here's another edit. <laughs> So the 
next story is covering Ganesha, who is a big for, a big figure in and deity in Indian mythology and Hinduism. And this is an updating, according to Bly, and a better version of the Oedipus story. Because in the West, we've been blessed with the Oedipus story, but it's really a very nasty story and doesn't really represent what we need in terms of a personal development story to escape the sibling society. So the story goes like this. The goddess Par Parvati has a husband and he's Shiva and Shiva is like the all encompassing yogi mystic and he likes to go off and meditate and spend a bunch of time alone. She feels lonely and is pissed off at him a lot and wants someone that who that will obey her and not obey Shiva. So she tells Shiva, hey man, can I get a son? And he's like, hell no, I'm not gonna get tied down. So she allegedly takes, finds his sperm on some of the bed sheet or something and gets pregnant and has a son. But he, because they're immortal, he goes away for decades at a time. So when he comes back, this son, their son is protecting the room, but the son, uh, uh, Shiva doesn't know that this guy's his son and uh, Shiva and the son doesn't know that that's his father. So they clash and Shiva chops off this guy's head. Obviously the wife is very upset because of the loss of her son. Shiva is, you know, feels bad. So he tries to put the head back on, the head won't fit. So he, um, he sends his men to go out and find a being. They find an elephant, the head comes on and now we have Shiva. That's the, you know, redacted version of the story. So quote, every mother wants their son to receive a new head. And when they do receive a new head, they he is somehow a part of the universe in a deeper way than before. He has shifted from the maternal realm to the social world. So obviously this isn't a story of violence, like that mothers and or fathers and sons need to clash in this violent way. And it's very interesting because many children have fantasies and have these ideas, uh, fixations on their mother's bedrooms and what it means. And Bly talks about this being a task, quote, if the father dies and the mother remarries, the son accepts the task in a deeper way. One could say such a son is guarding the door behind which his real mother and father conceived him. It will ain't anguish it for him to see a stepfather or boyfriend to enter that sacred room real or symbolic where he was conceived and we hear about this all the time there's a lot of trauma between the stepfather and and sons you know there's a lot of issues with them because there's almost this guarding of the room and if you look at the iron john story in his book iron john the key to the, the wild man to uh, manhood is under the mother's pillow first of all in the mother's room and it's interesting though because if there's no father to come and put the son into check so we, if we have a society where the men, you know, the boys are at the door, but then what if no father ever, ever comes? And Bly states that that's what happens to Elvis, you know, that's what Elvis Presley and all these rock stars and this openness becomes is that when you don't get that, when you're looking, you're, when you see Elvis Presley, you're looking at a boy that no older man ever blessed with his eyes. And I think obviously this is a very kind of weird viewpoint because there's also something happening now that with digital technology that like, obviously that some, if men aren't put in check, maybe they'll get a little loosey goosey. But now with so this programming of social media and pornography and all these different things, men and women alike want to become something so that they can have sex or the rewards. They're trying to become something to play a character. And that, that's no doing of the father or the mother. We've basically, and that's what's getting crazy we've basically been abandoned like we've ba we've been taken over like our decisions are even larger and more impacted less by our parents than more by the information and media that we're consuming so i now want to read you guys a very impactful section in full so here we go when a young man in our culture arrives at the end of adolescence the river of secularity typically carries him over the waterfall and he's out in the big world the speakers at his high school graduation will say the future belongs to you but the speaker doesn't mention to whom the student belongs he belongs to nothing he belongs to the river he belongs to the trash at the bottom of the waterfall. He belongs to light beer and sitcoms about bars and forgetting. In 10 years, his muscle will be looser than they were at graduation, and high school will be ne very nearly his last experience of form. Whether he graduated from an Eastern college or not, went to law school or not, he'll find around him a group centered on the acquisitive instinct, by which I mean that impulse toward taking and consuming. Our country has adopted that impulse instead of some religious or mytho mythological theme as a unifying theme. Many economic and industrial forces have worked to create the sibling society. The son who drifts along in the commercialized secular society with no help from elders or community, no help in preparing for adulthood, goes usually one of three ways. First, he may become a materialist, whether living in a trailer house in Montana or a yuppie apartment in Soho and the hunger never satisfied becomes the angry white male or the angry black male. Second, he may become a light-headed spirit boy, which so many did in the 60s, sitting in Zendo, flying in in to India to see the Maharishi, climbing towers at night, eating leafy vegetables, trying to embody the purity of his mother would have had, had he been better. 
he thinks, doorkeeper. It may be the road of purity, but he never becomes grounded in his own body. Third, he may go the way of the alienated, empty microphone, friends. For them, everything has come under the anti-aura of the inauthentic. Everything is already co-opted, already in act. They sit in basements or they play video games for hours. They hardly know who their parents are. There is a tendency to keep everything at a distance, to treat everything ironically, with no investments in one's investment. We don't value initiation of men or young women because we can't imagine invisible gifts anymore. Instead of listening to the passion of the gods, we watch utterly bana banal, banal, excuse me. Human beings on talk shows describe their degraded and repetitive brutalities toward each other. Talk shows are encouraged a massive regression to the literal state that should have been bypassed long ago. A new head means a whole new mode of looking at the world. To some extent, this new mode implies looking at the world in a way that is different from the way our families have looked at the world, and it implies a new mode of being looked at by others. Here's a slant, slant, a slant on John Ashbery. John Ashbery will provide fantasy poems. The Disney Studios will provide provide fantasy deer video games will provide fancy fantasy death and the internet will prov provide fantasy friendship or fantasy sex used to be the intent of those providing the first year of college to bring the student into a wholly new world often that happened now as we know college are no, are no longer provide such arrangements our colleges and universities are becoming mere training grounds for corporations they resemble factories and you know that's what's really happening excuse me oh, lights down um that in the first year of college yeah you're gonna get drunk maybe smoke some weed have some sex go through the whole ritual but at the end of it however there was learning there were great people around you there were there was actually a worldview that wasn't that's not the most important thing back in the day people went to college or university and actually learned and gained a whole new worldview but now with them being feeding grounds for corporations and for the gdp we don't have that and and it's sad actually that the right the people who are kind of championing this cause today aren't fans of the university. And I understand why they've become, you know, very left oriented institutions, but they're also very anti-knowledge. This weird Christian nationalism is starting to seep in because this shouldn't be about that. This should be about growth in any way possible, growth and love and nature. And bringing one Marxist viewpoint at universities across every single department isn't solving that problem because you're making a lot of people feel resentful. You're not having a symphony of all different types of voices available for people to grow and to learn. And Bly calls for more rituals. And he says right here, though, that the Hindus haven't done much with their rituals either because, you know, if you understand Indian society, they have a caste system still functioning. They have very, very high numbers um, of sexual assault toward women. Like there's, <laughs> they haven't figured out anything with the Ganesha story either. So it's like, you know, it's an absolute mess, everybody. Like, I don't know, like, do we have to train people individually to become better? Like, I don't, you know, as we dive deeper and go deeper, I, and like I said, I don't think Robert Bly could even fathom where, where, where we've gone with this. But next we're going to talk about another story, the wild girl, and her sister, a Norwegian story. The fairy story is the place where this book, in a sense, begins. And after it tells the story, in fact, while it tells the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, as the Opies have collected it in their Oxford English mm -hmm. language book of fairy tales, which is the best, if anyone is looking for it still, of... I think it's called the tales. classic fairy tales. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, <coughs> but you interrupt the story to interpret the story, suggesting, of course, that at this hour of the world, everyone is saying that we've lost our stories. But it's not only that we've lost them; we don't understand them, and we don't interpret them. That's right. So that's a wonderful thing you're saying. It. And it's true that about 18, in Norway, for example, the stories were always for the grown-ups. They told them after the kids had gone to bed. And the kids sometimes listened to Holes in the Wall, which <laughs> made it more exciting for them. But it was for the adults. It's a form of adult education. And a lot of the stories are too adult for children to understand. They don't have, but it's good to give them to them anyway. Then when they're 35, they'll understand them. But uh, my teacher, um, Louis Louise von France, used to say, so why should we interpret the stories? Now, I want to tell you something that our ancestors used to understand the story uh, perfectly in all parts of their body when it was spoken. But you know, with us, we have a kind of a, a line here between the stomach and the rest of the body, and so words don't get down there. We got these uh, gates. So therefore, you will understand the story with your head, but you will not understand it with your body. Now, what you must do then is that we have to do interpretation. 
which her ancestors did not have to do. But she said there's a very delicate problem here because if you interpret too much, you kill the story. If you don't interpret at all, it'll simply not get down below the head. So she said, you must use one of the forms of jargon. She said, I use Jungian jargon, but the Catholics have good jargon. Marxists have good jargon. We all use a form of jargon in order to bring the fairy story into the world in which we live. And that's what I do here. I try to bring the Iron John, I mean, I try to bring uh, the uh, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk into the world in which the giant is, in fact, television and eats the children. I wanted to ask about the sacrifice of children because it seems to me to be one of those terrifying Greek things that we've rediscovered to do. We are now not just abandoning the crippled ones on the mountaintop. We are crippling them and then abandoning them. And I wondered why in this culture that is so given to the promise of delight and to entertainment rather than education, why such a culture would be sacrificing children. That's what I felt, too. And uh, when I began the book, I didn't take that seriously. By the middle of the book, I got a lot of grief in that area. And there's no doubt that... Um, there's no doubt that the children are worse off now than they were 50 years ago or so and getting worse. So why would that be? If you look at the siblings in a family, I use it only as a metaphor, siblings in a family don't pay much attention to the little ones either, nor to the big ones. They pay attention only to themselves. So you can say that now that the sibling mood, the adolescent mood, has spread through the whole culture, that we pay attention only to people in our group, and children are not in our group. Another thing to say is that the capitalism is so powerful now that you have to have lobbyists, and the old have all these lobbyists through AARP, but the children are incompetent lobbyists. They can't hire anybody, and so everyone can sacrifice them. All of those are just contemporary reasons, but uh, an older reason is um, it makes you much more sad, and that is that there's evidence uh, of tremendous amount of killing of children in Greek and Roman times. Uh, I think they found 14,000 children's bones under an altar in Carthage. It's been a practice for years to sacrifice children, you know that, that stone that you put in the, in the cornerstone of the house and they want to open it up now to find a, a New York Times from 1921? They used to put children in there. And this woman they just found in Peru, that's a 14-year-old daughter of an aristocrat who was killed. Hmm? So therefore, we are, we are sliding back to something like primate behavior. And I think it, uh, maybe it was, I forget who, uh, maybe it wasn't Freud, but will we be the first generation who has forgotten how to heal? Will we be the first species that has forgotten how to raise its young? That's how seriously I take this stuff. Well, in that book, Kindness to Strangers, Boswell suggests, in fact, that the origins of comedy, of Greek comedy, come with the idea that the daughter has run away to the city, she has gone into a house of prostitution, and that the recognition of comedy is that a father has come to the body house and finds his daughter there. Woohoo! I didn't know that. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. It's an That's astonishing. Terrifying. It's a, an, an astonishing essay because as soon as you think of it, you say, "Yes, it's true in Dickens too." Yeah. So what we have now, are t uh, something that's is almost like this that. For the first time in history, we no, no, I can say we walk out. We see young men who are carrying other uh, children around on their backs. And a friend of mine who is an anthropologist says, "You have no idea how rare that is in human culture, for parents, fathers, to do good fathering, careful, loving fathering." So that's a wonderful thing that has happened. At the same time, we have that group. Then we have another group in which the parenting is getting worse in which it's really regressing to primate levels, in which there's a lot of beating of children, a lot of incest with children, um, in which uh, females are supposed to do all the parenting. That's what happens with primates, you know. The, the, the women, the females do all of it, and the men do nothing. So Margaret Mead in 1962 uh, said, you know, I want to tell you something. Uh, fatherhood is a learned behavior, and if it's learned, that means it can be lost. So I think that's one thing we're seeing here is a loss of fatherhood in many large parts of the population as a learned behavior. I wanted to address then the idea that one tells a story 
in order to communicate meaning. Mm -hmm. And that in this way, that storytelling has the same function as poetry. Yeah. It is the communicator in other terms of things that once went without saying and now which must be said. Uh, and we live, in a sense, even worse than Randall Jarrell's one in an age of interpretation. Right now, most interpretations are bent on dismantling yes, you're right. the things that, that they interpret. Um, and <coughs> the interpretations here in the sibling society mean to intensify, to double, to make resonant and profound the stories they are appended to. In that way, they insist in your book that stories are symbols, by symbols that stories are double. And I wanted to ask you to read from the section on what a symbol is and why we need them. Robert Bly, reading from the section of his book, The Sibling Society on Symbols. Just say, to start with, one of my teachers, uh, Joseph uh, Campbell, used to say, the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos flow down to us through the symbol. So, here's what I said. The word symbol has risen out of the Greek word symbolon, which means one half of an object deliberately broken in two. Ancient Greek, Greece was full of tricksters, robbers, and con men, and so a man who wanted to pass a true message to a friend 80, years, 80 miles away had a problem. He couldn't go himself, and how can you trust the go-between? The message he wanted might have been, send your oldest child to me for schooling and a visit, or I need to borrow $2,000, send it with this man. <clears throat> the solution was to use a symbol on. He broke a gold ring in two and gave half to his friend before he left. Or he took a small pottery shard or a deer bone and he broke it in two. If the messenger brought the other half that fit together with his, the messenger was the right person. The half of the shard that he kept, as well as the part he gave to his friend, was a symbol on. A symbol in our time is no longer a physical thing. Half of the symbols, one could say, belong to our physical world with its wombs, haystacks, yardsticks, flowers, volcanoes, porcupines, tax collectors, and body dirt. And the other half belong to the world that the spirits inhabit, from which they occasionally wave to us or peek to us naked or knock us off a horse with a shot of lightning or feed us visions of themselves. Sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, during Greek and later Roman times, a man or woman would awake in the middle of the night and see Athena or Minerva standing at the foot of the bed, her helmet on, her whole body luminous, the shield and all its carvings clear. She wasn't a symbol on. She was, rather, she was a rather pushy energy that had crossed over, perhaps to give a message, perhaps just to increase your grandiosity. Tibetan monks speak matter-of-factly of visitations from their mythological people, who wear skull necklaces and jade boots, carry swords in all four hands, perhaps have a tongue with a shiny surface in which you can see yourself. They wear whatever style of clothes is current in their territory of the mythological layer. These beings can come to us over bridges variously described as rainbows or arches made out of tears, riding on horses made from the breath of cats. These bridges would break under us. We are dense. Because our bodies are actually made of matter and gravity attracting materials such as water and zinc and lead and calcium and all those things that end up with the ashes in the urn. To gain qualified entrance to the spiritual world, then, we need a soul thing or symbol, half of which is dense and worldly and yet fits perfectly into the other half of the ring that's invisible, and it has the consistency of cat's breath. Robert Bly, reading from the Sibling Society. So, in other words, a symbol is what joins the physical world and the spiritual world. The poem is a symbol in that way. An interpretation is like the technology that explains the construction of That's the bridge. Very nice. That's very nice. What occurs <clears throat> to me is that as a result of being unable to interpret poems, mythologies, other things, we suddenly have a new kind of poetry anthology. I noticed at first when Stephen Mitchell put together his collection of poems of enlightenment. From Echo Press, we have 
edited by Robert Bly, the recent The Soul is Here for Its Own Joy, sacred poems from many cultures. But there is the request that one see the book as a prayer book rather than as an anthology. Mm. And that automatically enjoins the recognition that the poem is meant to join worlds. I love that. So I'll, going back to the <coughs> change from interpretation to deconstruction, uh, there's a wonderful book called uh, Real Presences. Um, who did that? It's the one who did Bluebird's Castle, George Steiner. And I read it recently, and this is what he says. All art from the beginning, including the art that was in, was in the caves, is trying to make us aware of presences. Put a capital P on presences. That's what Wordsworth does. That's what Gerald Manley Hopkins does. That's what Emily Dickinson does. So here we have the presences coming in from some other world and pressing against us. Is that right? And the poem, then, is a place where we stay in our physical world, and yet we welcome that presence in. Now, he says, what the deconstructionists want to do, they want to change the language so completely and debunk the work of art so completely they don't have to bother with any presences. And if they succeed, then their students won't have to bother with meeting any presences. That's a terrifying idea, that there is in education now a real attempt that we not find out about any of the presences that have visited us since 20,000 B.C. So in other words, if a whole generation of children have been wanting to believe that they are not alone, yes. the message of this interpretation is you are all alone. In, in the, the message of the... Uh, you know, the uh, construction message is you are all alone. There's nobody here except our reason and our ingratitude and our wit and our scorn and our satire and our severe depression that we're alone. I've never known a uh, deconstruction that wasn't depressed. <laughs> and I've never known someone, uh, well, I have known, but, but, <laughs> but you know, when uh, the, the presences feed us, that's the most mysterious thing. They are a form of food. And uh, that whole thing of Elijah bringing, you know, whoa, crows bringing, whoa, that's genuine, and that's what a poem does. And you and I have both been fed by James Wright, for example, and he brings presences in all the time, disguised as something else. So therefore, most people I know that are awake with the presences are quite joyful. I've been speaking to Robert Bly. The occasion has been the publication of The Sibling Society from Addison Wesley. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. me. It was a great pleasure. All right, so let's talk about The Wild Girl and Her Hair, which is a Norwegian story. This is almost the feminine version of the Ganesha story we just covered for men. Long story short, for the intro, there's a queen. She wants a child. She can't have any. She entrusts a witch. The witch, tell, you know, the witch tells her this is how you have children, and she doesn't follow the, follow the directions. So the first daughter she has is a goat daughter. When she was born, she came out with a wild goat and a wooden spoon and was riding around screaming, Mama, like what a nightmare, right? But then after that, the, the, um, the queen has another daughter that's beautiful. So this is the classic split between women in their, or excuse me, young girls in their consciousness. There's more of the wild part that is out there um, creating trouble and ruckuses and getting dirty outside and having fun. And then there's the other side that's more feminine and pristine. And both of those are around. And as we're about to talk about, a lot of the times the more wild part starts getting repressed. Next part of the story is that the, the two daughters are inseparable. And one day, though, the there are a bunch of trolls attacking or causing a ruckus. So the wild goat daughter is out there screwing with the trolls and like fighting him and then the beautiful daughter look goes out there is looking around and she gets her head chopped off and then they can't replace her normal head so they replace it with a cow head and now she is ugly. and this is an analogy to kind of a painful initiation happens to women that to the to the beautiful part of the self that at some point you know a girl gets told that she's ugly or something happens and Bly quotes Mary Pfeiffer, who lists um, Gertrude Stein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Margaret Mead, Maya Angelou, Beverly Hills, and found that quote. She found they had in common time by themselves, the ability, time by themselves, the ability to fall in love with an idea, a refusal to acknowledge gender limitations, and what she called protective coding. None of them were popular as adolescents, and most stayed separate from their peers, not by choice, but because they were rejected. Ironically, this very rejection gave them a protected space in which they could develop their uniqueness. We could say that this calf or bear ritual is the ritual missing all over the contemporary West. The advertising forces would not want it to happen. Exactly that. This is that phase that girls need to be let to go through. And now that has been subverted by many different forces, you know, including 
the medical system, the the political sphere, and then um, religion, and of course the be the beauty industry, the standards, and all these hold these standards and ideas, and they want to get rope people in for either domination over them or for money. Or if you want to go really deep, they're trying to break up the nuclear family and ruin the social fabric of society in, for malicious things. But you know, that's a little bit of a further stretch. Eventually though, the father and the uh, Tatterhood, the, the, the goat, goat daughter go and get the girl's head the pretty daughter's head back and put it back on and she's normal again the end of the story is very typical there's a marriage of four a king seeing he's the pretty daughter and loves her and then the daughter says um excuse me the the pretty daughter says or pretty princess says to the king hey i got this sister i need her to get married too so the king ropes his son into doing it and then as they're going to the wedding though the prince is riding with the caller the ugly princess and he asked her like and she he, he's like why don't you ask me why i'm carrying the spoon why don't you ask me why i'm acting this way or have this hood on or i'm riding riding a wild goat and as he asks her she starts revealing these things and robert Bly says is that why don't you say something to me millions of contemporary women address this question to men hundreds of young girls walk around with green hair and ugly leather jackets and tattered jeans but spew but few men speak to them and men are weird in the sense that sometimes men are just in a marriage or in a relationship for malicious reasons and, and they or they're trying to exploit someone they see someone you know it's like the daddy issue thing you see someone with uh tattered jeans or uh green hair and and you might think they're easy or like ease, easily to be easy to be manipulated. And that's true. You know, a lot of guys think that, unfortunately. Or um, guys just see it's another, they just don't care. They're just emotionally detached anyway. And they just are in there and they're just, ha they're happy to be with them. They're simping out, but they don't ask them like, where's all this pain coming from? Why do you have a limp? Why did, why did you, like people say this all the time. It's really funny when you hang out with people who um, have been to trauma in their life, for instance. Like, I don't know, maybe you have. And when you, like when I mention trauma, like I haven't had any big trauma, but if I, me if I mention something, it's always weird when someone doesn't ask more. Like when, if like, I, this didn't happen to me, but I mean, well, like I've been in an, a verbally and emotionally abusive relationship and I bring that up to someone and, and they just blow it off. You know, if they ask me about it, I've, I come out a little bit more and some people, they never get asked because now it's become a trend in our society to be the sag role, to do the style and people actually support it. So in, a, instead of asking like, why are you doing this? And actually trying to get to the bottom of it, people don't even, people just let it slide. And, um, you know, I assume a lot of men are listening to this, you know, probably more because YouTube's mostly men and this content is kind of geared toward men a little bit more, but a little bit of interest can go a long way. But now that's even been ripped apart because a little bit of interest may be the patriarchy, maybe you assuming that you know what's best for somebody and looking down upon them and working in a power dynamic. And yeah, so like, but with normal people who aren't politically polarized up the yin yang, you, this, this, I, I feel like it's important to learn this. I had to learn this. And it's sad now that girls and, and even boys are left to figure these things out on their own and people aren't honest with them. Now with affirmation, like having to affirm everything, it, that affirmation is the opposite of saying like, what are you doing? Like, what's wrong? Like, and you don't have to be judgmental. Like I shouldn't say what's wrong, but just asking the question, like, why, why are you doing this? That's the role the therapist or the person needs to take. Because obviously if you do nothing, if you're too, if you don't care then, but if you're too like, Hey, you need to change this. Like what's wrong. You're listening to rock music. Well, you're better than that genie. You know, don't take that. But if you just ask why that a reasonably educated, either intellectually or emotional person will be able to take that information why and then might plant a seed in their brain it might take months or years for them to figure out why or to come to terms with it but that's happened to me before people have asked me like like uh, like a long time ago i remember some um one of my mentors asked me like ian like there must like why are you smoking weed every day like and he said it in the tone like and it was almost implied like that you know something's got to be wrong that, that you have to do this every day i'm not saying that smoking weed's bad you know it's probably you know it, it's i i smoke weed but i don't need to do this why do you need to smoke weed every day and i had to sit there and it took me you know maybe two more years to figure that out it took me a little bit longer to really understand why i had to numb myself and i was numbing myself because you know i felt that i i didn't know how to i was feeling intellectual inferiority that 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 complex had among uh one of many things that that had come to come to a head because all throughout high school i in middle school i felt like i was misunderstood and not not taken seriously as an intellectual just because i didn't care about school and then when i was in university i had a series of concussions that left me not able to read for almost a year and I had to work my way back from the ashes and like relearn everything I had learned and you know I felt like this attachment to feeling because when I couldn't read and I couldn't think or do anything I all I could do was feel and I, I was always a thinker I always relied too much on the right side of my brain but then suddenly I couldn't use logic I couldn't think 
So all I could do was feel, and what made me feel a lot easier was, you know, uh, weed and other psychedelics. And eventually, though, I had to realize, like, hey, I need, I can feel without this, and this is impairing my log log logical ability, and that's why I've basically have stopped doing that since I have figured all that stuff out and resolved it. And it sucks, though, because here I am. It's taken me till 22, 23 to figuring, figure out at least a lot of this stuff, and then even longer. I mean, I really didn't figure out a lot. I'm still learning stuff all the time. You know, I didn't understand how to stand up for myself in relationships until I was 25 or 26 like these are all lessons that through some of these rituals um if my family and community did a better job not to blame them but i was raised on tv and alone basically you know and left to public school where no one no one wanted you know really nurtured me or cared about what i was doing and so suddenly i'm thrown into the world and i'm sure you've had a similar experience in certain aspects of your life that you are figuring out stuff way later than you needed to the next chapter on text is what daughters stand to lose or gain in a sibling society and i'm not going to go through the first 10 years of the traditional stages it's very typical um, Bly kind of gets into, of course, that the idea that even as soon as conception begins, that you are affecting the baby, which I, I would say I believe that, you know, even just if you look at epigenetics and things that, you know, from every single thing that you're imprinting your child with, the food, the thought, even while they're in the womb and in life in those early formative years are important and can impact them. Like I was never breastfed and I didn't get to co-sleep. I was just basically put in a crib since night one. And I think about that and, you know, I'm circumcised and like, I'm like, damn, that's a lot more more pain that's a that's a that's the type of pain that like very neglected babies experience back in you know 100 100 plus years ago you know most babies even in the worst circumstances were breastfed and were close to their parents and didn't have parts of their dick chopped chopped off for um religious things and i know i'm being a little bit blunt here but that you know i it's like that like what could have been if like these simple things and then obviously and this isn't like oh Mommy and daddy didn't take care of me, but when you like, it's hard to gauge like what these things did to you. But when we raise the next gen, next generation of kids, I'm not going to make excuses about my life, but why wouldn't we try to do the best job for the next generation of children? Try to reduce the amount of C-sections, like the amount of C-sections are skyrocketing for no reason. You know, even though we have more information about birth than ever, like what I was talking about earlier, there the C-section industry is a for-profit industry, but that's not the best thing for a ch child to just to get ripped out surgically when infant and mother mortality rates are, if not increasing, sta stabilized over the last 50 years, and they've actually are kind of high in a scary way, but C-sections have increased like five or six times, if not more. And the way that you, that doctors pressure parents to do certain things, you know, and pre like C-sections and vaccinations and other things. And I'm, I'm pro-vaccination, uh, childhood vac vaccination, like whatever, that's fine with me. But, and uh, maybe you have a different opinion, but like, you know, but the way that the, the dialogue around these things is very suspect and it's very pressured. And I think that just has to be addressed here about the sibling society that mothers, I mean, and we can look at kids having access to screens and um, bad food, red dye number 40 from age, you know, from an early age. But Bly's not talking about that. Bly's talking about Royd and the mother, the daughter, a daughter's attraction to her father. During adolescence, the attraction to the father is for many daughters intense, bodily, riveting. There's some fl flirtation with the father and there's the continuing struggle not to be overwhelmed by the mother's natural power. Some say that the daughter's main task in this stage is to renounce the father for both son and daughter, and the task is to renounce the forbidden parent without repudiating the gender. To renounce the actual father may be heartbreakingly difficult. Carol Gilligan has spoken about the slump girls get into around the age of 13. Before that age, they tend to be feisty, full of opinions, ready to jump in. At 13, many girls become abruptly vague. They say things like, I don't know, when asked for an opinion. They no longer raise their hands, they lose a voice. And, you know, having taught, you know, middle school and high school, like, this happens all the time. Like, there's this shift. Like, when you teach 6th and 7th graders, usually, they're very they want to talk they want to say everything they don't like girls like they they're in but then at four, 13 14 50 suddenly and it, there's this slump and like a couple are like still open but it's like i'm pulling teeth with some of these people and it's actually very sad decline in self-esteem because of verbal criticism from other girls is one a longing to attract boys and these are the reasons it happens attract boys is another and a disappointment at their own perceived devaluation and the culture is a third the girl may have decided her smartness will not help her in a task of affiliation or participation which she feels important her own mother does not have an authentic self, creative, energetic, desiring what she desires and acting on those these desires. The daughter may fall into passivity or put all hopes for liberation.
deliberation and creativity on a boyfriend. This loss of self can amount to a loss of intent that in turn can lead towards submission to a dominating male. She submits, she may begin to feel like nature, which is traditionally submissive to man. The self is found or refound through remaining social in every way. Women do not separate, do not so much separate from their mothers as recognize their mothers. The more active the mother is, the better, because the interaction of the two active beings will have more desire and intent. Somewhere inside herself, a girl may sense that her mother's source of power lies beyond, bound in her ability at self-sacrifice. In certain ways, self-sacrifice means exactly what it says, that the mother's self, her intent, her creativity, her inventiveness, her power of invention, intervention in the world, even her sexual desire is sacrificed for the sake of family and children. Fewer and fewer young women want that power. And, you know, yeah, that's that's deep self, self-sacrifice for family. That's, that's hard. And the solution, supposedly, is that there needs to be a mother figure that has sexual expression, that has an object of desire, that has that, and that can help the daughter become more social. And when I think back, girls who I know whose mothers at least had, we don't need to talk about sexual flair, just a sense of flair about them and personality, their daughters really thrived off of that. They really felt good and did a good job. And now like we're on a second or third generation of, you know, the 80s and 90s sad girl parents and the parents who are detached or just corporate, you know, a bunch of corporate uh, yuppies. And that's why women now have become so cutthroat in the dating scene. They've seen their parents. They don't, there isn't that charm. There isn't that flair. There isn't that inventiveness and creativity because those things have been rammed out of everybody, honestly. But women are the new kids on the new people on the block in terms of the workforce and once again as we talked about earlier i don't think being in the workforce as a male the common general workforce is a very good thing for males or females doing a soul-sucking job in the name of monetary profit so you can live in a cardboard you know in this little drywall house i don't know if that's why would we want to put that on anybody's plate so when teenage girls aren't initiated through into motherhood into not like through sex but into the idea of of the great mother through their aunts their grandmas and through attention from females in their life they gain this narcissism it all starts becoming about them the feminine goes um malignant and you know the malignant feminine is a very scary thing I'm, I'm sure as some of you guys have noticed before and when it when that starts to happen it extends and this is what Bly says it extends boys adolescence this is what happened to me I just kept getting I felt at least I, I I would say it was true I just kept getting like very narcissistic very self-centered partners and that just made it made me give up for a couple of years I didn't date for a couple of years because I was just like I'm fucking done with this like I can't do this like I dated this one girl and it like I remember I broke up with her because like nine months in the day and she never asked how I was she never asked me about my like we'd go out or like do stuff and it was like fun she was like cool or whatever but like it would just be all be about her we talk about her and maybe she'd ask me about like if I brought something up she might but she would never like outright ask like hey how are you doing like what did you do today like how's your life like what are your journey like, it was really weird like there was like you know I don't need this to be all like be the Ian show but like that you know that that's like a very very common thing and like I'm like as a male having to be the one, and this is like really common, like, and it's weird because guys will do this because it just gets them, they just want to get laid, like find a girl on Tinder, find a girl, they go out with them and they just keep talking to the girl. No, that's the strat, right? That's the pickup artist. Just keep them talking. Don't talk about yourself because everything that you can and do say will be held against you. And so just get them talking. And then once, the, you know, then they'll be like, wow, I really like this guy. He really gets me. And it's like, yep, I'm just listening to you blab on all day. And that's, but that creates a conditioning that, oh, this is, these guys do this for me. So the guys that don't listen and want like a half and half or, you know, whatever, a more balanced conversation, they're dicks or they're, they're, they're whatever. They don't get me there because having to listen is very, it's a skill for one. And you know, it's maybe not as fun for them. So something that's happened is passion has disappeared. We know that passion has always been associated with the overwhelming power of moral and social law. Lovers broke those laws to achieve passion. Bad Dinter says, by admitting that the heart is no longer outside the law, but above it, we have played a very dirty trick on desire. Romeo and Juliet, in contrast, prefer to commit suicide together rather than obey the law of their fathers. And Bly talked about this before, I think, in my big review on a little book, human book, a little book on the shadow by Robert Bly. That he talks about how we used to have this longing that you would wait for months. Sometimes you wouldn't see your partner for months. You might, if you were lucky, you got to write a letter, but sometimes you would think about them for months, even in an arranged marriage. You're like, okay, in a couple of years, you're going to marry Sally Joe, and you might see Sally Joe a couple times a year at a festival, but you would think about each other and maybe you'd interact, but there'd be this longing and this magical power. Have you guys ever felt that before that like, you know, you couldn't be with someone? I know it's kind of harder with technology, but I mean, this kind of happens like when you have a relationship that like before it happens right like you meet someone and they're a friend or something and or like 
colleague, peer, and you meet them and then you date them like six months down the road and then you talk about it and you're like, man, I was thinking about you all the time. And like, then when, like, it, there's something else there. And like, that's happened, like, with my current partner. Like, we didn't date for, I met her like nine, 10 months before and she was with somebody. Um, when I first met her and then and this was at university and then we had a class together and just like the timing wasn't working out like we had we talked a couple times like after class but then you know I've just we were just taking things slow but like after you know nine months finally it, it clicked and it felt really good to have like some longing and desire because I felt it like I was like oh my god and then like even the courting period like even the period of us test texting and stuff just like the timing because we were so busy with jobs and stuff like took us a month to go from like basically where most people hop in to like the point where we were you know like okay now like we like each other and like we're, we're a thing or whatever and i think that's like a really cool you know it felt really cool it felt really authentic and natural and you know i didn't need to meet i didn't meet her on bumble or something and it was instant and i didn't go through it was like a very natural and cool process and i was i'm really happy i you know got to experience that and Bly says that now it's we're we're not moving into we're moving into the resemblance model Back in the day, relationships were hard and you had to do that because romantic love wasn't the main thing. A lot of the times you were in a arranged marriage or just married someone and you had to learn love. So there was a lot of growth in communication. But now because of the enforcement of androgyny and the, the loss of the, the, the of deep masculinity and femininity, the an, anima and an, an, animus on both sides, you know, and the ability for everyone to explore it doesn't even exist anymore, supposedly, right? Like, you know, this what I'm talking about it doesn't even, it's not even supposed to exist. So like everyone's becoming the same in media. And like we talked about earlier, how social media and technology puts us all on the same trip. We're all becoming the same. And it's a lot easier because we all can connect on the same things and we don't have to um, work so many things out. Like back in the day, like when I grew up, my, like my parents were part of different political parties, maybe years were too. Like that was very common. Like someone was a Republic, dad's usually a Republican, mom's a Democrat. Like that was pretty common. And there was no issue. There might be some bickering, but you know, George Bush and George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton weren't that far away from each other. But now like politics has become so polarized and so crazy that I know people, I know people who get mad at me for just being apolitical at all. I'm like, yo, Biden and Trump are both really dumb. This is all gotten way too silly and way too weird for me to even take this seriously it already wasn't serious with bush and obama and bill clinton you know lolita the lolita express like come on now you know two unjust you know two random wars that lasted for 20 you know lasted for decades like i'm not involving my, i'm not going to put any energy over here but now people get mad at me like you have to you why you don't have you know um you know it's like orange man is bad or orange man's gonna save us all and it's like no i'm just going to avoid avoid all this so to conclude this chapter when young girls and teenagers don't have that structure or that gentle but just authority and a father figure or in a mother or from society and are getting bombarded by images in the marketplace and expectations that loss if we looked at the norwegian the, you know look at the norwegian girl story a lot of these processes don't happen a lot of the a lot of the stature that's required isn't created and people then then they just get you know men and women this happens to everybody now just get taken along on the river um and well i mentions um high rates of women in monasteries and as nuns and in churches and being born again christians because that's the way you know that's just very um that's the the feminine archetype that's the um right side of the brain right just in belief and in something a savior that and that's and in government even if we look you know that's who we look at some level, you know, women have now on the right an idolization of Trump and on the left, the idealization of the state. And this is supposed to replace the father. The father is now getting replaced. And the mother, as we'll talk about maybe in the next chapter about boys, is being replaced too. And that's, I feel like that is very problematic. And over the long term, in a psychological way, that's not a good thing. And there's also this thing I guess I should talk about right now is that why, why don't women, and this is a generalization, I know probably a lot like if you're a woman and you're listening to this right now, this doesn't apply to you, but mo a lot less women than men care about like psychology and not, like not like CBT, but like just even pop psychology or just like personal development psychology, looking into psychological things like this book and other things and their own personal psychology. There's all this work out there on masculine psychology, but there's very little on like, for instance, feminine psychology. There's this huge differential in the field and in the people practicing it. Why is that? And let me know down, let me know down in the comments below. I don't necessarily have an answer for that, but I think that does have an impact that the more people, the more books I've read on psychology and thought about it and explored a lot of the concepts, it's helped me. And I assume it would help anyone that also did it. Because I didn't have any problems before, like like I was talking about earlier, 
like given some story about like me having some intellectual inferiority that was that's like a small problem compared to a lot of other people's problems like i could have lived the rest of my life with that problem and been fine so like i at you know and that's the other weird thing about psychology like the people that are in it are like just like moving through the weeds and the other people haven't even cleared the forest yet they've like not even cleared the forest to then clear the valley and here we are like you know clearing the weeds in the valley that we've already cut so our next chapter is going to talk about what happened to boys in the sibling society. So let's talk about boys when they hit around 10 years old and start entering adolescence. Something that starts to happen, maybe not so much anymore, but I think in it's weird because like femininity, for instance, is now more accepted for men, right? Like men can be more feminine, more emotional, and that's cool. But now it's being almost manufactured like this. And you can see that in the dress, like it, the external doesn't mean feminine. The, fem the feminine for men and masculine for women is something internal. It's something that comes. It's a power. And, you know, sometimes I'll wear nail polish just for fun. My girlfriend will put it on me. But that doesn't mean that I'm feminine. M my femininity is more, you know, I like to poetry. And I like to feel and cry and do yoga and contemplate nature and um, connect with people. And, like, I had to build that up and accept that. But at age 13, you know, I when I was going through adolescence, I didn't want as much to do with that. Like, I guess I could be, I either wanted to be, like, trying to be masculine, even though I was the least, ma like, not able, I wasn't, I was skinny or or sexual like any of these things but fe like Bly says right here the last thing he wants to do is have traces of femininity in his body because you want to live up you see these heroes on tv you see these people or the boys in your school and you want to be like them what starts to happen is men start start bullying belittling belittling females and being jerks to them some of them never escape this because they are rejecting this feminine the feminine within and this battle starts happening that sometimes you know he can you know the boy as you get older you are very masculine you are able to do things that like um, that are wonderful but then other times you're clumsy and like really goofy and like you're trying to find yourself your your masculinity in it but it takes time though and you know when you have the deep sexual desires obviously you're becoming sexual for the first time and you have this external appendage I love this passage right here. His mourning is not for his lost mother. It is deep, wordless, the grief of an exile. At another moment, he is at home on the earth for the first time. Trees and their leaves are astonishing. Children move like walking jewels. The face he loves has a beauty so deep that he knows it is divine in some way no one else understands. He understands classical music. He experiences exalted emotional states. His lofty companion reminds him to think about perfection. The lofty companion loves perfection. He has given up on his parents. He still wants society to be perfect, so he becomes a rebel. He'll be a rebel for a while, and yet he feels life hasn't begun. Sherwood Anderson said he felt at this age if he were walking on fairgrounds the night before the fair starts. Two hazards, hazards excuse me, lie ahead. One is that he will plunge in, on, into life too far or too quickly and end up as a coarse person, cheating on everyone unfathered, un mother addicted in jail the other is that he will retreat into isolation and make his life perfect with the computer he'll be excited but now he will have fallen out of the community and will be alone he doesn't know about feelings he thinks excitement is the door to feeling but all he gets is more excited he's an adolescent adolescence has been for fortunate boys an amazing experience some cultures considered adolescence a state of its own only slightly transitional like a butterfly state a world with a world of its own with its own air fire earth and water as adolescence ends if there's no effective initiation or mentorship a sad thing happens the fire of thinking, the flaring up of creativity, and the bonfires of tenderness all begin to go out. It's as if the army corps of engineers channels wild rivers into concrete banks. This happens to many boys, perhaps most. They become consolidated. They take a what is around them. The pulp cutting job, the few local opinions, the drinking culture, the vocational school, and they consolidate. They feel they have decided who they are now. They have no time to feel the traumas, and now the, that numbing pain, numbing of pain takes over. Th that numbing often becomes the essence of male life, much more the essence than domination or power over others. They adopt their dad's way of holding it in. They store anger in their bodies, but worse, as John Lee has said over and over, the men do not learn how to express the anger in a healthy, eloquent, or fruitful way. They experience anger, but they don't know what to do with it. The man who remains creative will make art for the rest of his life out of the remnants of infantile and adolescent conflicts. Other men, the end of adolescence means the shutting down of expressiveness and fading out of the fires. That is the way it has been for hundreds of years. And I've, I mean, most of you guys are probably old enough to have seen this unless you're in high school right now that, you know, your friends, all these people, all these people that were cool or had that energy in high school or when you were younger with them, it's all gone now. I can 
honestly say that every single one of my friends from high school, and I had some great ones, people with 10 times the potential I have are now consult are now all consolidated, all have given up, all are never going to tap into that creative body again, minus some crazy near death experience and poverty and a couple other factors and new relate like it would take a miracle for these people. And those my friends, I feel like lasted longer than most most were already consolidated in high school and it's getting worse now because the computer like back in the day yeah all the guys went off and they drank there was the drinkers the guys the mechanics the vocational schoolers the guys who just got married or started working a normal job and gave up but some people made an attempt or at least acted like they were going to make an attempt through college or something to become something but now attempts at creativity are for instance trying to just become the next mr beast or like something dumb on youtube a lot of the past now aren't like i'm going to become a novelist or i'm going to become some you know grand person or have these grand dreams the grand dream is either to get the college degree and get the job that's lined up at the end of that or it's some weird appeasing of this new creative market that's out there on youtube and tiktok on and on instagram like the real artists and novelists and writers are falling away and it's sad because the computer and technology has now been added into this and let me know like and i guess this is a eulogy for all the boys and young men that fell man all the guys that i knew all the guys that you guys knew that are now gone who now don't have that creative spirit like you know i hope the best for them and i mean i, I i'm 99.9 percent .9 sure that all of them aren't helping their sons achieve what they didn't achieve that's always the grift right like always the dumb thing like i always i've and i stopped questioning my friends on this they're like I'm doing it for my son or like I can't get a divorce even though I hate my wife complain about it all the time because my son or like my family I'm like what kind of son what kind of guy is your son going to become when he's watched that you got into a bad relationship that you're where you're getting emotionally and verbally abused and you're not happy and you don't do anything you never did anything with your life and you're working a job that you never said you'd work and the same goes for your wife what kind of what kind of what kind of son are you going to raise you know have and i you know i don't even maybe we shouldn't even do a eulogy we should just send them off with their budweiser and their complacency and hope that we can make a change with some younger generations and let them fade off into into their laziness because that's what it is no one everyone had the opportunity everyone knew like here i am still trying look i have 700 and what 30 youtube subscribers and i've been trying for three years and i've you know everyone i tell like i'm doing this i'm one day i'm going to become big i don't know if i'm going to become big but i'm going to keep trying i'm going to keep doing it and keep showing up because that's what matters what matters is putting work and art out into the world even if it has no impact or has no meaning and i should say good art art that is hopefully crafted not some crappy art like i always will get emails from people like i know none of you guys watching this and do this like first time listeners will send me their their book they're like i just wrote this book i wrote my first book uh do you want to read it or like here's the first poem i ever wrote you read it for me i'm like dude you want to go write 500 and send me one then send me I, i'm fine with reading your stuff but don't send me send me something good don't send me something like hogwash and, and and Bly says right here that this is because we don't have mentors in society that the lack of mentors is creating this and luckily I had one English teacher eighth grade Mr. Stewart Christopher Stewart this dude gave me Camus and Dostoevsky um Siddhartha by Herman Hesse all these different authors and just every single time I'd be like I read it and I wanted to like show him that I was smart he was the only person that like got it he was like wow this kid understands this kid's reading existentialist is really into the stuff and he got me and he helped me out and he helped me grow into you know and without him i wouldn't be here talking right now i would have no art in my soul because i i think about everyone i've met in the course of my life that i would have met none of them would have motivated me like that no one on the internet even i would i would have never found robert bly like all these different things that would have happened the people i would have come into contact with in my life wouldn't have helped and a problem is starting to happen there are a bunch of losses obviously that happen and for men or you know young boys and teenagers right now so obviously we have hookup culture we have an old we have hookup culture and the, and and the sexual stuff we have on the attack on masculinity even being masculine itself is wrong there's economic hardships including with inflation and this manufactured economy there is the trap of technology and staying in your room there is the trap of every single thing now that masculinity has turned into being toxic this music is shit more broadly the ridicule of masculinity that has poured out of comic strips from homer simpson if we look at south park and family guy and all the stuff and it's sad if you look at internet culture and reddit it's all just crapping on people it's all just crapping on ideas we don't have the space to speak anymore like yeah like anytime i'm in a public forum with men and i try to say something i'll maybe get some agreements but then there's always just the shit poster or someone just being mean and it's like dude i'm this isn't some high stakes situation i'm just expressing ideas and we can disagree or like move through these ideas and in the university classroom this happens there's just these attacks 
everywhere and masculinity has been turned into this toxic weapon and you know the and feminism and politics has now taken this up and our whole culture is toxic like the other day on the channel i was just getting some really rude comments so like just people were mad that i i gave a bad review of a book that they supposedly like so they started telling me that i'm you know i'm balding and like all the and they were just like and they just started one-upping each other about me and i'm like dude these people have watched like two minutes of one of my videos and they're just and i understand that's the internet but like what? as you know back in the day if you acted like that you get smacked around and even though i don't agree with will smith and i never agree in violence in any situation maybe that's what's happening maybe we've gone too far with comedy you know there's this veil over comics right that i agree with that comics should have free speech but then like when can you go too far like the rule is like you can never go too far and i believe that but now that i'm hearing this i'm like when you guys set the standards for society when you guys are the you know torch of how far we can go how far we can go and what we can say and do and you were being overly toxic and i know it's just for fun but people mimic this people's parents mimic this when you see and grow up with like my my generation with like family guy and stuff everyone makes fun and makes the same jokes and turns into everything into grotesque things and that's fine but and robert bly was 100 percent right what he predicted happened what he talked about happened now with the incel and the whole online chan whatever community men have fallen men have become simps and a bunch of online shit posters are just worried about their hedonistic pleasures. There's so much weakness. And once again, we saw that in the last two years that men didn't stand up. That men, who I know disagreed with a lot of the stuff that happened, didn't do anything and submitted. I don't, you know, I, I, I'm I, not here to say like who's right or who's wrong, but if you disagree with something and you don't do something about it, like for instance, if you didn't want to wear a mask or you didn't want to participate with the mandates, but you went along and did it anyway, even though you once again disagreed with it on a moral and on physical spiritual emotional mental level and you went along and did it that was very sad to watch people doing that and making excuses for those like you don't have to do this i didn't do it at all it was as simple as being man enough to walk in and then if someone said something about it just walking out and then trying another place and eventually you find a place that lets you patronize it and then you leave and you do what you want or a place that you can work there's always going to be a place that feels a similar way as you and you'll figure it out but that didn't happen this generation these guys that these kids these 10 year olds that robert Bly were talking about we're, we're, we're then 35 years old when all this, when, you know, what happened a couple years ago. And we didn't just utterly fail. We did nothing. We didn't just do less than nothing. We just reverted to our online world and just started getting, turning things toxic online and acting like arguing online and saying things and get, you know, calling people sheep or like doing that was going to change it. So now we're going to talk about society and economics. And something happened, right? If we look at, the, and I would recommend everybody, like go read Murray Rothbard's Economic History. Here's the book right here. It's called Economic Thought Before Adam Smith, an Austrian perspective. And this is a very libertarian, if not anarchist perspective on the development of economics. And Rothbard would disagree with some of the things that Bly says that for instance, like when, John Locke and Hume and Adam Smith, you know, in the Wealth of Nations, talking about the invisible hand and opening up the markets. That created problems because it ruined and they they started using it to, to exploit the farmers and it ruined that natural slow lifestyle. And we've moved into acquisic, acquisic tyrannical capitalism because like, I understand, I'm not, this isn't, don't worry, this isn't a call to communism. But when we have un, untethered capitalism, right, with a bunch of people who just care about capital, because when you think about capital, capital has an infinite amount of dark potentiality. It can cut through anything. Like, for instance, when you look at the exploitation of nature to fund our society of excess for no reason, and you see how we've treated nature, for instance, you know, over half of mammals in the last 100 years have become extinct and the billions of birds and other and maybe even trillions of animals that have had to die for our conquests and our growth. It didn't need to happen. Like I understand that we need to progress and that this is, you know, and we should should have the right to be free in our business practices. But that is a very low, that is the worst way. We've gone the route of doing the worst way with how we've gone about creating our world. And people will be like, well, now more than ever, we, we live in a world where we have the, it's the best time to live. Well, it doesn't seem that way because most people aren't really living. They have access to comfort and medical technology, but how many people actually see the trees? How many people actually feel the wind in their face? And does our structure enable that or prioritize that? Prioritize family or prior, you know, the things that matter, the things that money can't buy. It seems by getting money, we eliminate feeling the things that money can't buy and having access to that and the time and the space and even the desire for the dark potentiality of capital will go in and exploit workers in other countries and people all just for capital, all just to keep creating GDP and make profit margins. You know, people will dedicate their whole life to, you know, buying goods and selling them for two cents more. But if you do it 10,000 times, you, you make $20,000 or whatever. That math wasn't right, but, and Bly argues, this is, I feel like pretty ironed out now that this work ethic, it's this weird process, 
Protestant work ethic, this Puritan worth work ethic that we've been programmed with, especially in American and Western society, that the most important thing is business and making progress and making these things happen. And it gets worse and worse because the more that we do it, this is the boom bust cycle. The more, the larger the economy becomes and the more inflation happens and problems start to occur. You know, back in the 60s, you could work a close to a minimum wage job or like just a as a concrete worker or a construction worker and you could buy a, a nice house on a nice plot of land where you can farm and you know have have a good time and like live a decent life now if you know you get a good job that pays six figures a year that you spent you know four to eight years in college for and have worked hard for and you have to go and grind on a computer screen unless you live in the midwest or in the south the places you probably don't want to live you aren't going to get that patch that nice house with the you know a big you know yard that's a couple acres that's maybe not realistic anymore. And we've created a world where we, we, people are shooting for to live in a condo for the rest of their life or in an apartment complex. And it's so sad. But to not live in the apartment complex or the condo, you have to sell out to the system. There is no more way out anymore. I guess if you want to do commune living or like really, you know, build, build your own house if you want to learn those skills and buy a cheap piece of land and get off the grid and go into the woods. But I, I view this, we're not trying to be Ted Kaczynski around here. We're not trying to be Luddites. I want to move closer to society and connect and help it evolve and grow in the right way. I'm not trying to be a recluse. And I, I wouldn't recommend you be that either. That's a very adolescent thing to do. That's a very childish thing to do. We need to be social. We need to connect and try to make things better. We also need our, also need solitude. And I'm not saying, so if you are going to do that, and a lot of people want to do that, that's fine. But we've also seen this with van life. People are just giving up, giving up. You can make money from art. Right now, I am creating value. Maybe not that much value. <laughs> I feel like I am, but... The more value I create, that will equal more connections, networking opportunities, or more uh, money if I, you know, if I ask for it. And if I focus on creating value, and value creation comes from individuation, and individuation comes from a lot of time alone in nature. The only reason I'm here right now is I spent years in nature and I took my time to get here. Robert Bly says you shouldn't be publishing poetry or any works until you're after 30 years old, even if you've been practicing since you were 15. You need to give yourself the time and respect to let yourself individuate. And this is creating such an impact in our classrooms and in the world that people now need to be silent. And now with cancel culture, you, just, you are here now in college for a job or in high school. You are here for a job. You're here to enter the system so you can hit this, hit this life or get this, do a little bit better than your parents did. And now on online people you don't say things you just create glam and entertainment because you can't like me saying like oh man there's a problem with just like you know a, a village raising a child is much better than a single mother raising it and you know polarizing into feminine masculine poles is better than just obliterating them all that could get me canceled and you're not supposed to say these things anymore and this is creating a silence and cowardice in the community and it's so sad and this is all the bottom line but Bri talks about the bottom line when you speak about business ideas or what you want to do like i'll talk to my friends like man we youtube or all these different pursuits well, that doesn't make me show me how to make money. Does that make any money? You're not making any money. And it's like all these people, like I said, who have way more potential than me are just fall. And I just want to be like, yeah, you want to go be a salesman? Yeah, you want to go be, you want to go do this dead end job? Even though I'm in a dead end job right now, I, every single day I'm doing something and dreaming and working and taking action to one day help people. And then by helping people, maybe they can help me or not if they don't want to, to create a better life for myself monetarily. But that's, I've already live in abundance. I already spend the time in nature that I need to I already give the spread love and joy and feel joy within myself. And I've already taken care of my life and my things. And when you move into the whateverness, that's what people are doing now. Just whatever, I'll just get a job, I'll just get a trade. You don't have that passion to do these other things though, because the reason you go off into the world, once again, the reason you spend time in nature, if, if you're doing it right and do these things is so that you can go deeper into yourself. Thus you can connect deeper with others and with the world. You know, if you can connect better with nature, you'll be able to connect better with people. And we've been abandoned. There is no way out. Now with, you know, we've involved ourselves in multiple wars, you know, the war on terror, big waste of money, big waste of time, big waste of lives, destabilized the whole Middle East. That, the, that project needed to take 80 to 100 years of us being there and helping out that region and slowly changing it to make it actually work. No one was willing to do that even from day one. It was all just a, it was all just a sham. Now with this, now with the war that we're that all the sanctions we're putting on right now, once again, just now just making things harder and harder for normal people like you and I every single day to touch nature, to touch having a family and having the time. Because I I don't care. Like I'll live in my house. Like I'll live in a little suburban block as long as I can go out in nature. That's fine. But I, I want the time to raise my family 
and see them grow up. And if they want new skis or something, I want to buy them for them. I want the time to homeschool them, teach them all this stuff and read all these books with them and have infinite, you know, as much time as I can. But if I have to, you know, work at a job that demoralizes my soul and then I come back and I want to. And so then what do I do with that time left? Because if, if I don't go spend the rest of my time going and doing other things that make me happy, like doing this and other things, then I feel empty inside. But I'm obviously not going to do those other things because I'm going to put my kids first. So then I'm going to be an empty person. My kids are going to sense that and feel that and see the hunched over sad mindset because I am, don't have the time to take care of what I want to do. And we can live in a creator economy. That's that's the, that's the other, what are we supposed to do? Is everyone going to be an artist or a writer? Well, we've created a structure of society where that's not possible, but we could restructure society eventually that and in a global way, that's the other, and it's like, there's so many other issues. We've created so many issues along the way with this mindset. This mindset, this acquisition mindset created World War One. It created the, the hate we had against the Germans after World War II, which then manifested the Nazis. And then the hate after that and all the problems that cre created from that, which we didn't resolve, manifested in China going communist and us having bad relations with Russia. And look where that's gotten us now. Look what focusing on the arms race. Look what focusing on not helping the Chinese people with, with the greatest culture of all time, the greatest intellectual and artistic history of all time. The Chinese Chinese civilization is probably the best of all time, you know, if we're looking back looking back in history. And letting them fall into totalitarianism is a very is a very sad thing. But who are we to talk? Who are we to talk in our country now about what about totalitarianism and what other people are doing? Our next chapter is titled Teaching Our Children That Nothing Works. And this is where Bly talks about how the deconstructionists, the postmodernists ruined our society and i think he's wrong about this and you, because when you look at derrida and foucault and deleuze they loved knowledge they loved they were just engaging in a fight they were just progressing knowledge just how robert bly attacked the modernists and progressed modernism that's what they did but Robert Bly's ideas didn't get weaponized by culture like the postmodernists did. So they are now the boogeyman of conservatives and of Western civilization. But I love when everyone talks about the neo-Marxist postmodernists, but they've never read the primary sources like an adult. Can you really comment on what Derrida or Foucault said by just reading a passage? And if you don't even understand about the, the, the gap between Saussure and Derrida and Foucault's genius ideas, much when I look at the postmodernists, I view them like all other, the structuralists and all these other areas of thinking. I think that they have some good ideas and obviously they have some bad ones, but their ideas shouldn't be weaponized into society or like used to control how we think and what we need to do. Every time a society does that, things don't go very well. If you look at the modern world, when you, you get a group of thinkers, these people, and they get you know put up on a high horse and then their ideas are enacted for social reform, it's an absolutely terrible idea. And something sad is happening to our society. And it's that if we look at some statistics right here from Pew Research on teen teenage reading rates, US students who read for fun on their own time by race and ethnicity. And we're going to look at 13 year, your 13 year olds right here. And you can already see a massive decline in from 2012 to 2020. And I'm sure from 1996, it's even larger. Like, so like for, for instance, Hispanics, only 10% of Hispanics, Hispanic 13 year olds read for fun on their own time almost every day. And another thing about, okay, we have to really, this is something crazy. There's something about reading statistics that are inherently flawed that when people are asked about reading and about knowledge in general the one thing that people don't like to feel is dumb they don't like to feel and that's what happens about knowledge when you try to tell people stuff about knowledge they feel like you're try, a, trying to act superior to them and they and they that doesn't feel good so i'm assuming these numbers are even lower because a lot of people i'm sure lied on this because that's what 13 year olds do also they don't maybe give the most accurate statistical answers and when it comes to knowledge more so i think than anything else and especially reading because everyone understands that the more you read the more you know about the world and the, the smarter you are that we could kick all these back a couple percentage points but even with that only 10 percent of hispanics 50 15% of blacks and 20% of whites. And then look at Asian people, all the way almost, all the way almost at 30%, but they have had an 11% drop. Everyone's had about a 10% drop here. Read daily for fun. And remember when you were 13 years old? I'm sure when you were 13, I was reading, well, I was you know, a little bit different. I was reading like existentialists and going crazy, but it, that was the most ecstatic time for reading in my life. You know, Harry Potter was still coming out back then. I mean, I was a little bit kind of phased out of that, but still I enjoyed the series when they came out. Like I loved reading from ages nine to four, 15 like those were the magical years of knowledge and waking up and like learning about things and you were finally smart enough when you're hitting third when you're 13 years old you're actually smart enough to understand some basic you know 
ideas and philosophical ideas, psychological ideas. You can learn about religions. You can read some harder books and like get mind blown. You can you under, start, start understanding maybe you're going through puberty. You start understanding love a little bit. And to know that like Hispanic people who make up a large part of our country right now, only 10% of them. And it does like all these numbers are really bad. And even worse, there's a lie. Let me tell you about the lies in the um, reading, re reading scores is that when you, when people will tell you, right? Hey, like, like we, we we're smarter like reading wise than um people in the 70s but we're using different tests we're using tests that have been tailored and and made easier for us to do better on because when we're in this global competition against people like china who take education very seriously and europe and other countries who are really into the literacy because they understand that creates critical thinking they're into all all types of knowledge we don't want to appear dumb so we're going to pad and do whatever we can with our tests to make our reading scores go higher so we can't compare ourselves to people of different eras and i'd be very interested to see kids of today take the tests from the 60s and 70s and, and 80s and compare our scores against them because we've been using a different system that I, and I have administered these tests that are like when you read the questions they they go you into the answers like that I feel like that's something new and you already this we already know this happens for instance in the school district I teach in when I I which I also graduated from in 2011 12 when I graduated the graduation rate was in the low 70s high 60s and that's not very good but what, what what would you do to solve that right like hey like we need to get that to 80 80 percent 90 percent and you know we need to make people care more we need to hold people accountable we need to build community driven action blah blah blah, blah. no what they did to pad the statistics was that they, first of all, removed, they lessened, so if you needed 40 credits, they lessened it down to 30. They took about 25% of the credits that you needed away to graduate, okay? They also removed any, they removed standardized testing. So to graduate, I had to pass a math reading, math and reading, math reading and science exam and to pass. And it was like really easy, like, most most people pass, but some people didn't. Like you had to show a certain level of proficiency. And if you failed, so you took it first in your sophomore year. And if you failed your junior and senior year, you would have classes, your elective classes, were classes where you just focused on that test and they had after school clubs and everything you could imagine to help you pass this test. And I don't know one person who actually, sh so I know guys, uh, people that failed their sophomore year and then everyone, be if they showed up to the classes in the next years and weren't like dropouts or stoners, that everyone passed that test. The only people that didn't were the people that were absent or, you know, too high. And then they also um, removed, and this is still, they, They've, they've made it harder, to, they've made it almost impossible to expel people. You can't expel kids, even if they are violent toward teachers or toward other children. Back when I was in high school, if you punched another kid, you were expelled. You were sent to behavioral school with all the bad kids and it was like mil a military school, basically. You had one chance, no fighting or you're out. Especially maybe you get, maybe insult, you know, maybe you might get away with it one time, but two times, absolutely not. They've made, made it now impossible because they made the claim and you know, it has the statistical um, backing that, you know, that certain races uh, are uh, disappointed proportionately expelled but if the action is violent if you expel people for taking violent actions then it doesn't matter race shouldn't be a be a matter in this if someone is violent they shouldn't be around a bunch of non-violent people you should be safe in a learning environment you know that what's the what's you know i i got bullied in high school and middle school maybe a little bit my freshman year of high school and you feel anxiety i remember in an english class i'd feel anxiety because this big football player would just punch me like randomly you just turn around and punch me in the chest and what and you're like why didn't you defend yourself well i tried i mean this had been going on for years and i had tried and it didn't go very well obviously and i learned that the more you try that one if you tell or if you try to fight them back things get worse <laughs> in, in the long run so it, it that didn't really promote a very nice reading environment so they've removed the ability to expel kids they've made it and then last but not least and this is the best one you guys will love this they've made it so that if you don't turn in an assignment right so pretend i have homework right and if i don't turn it in i automatically the you automatically have to give the student 50 percent like usually you get a zero right you miss the test you get a zero on it no you automatically get a 50 so they've subverted grading that everything is given to 50 percent so you could do nothing and but then on the last two weeks of school turn in a couple assignments to get you up to 60 percent you're, you're not at a zero percent anymore you start at 50 percent the whole way across and miraculously, right? Miraculously, the graduation rate has increased up to almost up to 90%. But the students, you know, in terms of test scores have got the test scores have gone worse, but the graduation. So if you don't hold the same standards and you and you rig the system, and that's what's happening with a lot of these things in our society. And it's trying to mask 
the problem. And I, you know, I wanted to kind of give that intro that we have a very bad problem now because how many people, this is what Bly says, the increasing ignorance about history, geography, philosophical matters, foreign language, moral issues, Shakespeare, the Bible, Greek literature resembles the impoverished world of colonized people. And he, he makes an argument here that we're trying to, we've turned this into a colonialist place where there's a lot of hopelessness and drug use and crime and a, not a care for education. And a couple of things have happened here that as we talked about earlier, there's been this like, you know, with Family Guy, South Park, there's been this attack on education, but there's also even worse educators. We haven't made enough. Okay. There's like two parts of this. We haven't made school useful enough. And you always say, that's always the main claim. Like when will I ever use this in school again, Mr. Uh, Mr. C, uh, we'll never need this again. It's like the highest paying jobs in the world are reading and writing related. You need to be able to read and write if you want to make a lot of money, unless you are just an absolute science peak, like your peak science, right? Like you can, you're the, you are the inventor. You are the insane computer scientist that, you know, subverts reading and writing. But like, if you look at the top lawyers and doctors, there's so much, and people even in the military, there's so much reading and writing involved. Politicians, I'm thinking of almost every single job, even engineering, there's a lot of reading of reports and ideas and you have to write stuff out and make proposals. And if you want to get to the top, we're talking about getting to the top. The higher you go, the more proposals and writing and reading and having to manage, you have to start managing people. And you have to learn about how to manage people through reading and through speaking and communication abilities. And we're creating this class of people that can't even rise to the top. And then even worse, okay, that's okay, that's happening. Okay, maybe that's not the end of the world. But now now we have the ability to create a class of robots, Tesla bots. They're going to come and take all the jobs from the people that can't, that aren't, you know, like the robots are going to take away all the manual labor jobs and all the jobs that are easily done. And I don't, you know, like I said, if you know any high schoolers, ask them about their favorite Shakespeare play. And, and I understand that some, some of us, our families are very good and intact and like the, our whole family structure. So like, you know, I have cousins that do know all of this because I learned a lot of this, but unfortunately, most people, when you ask them about their favorite Sophocles play or about even the Bible, even if you're not religious, you should read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. You can get the easy version. Go get, that's why I always tell people like, you don't need to go read the King James version, even though it's like, it's like high literature, like the King James version of the Bible, absolutely magnificent. You can go get the abridged version or like the, um, a modified revised modern edition and then read along with it. Go watch like, for instance, the Jordan Peterson series on, on the Bible. Um, or there's all, uh, a great book out there. There's a bunch of books out there that are like on reading Bible as literature that have nothing to do with religion, just as like literary stuff and it's absolutely blow your mind it influenced everything it's it is the it is the canon it did show us our idea of truth is from the bible how many people do you know in america that know a different language other than spanish you know the language that they were taught to, by their parents or about ph philosophy just basic questions and history and, and 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 even worse like okay maybe people don't know that much okay i can i can forgive people for not knowing people are busy people maybe are focused on sports or girlfriends or boyfriends whatever do you care the other that's the other problem is that when you talk to someone about these things or like try to make them care they glaze over and they don't care and okay and so that's one part of the problem is that when you're told that none of this is useful none of this is going to get you a job because Look, you know, that's what happens. Like these parents find a job, right? Parents like are making a living, right? They're making seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year doing, you know, some random job. And then, and that doesn't require any education at all. And, and any person can get it if they're just kind of cutthroat enough. And they tell their kids and they give their kids that attitude. You just need to learn to work. Uh, but readers aren't, don't make money. You don't, can't blab your way to money. And uh, okay, so that's the one problem that the schools don't actually give us anything useful to, to appease that part. So like for the people that need to float a little bit, for the people that need to trade or like, and I know Robert Bly kind of criticized this earlier, but um, for the for actual skills, even computer skills, thinking, like just any type of skill, we, we really don't teach and on top of that our teachers because of unions aren't bait aren't judged on performance for instance in my school district it will take you three years so if you have a teacher at your school right that you like you really don't like but they're not like going crazy they're not hitting anybody or like saying anything like prejudice they're just like bad they just don't care it will take three years of evaluations just to get them out of your school then they'll just go to another school there is no firing a teaching job is as easy most most states, if you have a college degree, you can become a teacher. All you need to do to become a teacher in most states now, and like basically every single state, is you need to have a college degree in any any subject. You could have it in general education. And 
College is now subverted because I have a, I have a friend who has a PhD and he didn't go to school one time. He dropped out of middle school and he's paid people. He's a trust fund kid. He's paid people to get him a PhD on an online school. He has a PhD and never he's never read a book in his life. He has actually a PhD in educational law and he works developing and defending the curriculum that the district are, is making. And every this is this is more like an acquaintance. This is a, an old friend from like when I was younger. But when I talked to him, I was like I was like, are you float? Like, doesn't everyone know? Like, you don't know anything about this. He's like, yeah, but they can't fire me. And and that's the and that's so to be, you can become a teacher in six weeks, basically in six to eight weeks. All you have to do is have a degree, pass some tests that are basic, that are just basic math, basic reading, basic writing. And then you have to maybe take a course or two and boom, you're a teacher and then you're protected. And teaching most of the time is a place where people where people are just going for retirement. They're, they're just like, OK, if I do my 30 years here, then boom, I get a nice retirement. I get health insurance. It's not that hard. I get uh, two and a half months off every single year. You know, it's a it's a sweet deal, but it's not. Imagine if it was performance based. Imagine if teachers, if they said, nope, everyone's fired. We're going to rehire. And it doesn't matter what credentials you have. Uh, we don't care. You don't need even a teaching license. What is a teaching license? Like learning these skills? No, we're going to find the most competent community. We're going to scale it in terms of like how like one side of the scale is going to be like engaging with students, like how good you are with the students and like engaging with them in communication. And the other side is going to be knowledge and like teaching ability. And we're going to pay people well to do this. There will be a flood. All the engineers, all the all the people that get sucked up into nursing degrees and all these other things will get sucked up into teaching degrees. But the unions, the teaching unions are defending everybody. And and you can't and you can't break them. How do you and then if you did, you're suddenly a union buster. But the unions are being defended by a bunch of people who don't want to try, who don't want to try harder, who don't want to get pushed, and are happy to make things easier for the children and for themselves so that they can cruise to their retirement because they don't really care about education at all. Because if an educator cared about education, they would be doing something something so like when, when you have a teacher right hey i'm an english teacher but i've written books i have a channel about writing i've read over 2,000 books in my life. I am all about reading, like, you know, and I'm all about communication too and being a chill person that wants to make you do the, the chill, a chill teacher who can motivate you to do the best that you can and give you any extracurricular, you know, ideas or pushing that you need. Met very few teachers that even go half the, half as far as that on my journey. And like I said, I know, a, I know a lot of teachers though. I know a lot of teachers on both ends of the spectrum though. I know a lot of teachers that are very kind. They love the kids. They, they're all about the kids they're like all about engagement but how can you take someone's like if you were going to do like if you were going to like if i said hey you don't need to go win a jujitsu competition you need to go win the world championship in your jujitsu weight class you know and age class you know if you're like older would you look for someone who was a kind teacher or would you look for someone that was maybe a little bit less kind, but then had won world championships also, who had won a bunch of competitions and there's students at the school who have also won competitions and they're focused on winning and becoming the best. What would you do? And everybody knows, everybody knows. I mean, a lot of people sometimes don't know, but everyone knows like, wait, why would I be learning from someone that's never put this into practice or even better? And I can I can make an exception. This is a bad rule because I know actually MMA coaches, for I know people in all disciplines. I know um, coaches like in sports of all discipline and even writers and teachers, and this is very rare, who are so good that they produce great writers. I know I've known um, professors that have produced and helped writers very, very well. And without their help, these writers wouldn't have done it. We're now making living, a living as a pro author. Same with MMA coaches. I know a bunch of MMA coaches that have never fought in a cage in their life, but they produce world champions. So you either need to have someone that has done what you're doing or has shown results or has shown that they can produce that type of person. And we don't have that. And without that, people aren't going to take this seriously. Like I remember I had this English teacher in high school and I remember asking him like, hey, like, and it was like an honors class. And I remember like best kid, you know, the highest level I could get in, like in my junior year of high school. And I would go up to the teacher one day and I'm like, hey, you know, and I've done, I did this with all my other uh, English teachers since like seventh grade and they gave me great recommendations or at least decent. And I said, hey, like, what's your favorite book? Like, what book should I read? He said, well, I, I don't really read very much, but I really like Life of Pi. And I automatically never took him seriously again. That was a month in the school. I never listened to a thing that he said ever again. You're going to recommend me as a 40 something year old, The Life of Pi. And then when I asked anything else, you know, okay, that's cool. And some people have a favorite book that's maybe a little bit, you know, not like high literary art, but what else? Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, well, we, and this is the, also about the degeneracy of college that you can pass college courses in English easily, obviously by cheating. But if you're in person, 
you don't need to read the books anymore to pass the class. I'm not ashamed to admit that in a couple courses where the teachers were making me read some stuff that was way too woke and I didn't care about it at all, went online, made a sum, uh, read a summary, and then just attached every, Derrida, Deleuze, Judith Butler, every single radical thinker I could to the essay, 100%, you know? That shouldn't be possible because if the teacher actually read the essay, they would see that I offered nothing of substance and didn't read the book. You know as a teacher, like I know as a teacher when the kid, if, I, if, I, if I'm like, if I read, read the essay, I will know who read the book and who didn't read the book easily. And I've taken polls in my class, dude. This, this will blow your mind too. We're talking about 10% of kids. This is about what it is that when I assign a book in a class, I'll take an anonymous poll and less than 10% of the kids will read the book. And now schools have had to revert to, we have to read out loud as a group together. You know how long that takes? You can't read a 400 page book out loud unless you want to do it. I mean, that's, that's like a month of like all your in-class time will be spent just reading. So you have to read, you know, the hundred page easy book that everyone can understand because competency, you know, comprehension also lowers when you have to read it out loud kind of slowly because people can zone out when you actually have to focus. If you're focused, you're focused. So less than 10% of kids will read a book that's assigned and then the rest are going to cruise and either not do any assignments at all or just use summaries. And if I, as a teacher, if I actually put the hammer down, I can't put the hammer down because then I'll get in trouble. Then parents will start complaining like, oh my gosh, you gave my child a D. Yeah, because this, this you can't actually grade bad anymore. If someone completes the assignment and doesn't have any super glaring problems or errors, you have to give them a certain grade because parents will freak out. And as an educator, when you make like, for instance, like when I'm not even making $50,000 a year and I feel kind of overworked, am I really going to go into a battle with a parent or am I just going, you know, do you, do you fight against them? Do you spend that energy of taking it to, cause it's going to be taken to the principal. And then if the principal sides with you, then it's going to be taken to the next level. And if you talk, if you talk to the principal and they, and they shoot you down, then you have to change your standard forever. So why even do that? Because you know, because unless your principal is down for the cause, then it's going to be taken to the superintendent or whoever's next on the level. And then that's the person that made all the easy standards. Um, and you know, uh, is making school easier for everybody in the first place. So there's actually like no way to win. And this is kind of, if we want to kind of get back to the text, this goes back to the dismantling of the elder system that in schools now it's not the um, one room schoolhouse or even where we, you only are kids with kids of your same grade. You have these teachers who are compromised in terms of what they can say, how they can grade, what they can teach, um, their pay, um, you know, their, their actual ability. You have parents who aren't reading to you and making you um, even able, able to tap into your teacher's potential if you do have a good teacher. Because that's also the crazy thing is that I'll have like very deep students who care and want to learn, but then I have to start them very far behind. I have to start them with very, like, I'll try to give them like, for instance, since like I read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse when I was in eighth grade. Wasn't very challenging to read. I feel like that's one of the greatest books that you can give someone young, especially in the Western world, because it exposes them to the East and the Eastern Eastern philosophy and a lot of stuff we don't receive in the West. It's a great introduction. A lot of kids I give that book now, I had to stop even giving it out. Can't even read it. Kids struggle with reading Animal Farm by George Orwell in ninth grade eighth, ninth grade, even further along in high school. So, you know, so I have these kids that care, but I, they're not tapping into what I can show them because I'm starting them back at Harry Potter. And, you know, we can't go that deep into Harry, you know, Harry Potter isn't going to be able, I'm not, so if, like if someone reads Herman Hesse by Siddhartha, I'm gonna be able to talk about dualism versus non-dualism and um, the Christian worldview versus the Buddhist worldview. and. and and, and help them see what Buddhism can do for your soul or, or Hinduism or yoga, or like all these different cultures in the East. But we, you know, a lot of kids never can get there even the, to the introductory point. And then the kids that do, because I used to work at a very gifted school where, where you know, I would, I've had, I've, I've, I've taught 100 plus kids that have gone on to an Ivy League university and a lot of those kids, and there were some exceptions, you know, and there were some, I've met some very gifted kids that cared and like, and went beyond me, man. I felt like they were smarter than me. They just didn't, maybe hadn't read as many books. A lot of the the, the top kids and the top kids in our country, the pin, the, one of the pinnacle schools in the country, a lot of the kids were just going to the Ivy League schools because that's what their parents wanted. They were going, going to go become a doctor, become a lawyer, become an engineer. And that's the only reason they were going was for the name so that they could get a good job. And they wanted nothing to do with doing anything more than they had to do because they had been forced their whole life to work their butt off to make sure that they got a 4.0 
you know, on everything, A's on everything and community, everything was meant to get you a job in the future. You need to do community service. You need to learn another language. You need to learn an instrument. You need to make sure you have, you're a part of three different clubs. That's what they like. So even the best kids in the world, even the be top kids in the country going to Ivy League universities don't even care most of the time. And you know, I, I, I'm, it's a very sad thing to see. I know this was kind of a, just kind of a rant about the education system, but I know a lot about it and I'm on the ground watching it happen right now. The next chapter we're covering is titled looking at the men's and women's movement and Robert Bly was at the peak of this I mean other than obviously ancient or older society and Robert Bly did it best and you know t today we're going to be talking about what happened and really what went wrong and I'll be making more videos on this but we have a little bit more freedom here if you're two and a half hours into this video to kind of explore it so the mythopoetic movement we'll kind of focus on the men first Robert Bly I mean, I'm sure if you're a fan you've watched some of the men's gatherings online listened to some of the Minnesota men's conference stuff really great material but what went wrong so you know I know hindsight is 2020 I'm not here critique or like bash on anything but Robert Bly is considered a forefather of the men's movement and at some level if we look at some of the ideas and some of the sub branches they turn into a lot of the negative toxic men's movements that are here today and much like everything in our society when things become commodified and diluted things get really cringy for instance there's a group out there now and they are called sacred sons right here we go we're looking at sacred sons and my and like you know we did there's some videos here but I won't I won't get into their stuff um but my opinion about groups like this now is that and and you can look at the results right so when i analyze a group i look at its members and the results that they are having and i'm not asking that people be perfect that people do what i want to do everyone has their own journey but you know the first thing that these people are offering is this reunification to the masculine but unfortunately um, and, and what Robert Bly was doing and what Robert Bly was doing was the best combination of everything. Let's start there. He brought in, of course, like the, the ritualistic aspects, the drumming, the men stuff, you know, the hugging, the touching. Let me know more down below about what happened in these movements. Write a paragraph or two. Tell us about your experience there. What happened? But there also was a literature component and knowledge component to it because of all the great thinkers that were involved. We have Joseph Campbell involved, Michael Mead, of course, Robert Bly and all his, his associates, James Wright, like all these, maybe not James Wright was involved, but there was a lineage, there was a legacy. If I'm looking at the Sacred Sons Corporation right now, we have a corporate Fortune 500 engineer, we have a musician, a guy in a band, another engineer, and a nonprofit guy. And when you don't have the knowledge aspect, then you're just selling transformation. You're just, it's a cheap sell. And okay, so let's hop back. So Robert Bly, I feel like offered everything that you need. It offered the connection, offered the networking, it offered the, the more ritualistic musical part, and then offered the knowledge part. Those, you know, thought, emotion, and action. Thought being the books, action being the networking and the men coming together, and the emotion, the more ritualistic aspects but now if we look at these results and we look at the people who come at this and what they are doing what do the men that come to these retreats do when they come home are they yuppies where are they have they been making an impact in the world what kind of knowledge are they putting out because on this channel i believe in the great work i believe that we are our purpose here at least right now is to eliminate unnecessary suffering i understand that suffering is inherent in the world that there is death that there are problems that cataclysmic events and heartbreak and a lot of different things but i'm talking about violence and problems and lower consciousness and I can't foresee the reason to dedicate yourself to anything other than eliminating that in the world to the best of your ability. And you can do that by following your true path, your divine purpose, whatever is right for you. And that will, you know, whether that, but a lot of people now have been caught in this hedonistic mindset. It's called like, I call it the my freedom movement. There's like a lot of different versions, right? It's like for one, for instance, there's like the freedom movement, like a lot of libertarians and, uh, and citizens trying to become free of the government. I'll, I call it the my freedom movement because they only care about their freedom. Them. It's all my freedom. I, it's my taxes. And I, I, I just, you know, people want, that's why people don't speak up. They just want to have, and a lot of writers fall into this. They, they just want to be able to be the writer in the woods, not doing anything. And the men's movement today has kind of turned into the my liberation movement, the my enlightenment movement. These people want to experience the ecstasy of enlightenment and all these different things, but they don't want to put in the work. Once that's been done, once the boot, once the booty, booty, boob, <laughs> The Buddha became enlightened under the Bodhi tree. What did he do for the next four or five decades of his life? He walked around and spread the message everywhere that he could. He he ran a non-hierarchical organization. He said, I can't answer any of your guys' questions. You guys can follow me that if you want, and I can help you attain liberation. There is a path to this, but you do not have to follow me. There, there even is no God. We are doing The only thing that we are doing is trying to attain liberation and decrease suffering. You cannot achieve you, your... So if we're talking about your highest potential and who you need 
need to become to hit that Buddha level. When Nietzsche's Superman, if we're, and I'm not, you know, and I understand that this is a little bit, you know, a lot of people don't like this, like, but if you want to become your best self, then if you are going, there are many roadblocks along the way and the many different segments of Robert Bly's mythopoetic movement. For instance, if you're just going to be the poet, right? Or the writer, the writer in the woods, the academic, you are going, you are limiting yourself because one, not that many people read books, right? But then you also don't understand how to put yourself out in the world and how to tap into your emotions. And maybe you do, but just being the writer today doesn't make the same impact that it may be used to make. And if you just get stuck in writing land, if you just get stuck trying to write, you won't become the best writer you can either, because at some point craft doesn't matter. At some point you've practiced enough and you know how to write. And if you can maintain it, then you can kind of, you, you know, like if you've written, if you've dedicated a decade or two to writing, then you can write a couple times a week and maintain that that level of writing and start to experience life more, you know, probably way before a decade or two. And through experiencing life more and exploring life more, your writing will actually widen out. You know, you must change your life as Rilke said, and as Robert Bly always talks about. And so as a writer, you have to keep going. And a lot of these people in the, in the men's movement today, Sacred Sons, they get caught in psychedelics. They get caught in drugs. They get caught in in the rituals, in the yoga, in the hedonistic pleasures. And what they're actually doing is just blowing their brains out because I am an advocate. I'm a psychedelic advocate for sure, for sure. But I believe it's a very personal thing that should be done in a very personal ritualistic manner. Unless you have a very solid group of people that you know and can help you and aren't just there like and that doesn't mean going down in south america and finding a a, a, a fake shaman who has all the, the credentials his family's been doing this for thousands of years but they really haven't to guide you through i'm talking about developing a group of people that you maybe know for years and then maybe exploring with them or just doing it by yourself or at the same time no reason at all and everything and what do i mean by that that a lot that you know if we look at silicon valley and a lot of these people they people take psychedelics trying to get something trying to attain a vitamin when you take psychedelics and if you take psychedelics and you relax you start to see how crappy the structure of our world is and how all the excess weight that you've put onto yourself and when you start to shed all that and if you do it right you start to shed all that you learn that you can achieve mystical states on your own you can obtain a mystical state through yoga meditation nature through love in your family uh, and all those different things combined you can excel in those skills and not need psychedelics and weed at all or, and and if you are you can maybe you know smoke weed for fun or you know you, you can have drugs but you won't need drugs anymore to obtain a mystical state you can go above and beyond that and there robert Bly talks about this in his, in his book talking all morning and american poetry how the whole, whole you know a lot of movements in the 60s and 70s the poetry tanked because we didn't have that sober mindset anymore. A lot of these groups are selling half-ass rituals, man. They, they, they'll, you go to their ritual and they're like, okay, we're gonna do yoga, we're gonna do journaling. But the yoga that they're showing you sucks. Like everything that they're showing you is they're just throwing the kitchen sink at you. And to progress as a man, you need, in my opinion, you need to look at the different aspects of consciousness. Maybe for a couple of years, you need to focus on thought. And by focusing on thought, maybe you start to develop art and a writing skill and, you know, and study philosophy and do these things. And you meet some people, you know, always every one of these involves a social aspect. You meet some people and they help you grow and you develop that part. But in other parts, maybe net, um, a more emotional context and maybe you get in with your family or you study your own emotions through meditation and, and yoga and there's probably a physical aspect of life and a spiritual aspect there's all these different parts of life and all of them can be explored at once but unless you have unlimited time you should be focusing you should be maintaining and growing some a little and focusing in the, on just some excuse me just one completely and that is the first critique i'm going to give today that like that's why that because we're of course we're going to talk about the the redditors there's a lot of different parts of the men's movement here and a lot of part of the, of the feminist movement that we're out to get to but uh that the part the sacred sons type people and the the the, the, the mytho what mytho the mytho poetic spiritual side what that's turned into in men's movement is either a scam or it's just a place to play out the hedonistic pleasures and act like you're doing shadow work but you're really not because when those people go home and you meet these people they aren't doing anything because you should be motivated so this is the other thing that you can tell is that i'm not all about action on the show because i understand that some people are not meant to do, for instance, what I'm doing right now. I understand that. I understand that some people aren't meant to stand up here on the mic, even though I think they should, even though I think that that is the right path because that will decrease suffering. I think that some people, very few, 
If you're going to choose a reclusive path, then you need to be a recluse. You need to be an absolute recluse because if you're not, then you're just making excuses for not doing a more active path. You know, you need to go out into the woods. And if you need to go out into the woods and just meditate and like die out there, then like, okay, if you need to just give your energy to the world and to spirit and like the Chinese poet way and, and a more Buddhist mindset, then do it. But don't be sitting and working a job and maintaining a family and having a phone and building relationships with girls and, you know, being emotionally unavailable to women or men or whoever and, and act like, you know, that's right. So unless you're going to do that, then the other, the only other path that's actually viable and really at some level moral is one of action, of is one of service to the divine and, you know, and thus the world, you know, I know some people may have the problem with the word divine, but, you know, higher consciousness, whatever, in either yourself or out in the ether and stagnation and uh, 10 or 20 year detours while, while, while wearing uh, furs and dancing around with a, a shaker isn't isn't it once again it may be it for a little bit you may need to go you know some people come to this and over time they do but I I I want to create a movement and that that is my goal as a man right now I have been trying you know I run a yoga website I run this I'm trying to cover knowledge emotion and action i'm trying to cover all three aspects eventually on this channel over the next couple decades and build a legitimate heir to the mythopoetic movement i'm only 28 right now and i know i'm not the you know, i'm not claiming to be a leader or an elder at all because i'm not but maybe in my 50s or 60s i'll have the knowledge and the skills and built the base of of people and not you know and of communication and ideas to enact that because if i'm looking at this like look at these guys we look are these men that's the other thing like, are these guys right here? How old are they? And where are the old people? Where are the young people? In a, in a men's movement, everyone's involved. And another part of the men's movement is there also needs to be females. And not not at at the at the event right and that's everyone that's where everyone gets all weird and that's where we're at in our society now it's like oh we have to hold an event so now we've gone non-local so we have these non-local events a bunch of men come from all around the world and then they're supposed to be able to grow together but what's the the link and a lot of the links that these guys are doing is he the, the best link that you can do the best thing you can give is transformation through blowing the brains out for instance a lot of yoga practices a lot of breathing practices just actually activate the sympathetic nervous system that we were talking about earlier that when you, stretching is a is a response that actually activates adrenaline because stretching is one step away from pain pain steps one way one step away from injury and injury is one step away from death you can do yoga and stretch and live your life in the other i don't go that direction anymore with anything i do you can go the other direction and live your life you can stretch without really strain or pain or tenseness and increase flexibility and strength you can gain strength in ways that don't require going pedal to the metal in the gym all the time the same with breathing exercises one of the most dangerous things that you can do is insane wim hof style breathing exercises every single yoga master for 3,000 years has been recommending against that I would go read the book pranayama by Gregor Mali he has like a 30 page chapter in there listing all the sources that say don't do this and this is what everyone is doing and what what everyone's recommending all these breathing exercises that get you high but actually ruins your brain it actually is clearing out important parts of your brain so that's what the offer is their offer these men right here is look we're young we're we're um we're rich we are Po sexually potent and we will come you come here and we will transform you and that's the link right because everyone likes that a lot of people all around the world do that to themselves and they like that but if i was going to start a men's movement and say okay we're not going to do any of that we're going to do yoga that that create that makes you feel more grounded and more stable and there's going to be no high involved at all and no stretching we're just going to be doing basic movements that are very easy that everybody can do same with breathing exercises same with uh knowledge exercises and musical things we're not going to enter into the trance we're going to try to stay grounded and maybe go up there if we want to but we don't that's not what we're, what we're here for right now and why would you ever want to go up once again so that's another thing why would you ever want to go up into the sky with people that you don't trust you should you can do that with yourself but if you're going to blow your brains out when you start blowing your brains out you start becoming more hyper suggestible this is what happened to the, the movements in the 60s they became hyper suggestible and all the music music was peace love nonviolence, and what and everyone became um you know the whole movement became nonviolent. but actually what we needed at that time was actually a little little bit more oomph to end the Vietnam War to end end an unjust war and you know and that's just decreased now like that was actually a reality back then and now when we look at the war on terror that went on for two decades with literally almost little to no resistance you know the the lockdowns went on and mandates happened with little to no resistance you know some people marching on the streets so the, you know that's their appeal so the real appeal you know so what what's that binding thing so even if I bring people in for let's say knowledge you know, if you try to bring people in from around the world for for knowledge or something else then you know so being unfortunate before you can really start a men's movement you need to wake people up in a lot of different ways locally like and to wake people up locally you have to really wake everyone up globally or at least 
nationally or at least in the west before you can actually get them because you know bringing people all around the country for all these different reasons isn't as good as if you lived in your city and think if in whatever city you're in right now think if even 20 percent of the guys showed up at an event you guys would have so much more in common you guys would know each other there would be no online texting you guys could hang out once it was done and build connections together and that could spiral into something better but i've been to plenty of events including men's movement events and conferences of all different types and i've met so many different people but then it's like i live in kansas city i live in britain and that's fine and we can connect but i i most of those people i met i sometimes talk to still but i never really see them ever again and that's a problem because you know if we're going to make things happen you need to be with people you need to be plotting there's a magic that happens when you're in person look what happened when james wright and robert bly look what happened with all these different people so the men's movement is an absolute mess on that side and then the other side of the movement um so we talked about um thought right we talked about how thought has been corrupted right how the poetry a lot of poets now are emotionally unavailable i know a bunch you know who know about robert bly and they're just a bunch of f boys then we have the spiritual side they've 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 kind of gone into hedonistic pleasure then there's the more action side and the more networking side and the more social side and they've gone to the chan boards and to reddit they've turned into a bunch of little little dweebs you know and they, they call themselves incels you know involuntary celibates and they're out they're absolute jokes and they have a hatred toward women they are very nasty people but they took that idea of of the of the power of man so they took this idea from you know robert bly and other people that men were are, have this thing what's been taken away by the superficial woman that women are superficial and there's this new modern woman that from the, that's been created by the media and the kardashians and all these different people and they're superficial and they'll they'll, they'll divorce and you know and there's horror stories everywhere because of men men who've been um uh, accused of false crimes men who have been divorced from their wives and their wives are crazy and don't let them see their see their children anymore there's all these horror stories that you hear and it's like yes there are women that suck out there but there's also men that suck that are out there just as many who are abusive and emotionally unavailable um and are absolute maniacs and but but, you know men who spend a lot of time online you know radicalize each other and that's that's what's so crazy about the internet is that people who don't even know each other can radicalize each other and keep one-upping each other and they have this view this very negative view of women but what's the solution to that and okay i'll i'll, I'll admit that point that yes a lot of women are very a lot and, and men a lot of people on earth right now are very superficial and women especially so they've done studies and 20 percent excuse me they've they've pulled men and women right under the age of like 40 and they'll show they'll show show them the opposite gender so like women will see men photos of men of all different genders ages body types heights whatever and they'll be shown a picture of them and the question is is this person a like sexually attractive to you or not like is this person attractive and they answer yes or no and it's crazy because women answer that 20 percent of men that they are shown are attractive and then men answer that 80 percent of women are attractive and I, I, that that number is a clear indicator of social engineering on a societal level because anytime i mention that to anyone they're like oh it's just biology women have to be more selective <laughs> that doesn't create a 60 percent gap because you we automatically you know so i understand that there is some that when there's smoke there's fire with some of the superficiality when it comes to dating and when it comes to you know you have to be a certain way so you know i understand why the movement gets started but what is the solution to that once again every single side there is a solution and it's the same exact one for the writing or for the no the knowledge thing it's like hey we we have these ideas and we're we're spreading maybe ideas about men or knowledge and we're writing about them but if no one can understand them if no one's smart enough to understand them then it doesn't freaking matter if no one cares about what you're writing on a, on a very large scale then it doesn't matter so how do we make people care oh wait we educate them we and education is already in the power dynamic because that means that we're better than these people so that's already a problem that's what how we've been duped that now the lower classes through a lot of media and moving i hate to say the lower classes but uneducated people view people who want to educate them as some liberator as some like person that thinks that they're not good enough and it's like no you can live we in and a real education involves like obviously like no, like book education but also education out in nature that's how we this is how we solve the climate crisis this is how we solve every the violent crisis we have to teach people aspects of reality through knowledge and you know even real world experience and then if we look at the hatred you know the women of women aspect the same thing we have to educate women and men at the same time because 
the reason we have to edu reason why men have to be better is that a lot of women a lot of women have a lot of problems because of all the crappy men in their life a lot you know have you ever heard of the daddy issues you know daddy issues happen when your dad sucks and is a jerk or sexualizes you or isn't isn't there at all and that is a legitimate thing that women don't need to be like this men are causing this to happen so we could you know both sides really need to change at the same rate and it needs to happen in the same way and the women's movement you know i don't really know if there has been a a, a very great women's movement since the other than the great mother conference and like first wave feminism because they've been co-opted like as we talked about earlier into accepting this acquisitive capitalist reality which is terrorizing their souls which is making them go crazy and have mental health crises and modify their body when they don't need to do all these silly things so you know robert i mean what if you ask robert Bly, i mean i get that's what the sibling this is the sibling society right here look these guys are teenagers. Look, look, do you think that like, let's look a little bit more. Let's look at some of these photos. I mean, look at some of these videos. They're carrying them around. Does this look like I, I see one older guy right here. Everyone else is under 50 for sure. Does this look like a bunch of teenagers? Because to me, this looks like kind of a bunch of teenagers to me. But this looks like the sibling society acting like it's not the sibling society. Is this ritual? Are you, if you, are, if you get carried by your peers, are you, is that the ritual that we're talking? Is this is that the ritual that we're talking about here? Like maybe it is, but I've, I've done. I've had more. Tra like, is that what you need? Like the, here's I keep asking for comments. Do you need to get carried by your fellow men? Is that going to make you feel better? I I don't think so. I don't I don't think that's it. And the women's movement, man, because of radical feminism and a lot of other things, has gone a very silly direction and for women you know uh, they have some it's all it, we can bring it back down to the educational solutions but the the war the war on women is very real that women still every day like i i go to the public gym sometimes and women i see women literally getting like accosted and mowed down by my, men's eyes and getting asked out when they i know they are there just to work out they are serious man they are in there and they are like they're not looking around at dudes like they're in there like doing 300 pound deadlifts like in there and like guys are tapping them on their shoulders and like trying to ask them out and do stuff or like just goo goo gogging over them and like same in society and at the workplace when a hot girl comes into uh, is at your job suddenly everyone asks them out and acts differently and it's it's silly and i understand that's a part of life but it really isn't especially that's something that we need to adapt to in today's society that there are so many people and so many social opportunities to meet people now even with online dating and other things that you don't i mean this is just a common life rule like don't date people at your work but how men treat women is still absolutely terrible and a lot of conservatives and a lot like to deny that like the me too movement was a witch hunt but at the same time it needed to happen because a lot of people had been legitimately not listened to women and you know the patriarchy which is real and a lot of people say oh both men and women are oppressed you know if you're still functioning at that level that you can't see that women are are looked down upon by some people maybe not by you maybe not by me but by a lot of men still a lot of men still have a very just view women as something that they can control and screw it's very sad and the women's movement is going to get angry angrier and angrier because when you are getting accosted physically assaulted and viewed as an object you are not going to heal you you aren't going to be very happy and there's a lot of healing that needs to happen with the women in our society because of what's been done to them for a very long time you know um the emancipation proclamation happened in the 1860s women didn't get to vote till the 1910s that tells you a lot 19 james joyce was writing novels emily I mean, do you do you hear what I'm saying? Like when people talk about the patriarchy not existing, James Joyce, T. S. Eliot, Ezra Pound were releasing books when and women couldn't vote in the United States still. Mary Shelley, Emily Dickinson, Marianne Moore, among other women, had published books, many books by that point and were famous and women were still seen as inferior in a mental way, whatever other way to men. And I know all the men out there know guys and especially guys that are, that still treat women like crap though. So when they get drunk or they hang out with the boys, they still, you know, speak very poorly of women and that action. And I know a lot of people don't like this either that words, you know, words are a very great display of how you're going to treat someone. I know that words don't lead that words aren't violent that you can say whatever you want you can't really say with it whatever you want in our country because the first amendment is um under the under the scrutiny of a court if you could say whatever you wanted then we wouldn't need a first amendment that's what i love about the, everyone that you know that's another thing let's just get into that really fast we, move on. we don't have rights in this country because rights are don't need a constitution rights are are pre-human they're a priori the right to experiment with your own consciousness to love, to be free and take your own actions exists before you are born, before you are given your social, your sin by the government. Absolutely 
bizarre that people even just want to focus on wages. Like I understand there's actually the wage myth that if you actually account for pregnancy and other things, women get paid roughly around the same as men, maybe a little bit less. But what does pay even mean? Why are we focusing on pay? What, what about treatment? What about the listening? If we're trying to create, we need mothers. We need good mothers. You know, how many, I don't know if anyone out there has had a bad mother or known people that have had a bad mother. It it, it creates a lot of problems. And, and women, you know, if you look, I mean, their whole life is, I mean, if you look at the birthing, um, the whole, if we just go back to stage one, like women can give birth and cannot give birth. Women are treated like we've talked about this earlier. They've they've been commodified in the birthplace. They women used to somehow give birth out in nature alone if they needed to or without any medical instruments. We all got here somehow without C-sections, without any of these problems. And I know a lot of people died along the way, but a lot of the techniques and things that they used are very important. And a lot of that a lot of that knowledge, a lot of the knowledge of women that can help us and can heal us can be lost. And I know the power of women as, you know, a man who has been with women before the, the healing power and deepness of women is absolutely astounding it's the ultimate care the ultimate love it's apps i mean it's it's profound and i i don't even know if we'll have men's and women's movements I, they might be outlawed soon because for discrimination policies i know um a a local female group in my, my, my town, Las Vegas, they've been running an organization for three decades, a very high level. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't call it high level. I would call it a medium to high level occult group for females, female only. It has the money behind it, has a multi-million dollar heiress behind it, has the knowledge, has the emotions, has a space, has one of the most beautiful temples I've ever been a part of to do non-hierarchical spirituality, just, you know, whatever you want, just growth together. And they, they were taken over by the trans community. You know, I don't like, no, I know it's controversial to say they, they, they would hold at events, right. That anyone could come to, and it was mostly women and they would hold most of the events that they held were for like everybody, right. They would hold a bunch of events and you could be a part of it and do what you want. But they had this, they had a couple sessions a month and a kind of training group that was for biological women only women that were born with a vagina and a group of you know a, a group of trans individuals um male to female wanted into the group um and they had worked their way in from with the current leader and then when word got back to this um very famous spiritual lady that was running the group but doesn't live here but you know was the, fu the funder the founder the, the head of the group she says no I, I don't want that right like this they can participate they can do what they've been doing but this group is exclusive it's we take applicants and I, I don't want to be a part of this you know this is I I believe in you know that this is this is my definition of women and you I mean you guys already know what happens next right we thousands of Facebook comments this group has doesn't have thousands of people people from all across the world are now con you know we're commenting harassing articles I mean the the whole works happened to this group and I don't know how it ended because I I, I was very close to someone that was in it and they got out. Once all this drama happened, they're like, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm not going to be a part of all this. And I think they capitulated. And I think they gave in, but maybe they didn't. I don't, I, I don't think they gave in, but the, the, what it did to the reputation and like the review section of what they were running, you know, because I guess reviews are a thing, right? Like the amount of hate and backlash they got wasn't very good for the group. And I can only imagine this getting worse in the future. So I don't know the future of the men's and women's movement more. I don't think that's something that Robert Bly could foresee that they would be attacked and maybe not let happen anymore and i know i had started the men's book club on this channel before and we're gonna i'm gonna get back to that that's you know something on my list i know i started up a program and some people were paying five dollars a month and we only did like a month of work you know so i i i, I feel like i hopefully everyone got their money's worth for like the three or four books that we did do but then i stopped it and you know I, you know, I felt bad about that. I just couldn't keep up with it, but I really am trying to like, if you guys can't see my wall right now, but I have goals on here. I have schedules. I'm trying to get these videos out and do a better job, but at, you know, technology and ADHD is a problem. It is like, I can focus, but when there are a million distractions and when I have to work online and do a bunch of things online on an unrestricted computer and I'm stressed from working, you know, I might just go watch some MMA fights. And then after those MMA fights, I might go, I might get roped into something else after that. And then suddenly it's four hours later and I'm like, what just happened? So that is my piece on the men's and women's movement. And I mean, really what went wrong. And I, I think what the solution is, once again, is that we have to focus on scalable online content and then forming small local groups and, and trying to get people in. So by forming, by scaling online content, right? Like what I'm trying to do right here, and you guys can do it better than me, maybe. Like, look at me, like I'm trying, but maybe I'm not the one. I might be the stepping stone. You listening right now might, maybe the one, maybe people will like 
you more than they like me. I've put 120 videos out and got 700 subscribers. You know, I, I think I'm likable, but maybe I'm just not the right vibe at the right, you know, right now. But maybe you are. And by listening to me, you have that motivation. And maybe you aren't either. But then if we put ourselves out there, I've already met someone in my town, Las Vegas, who found me online and we've hung out a couple times. And he's got a family, maybe he isn't that active, but there'll be more people down the line who we can come together and start working together on projects and doing things and that will grow and we can we can build a local community by changing lives because you will find people in your local area eventually if you get big enough and you can change you can change lives online and then that will help you link up with your local community because just starting with a local group or something isn't going to make that impact we need to do both at the same time and that's what i feel like the solution is by putting value out there into the world and then finding the people in your local community or nearby and then doing the local work too so now we are moving on to the culture part of the book and we finished up with part three. Our next chapter we are covering is called Exaltation in the Midst of Flatness because back in the day when you used to watch the, the TV screen, for instance, it used to, be, used to be all the way over there. And for a while, people didn't have remotes, so you had to get up and turn it off. And it was, it was it's a flat screen, but it showed you images. But now we have now monitors and we have phones and the phones are flat and they're right in front of us. And all we now see is flatness. When I drive around, my the roads are paved in a certain way. Everything is in a square box. There are, are right angles everywhere. My whole world is flat. How often do I see the curvature of mountains and of nature and of trees and rivers? I know a lot of you guys out there are like me and you do see that stuff, but a lot of people don't. Their whole lives are now flat Every and things are getting flatter. TikTok is getting flatter or it's the flattest thing that we have. And this and the greed and Robert Bly makes a great point that the sibling society is happening everywhere. We like to boogeyman China, but everyone is trying to not be human anymore. We are trying to lose our human potential. And there's a great book I recommend everybody get out there. It's called Human Forever by James Poulos. It's one of the most, a very important book. And if you guys don't want to read it and buy it, cause you have to buy it through Bitcoin. You can listen to an interview with the martyr on the martyr, martyr made podcast Substack, And it's a free one. It's called Human Forever Part Three. And I, if I remember, I will post that, but Human Forever Part Three with Daryl Cooper, who hosts Martyr Made. Just type in Human Forever Part Three Martyr Made and go listen to that podcast and you will have your mind blown because we have lost the, ab the ability to see what the importance of being human is anymore. And people are trying to run away from it at any cost. And Zizek and the postmodernists actually understood this and knew about this because we don't want to see the real. We want to get rid of the grossness of our bodies and of society. How often do we actually look at our society of excess? And once again, the Republicans, oh, CRT, postmodernism, they're ruiners, are living, want to live in excess at a very high level. And they don't care. They think that they have the freedom to do that and they should do that. And guess what? They do have the freedom to do that. But intelligent, holistic people don't do that. And so what do we do? Of course, a movement starts that wants to um, stop that, but you can't, you know, and it turns into the mess that it is now. And it's crazy. For instance, if we want to talk about China, China is actually a little bit worse bit because of what happened with Japan, because of the last hundred years of Chinese history have been so tumultuous, but th they don't have any more. And once they don't have any more, they really have lost a lot of their morality. And that's why they have are starting to implement the government, I think, which is a very smart move if you want to keep a totalitarian regime to have a social credit score that we can't control people anymore. That's why I hear a lot of stories. And I don't want to generalize or make stereotypes that when people go to China, people will cut others in line. People will step on homeless people when they are walking down the street. Like people are very rude and people are very rude in America too, all around the world when they start feeling like they are better than other people and they maybe start stop feeling less human because if you like look at China, what happened with Japan, then the wars after, then the um, the whole Maoist time where 60 million people starve, you you have to lose some of your morality. And now with um, with the Uyghurs and everything, all the human right violations, you the more you know morality and stuff is lessened. But you need morality to run actually a functioning society. If you want, if China wants to become the world superpower, there has to be a social fabric that holds them all together. So they are having to implement an artificial system to do that, which is absolutely insane. But we created this. We created the problems in China. I know Japan. You know we we were one of the colon the imperialists that. Japan was envying and that's why they first entered into Korea and other places. We also enforced American values. If you look at Walt Disney and a lot of our movie companies, we thought the American vision and the American way was of life was great and that we thought the bigger you dream, the more money you make. And we spread all of our ideas over to China and all these different things, but they didn't bite. They they liked it. But after a while, where you go when you have a world of dreamers and you, you, you think that we can just get away with this, you know, brainwashing the world to be pro-American is that people become, it's the dialect again, they become anti-American and that's where we are at now. We could have went about everything a much different in a much different manner and actually had a good relationship with Russia and China. Do you guys know that 
go look up the the average male lifespan in Russia in the 90s after after the you know Soviet Union collapsed. It tanked by decades. I think it was even down into the 40s or um, 40s 50s or even lower than that because of all the tumultuousness. And that was a time, you know, when something like that happens, that's a time where you come in and you help as a country. Yes, we beat Russia. Yes, the Soviet Union fell, communism is bad, all these people. But guess who came in instead? The oligarchs, and they're still ruling today. You look at post-World War II, look, all this tumultuousness. There were a lot of problems in, in China that were happening. And what did we do? We said, we don't want to deal with this. This is a dirty, this is a big war that's going to happen. And we could have solved everything then, but what did we do instead? We put it off and then we dealt with it in Korea and we're still dealing with it now. We could have, we have had a million opportunities to live a peaceful life. We don't need to interfere in South America. We don't need to inter, we don't, didn't need to interfere in Africa, Southeast Asia and South, South America. Things would have worked themselves out and we could have had functioning relationships with everybody. But instead we are living in a world that is getting flatter and flatter because we need to stop the flatness. We need to stop the race on a, if we're looking at it from a top down level, right? now we are now back into a mini cold war with china and with russia if we're looking at you know taiwan and the ukraine we are in a knowledge war a propaganda war and that doesn't th those things are huge detours and energy wasters in terms of creating less flatness because flatness the you know you could say that the less gdp there is the more vertical you can start thinking, the less you, the less ambition you are. We we have everything we need now. You know, if we can just get some robots in the house and a little bit more uh, charity among people, we can literally s progress in a slow way and solve. We need to solve the human problem and go back to being human. We haven't solved the problem of violence and of hate and of all. And people are like, you can't solve that. What do you mean? Yes, you can solve those issues. Are all solvable problems but the more we put it off and hope that ai or something is going to fix it the worse situation we're going to be in so that's the gist of this chapter and robert bly brings in trackle and emily dickinson and i really love this poem by trackle right here so beautiful the dark eagles sleep and death rustle all night around my head the golden statues of man is swallowed by the icy com comber of eternity on the frightening reef the purple remains go to pieces and the dark voices mourn over the sea dude are you kidding me you know, there is poetry out there that is so good. And what we're getting hit with today is like, and I can say this now, I, I you know, every single minute that goes by, there's less, you know, less and less people. And I'm excited because poetry is gone to shit now, man. Poetry is so disgraceful now. And what they are publishing is a disgrace. And obviously I've gone into this on that, on this channel before. So that is the end of the chapter. That's all I really have to say that the world is getting flatter. And let me know once again in the comments, what, what can we do to stop this flatness? I think that we need to stop ambition, that ambition. If we look at most minorists, I think, in the in the Russian, I'm um, excuse me, in the Roman traditions, what and the ambition and the and the codes of the moral, excuse me, ambition in the Roman Empire ruined the moral and social fabric, and that's happening in our world again. And we have to slow that down. I'm not saying through socialism or communism. I'm just saying through conscious autonomy and free will and rejection of these systems. We don't need people slaving slaving for us at McDonald's. We don't need all these useless jobs. If people, for instance, I live in Las Vegas, tourist capital. If people were happy with where they were living and connected with the land, they would need to take some trips, but they wouldn't need to come to the to the Las Vegas Strip and get drunk and walk around like an idiot. And thus, we wouldn't need this crazy tourist industry you have. And because we have this crazy 24-hour tourist industry, it creates a ton of transient people. It creates, you know, down on the Strip, anything is possible. You can do, you know, white drugs. You There are prostitutes everywhere. And everyone around turns a blind, everyone turns a blind eye to that who works down there and works all night. And then that thus uh, uh, infiltrates the education system. Now, a lot of kids, parents aren't home at all. And that's they run the streets and are idiots. And, you know, yeah, they become idiots because they don't have a good sleep schedule. They don't have anyone that cares about them. And they cause problems in school. And that affects other kids. And it goes on and on and on. Literally billions of problems just created because of the... That, of the tourism industry in one area and people don't come people don't come to las vegas to see a site or to experience they come to to tune out of reality so i understand that we need to maintain things but there are so many illegitimate jobs out there and 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 because of and i understand that there's greed out there a lot of people hold on to money and want to spend the money and live a life that they want to live because they say i've worked so hard but once again it all seems to be that they aren't happy with their own lives and with where they are like right now i i know that when i've lived out in nature i've had the opportunity to live out in the forest and on a couple acres of land before and when i was there and there wasn't really much going on i was very comfortable there was no reason for me to 
go anywhere else. And like I've said before in this video, I came back, I started living the life I'm living now so that I can make videos like this and change people's life, you know, buy, buy cameras, you know, do what I need to do to spread knowledge to the people. And I hope one day I can return to that. But for now, we need to get back. The next chapter we'll be talking about is titled The Difficulty of Understanding Mythology. And this is a huge problem, especially for people on the right, conservatives. And a lot of people don't want to hear this, but the religious right and conservatives in general are just the other side of the coin of the left, of the people, of the woke individuals. And they are no better because of their closed mindedness and their little view of reality and their inability to understand symbols. And of course, this has melted into everybody, but I would like to talk to you guys about something. Over the past like, five or six years or whatever of teaching English classes, I've had, we'll, we'll call it a hundred hundred parents challenged books that I was covering in class. And I didn't get to pick these books. A lot of these books were classics. And if you guys don't know what a challenging challenge, uh, a book challenge is, is that a, a, a parent will come in and say, my, my kid is not reading this book because of X, Y, and Z. 100 out of 100 times, those parents were conservative or on the right. And 100 out of 100 times, the content that we were covering was not and did not talk about sex, drugs, or violence in any overt way. way. There may be something implied in there. And we were talking about dealing with high schoolers here. And once and 100 out of 100 times, the students whose parents were protesting were exposed by their friends who I also knew and, and by um, social media and movies to much more insane content than what the parents were protesting. Even the most religious, devout 14, 15, 16, 17 year old in high school that has some friends and isn't in some little small town where everyone's like them is going to be exposed to sex, drugs, and violence by their friend, even if it's just in conversation, maybe not images or like something in deep, but they're going to hear about it. They're going to laugh about it. There's going to be jokes told. And that's just what public school is about. And you know, if you don't want to deal with that, you homeschool your kids and keep them away from the, the mass of kids from a bunch of different backgrounds. But these parents would freak out about some of these books. And we're, I mean, I had parents freak out about every classical book that you could imagine. I had a parent one time who didn't want us to read, re let their child, who was a 15, 16 year old, read about a, a, a novel about Afghanistan because they thought it was propaganda about Afghanistan, but it was a book that was pre, that was set pre-2001. It was just about really the tribal lifestyle of Afghanistan and part of their culture. And they thought it was a sympathy party for the Taliban, but the Taliban didn't even exist in the story. It was about a family who was struggling and having a hard time. And it was like a coming of age story and about them trying to leave, make enough money to leave the country. But they said, oh, my child's not going to learn about Afghanistan. And I had many similar irrational incidents. And it's because that people can't read things literally. I'm sure you guys have experienced this before. When you have a friend or someone you uh, and you watch a movie or read a book and they take things way too literally, they don't, they aren't able to understand metaphor. And metaphor are really just symbols. And Bly states that a symbol in our time is no longer a physical thing. Half of the symbols one can say belong to our physical world with wombs, haystacks, yardsticks, flowers, volcanoes, porcupines, tax collectors. And because of the lack of interest in the physical world and in the, the tactile world among um, screens, the symbol really can't exist on the screen. You have to see it a lot of the time. To be around symbols and to experience them and let them flow into metaphor together, you have to have a very diversified experience in the marketplace. But now in our washed down suburban environment, where a lot of people live these very controlled lives and with very controlled decor, and maybe they go to a very controlled church or very controlled playgroup, and everything is very controlled, and they're exposed to almost no symbols, and they almost become symbol autistic. So then when they, so like I've had genius students who are like literal, who parent, whose parents were very religious, and they were very smart. They had been trained to read, write, think, and I'd read them a poem, and they were always trying to interpret the poem. Like, what does this poem mean? I'd be reading them a haiku by Basho, and I'm like, yeah, we can get, like the meaning is a small thing, but what does this mean for life? What does this mean about, about about how you're going to leave and act differently today. And that and that's not what parents want. That's what's really scary about what's happening in the public school system. It's like, don't teach my kids that. You know, just teach my kid how to read, write, do math and science. And it's like, no, you go to school and you have a teacher because that teacher can hopefully change your life and how you view the world. Because if a random teacher can destroy some of your mental fortitude or some of your values or preconceived ideas, they weren't strong enough anyway. The parents or whoever in the family or the community didn't do a good enough job. So that means that the person is going to have to go on an exploration because if they don't, then suddenly they may be 25 and don't really, they, they, they don't, 
care enough about this system that they are in, they may start rebelling, abusing it, or fall out completely and become an ex-Mormon and an ex-Christian and an ex-Muslim and all these different labels instead of moving through different things and maybe respecting the community instead of hating it later on. And teachers all throughout history are supposed to maybe challenge some of these ideas and you were maybe going to get into arguments and lose faith for a little bit, but you would come back to it because you had the community there, but the journey would also create some growth for you. You didn't have to lose all of your faith, but maybe question some ideas, maybe question some of the systems or rules. And now that that happens, but it's in a very extreme way. Kids will just, uh, kids, one, don't have that. And if they do, they just outright reject it. They go straight from, I'm a devout, like I knew girls, and I'm sure maybe you did too, and guys, but I knew girls in high school who were very religious. But then out of nowhere, they were drinking, smoking, and having sex with a bunch of dudes. And later on, they actually, most of them actually became religious again. But there was no middle ground for them. They're in these very constrained situations. There is no middle ground. There is no, hey, if you fall off track, you can go here and then rise back up or do whatever. It's like, no, you're either in or you're out. And with these dial- these dialects create a bunch of problems. And they aren't helpful for, once again, we're talking about interpreting symbols and understanding mythology. You can't interpret these stories literally. And you also can't over-interpret them either. So if you want to think about like religious people and like more the deconstruction of subjective left, you actually have to look at a story without any of that. If we're going to read the story of Ganesha or Jack and the Beanstalk, if you actually listen to it, it, that's all you need to do. I know I just spent an hour deconstructing Jack and the Beanstalk, but if you just listen to a story, a fable, and you keep listening to stories and reading, you actually don't have to interpret them. And I know this channel is kind of about the interpretation of symbols and stories, but I mostly read for fun. I've read for fun for years. And then over that time, I developed more of an interest in theory and the interpretation of a story. But all the growth I've ever gotten from books, 99% of it comes from just the base level story, not me diving deeper into it. And we can't expect that of people either. We can't tell people like you need to read this, but then you also need to take this literally, which is a problem because if people take a story literally, that's not good. They won't get anything out of it or they'll just take it too far. Look what happened with the Bible. Or if you overinterpret it, you won't see it either. That's what happens in classes today. We'll go into a class and it's like, oh, what's the theme of this? What's the setting? What's the plot? And then if a if, if story's fantasy or magical, people can, won't get sucked into it because they think it's not real. And instead, we should just be reading to students. We should just be reading stories to read stories, having the time. There always needs to be a grade and an assessment and a warm up, And we have to make sure everyone is doing it and making progress. We can't even hold kids accountable to read anymore because that would be the best the best thing to do. The, the greatest reset for our public education system would be to ditch math and science for one year and just read. Make everybody read. But guess what? We can't make people read anymore. And that's why, you know, the public education system is a joke anyway. But we can't make people read more. But imagine if all the students and from even in college, 22 and younger, all just read whatever they wanted for a year when they would, would be working, studying for other things or in a class, spent all that time reading. How would our society look different in 10 years? What kind of conversations in love? Thinking about, you know, you guys know when you meet someone who knows the books that you like and you have those conversations with them, the love and fun that it creates. What do we talk about instead? Past, you know, it's really weird when you hear the conversations of most people, they talk about past trauma and they trauma bond with each other and they talk about what's on the news and random events and the TV show they're watching. And it's like, what if we could talk about philosophy? What if we could talk about these ideas? Not all the time, but explore those together and grow in those things together and understand the world in a deeper way. Because by understanding that, by understanding and just reading, then you have access to more symbols in our reality. And by understanding that, then you could become more connected and happier. And Blight talks about people taking his book, Iron John, and looking at it in a very literal way as you know, weightlifting book or this big masculinity book. And that's the problem. And it's like, I've told the story before on this uh, show before, but I have a short story out there and it'll be in a book one day, hopefully in the next year or two. And it's about a Vietnamese shaman and he's on drugs and like all this stuff is happening. And I remember taking it to a college writing workshop and you know, it's one of the ones where you can't say anything. And the first, this like really this old dude that was like 50, I don't know why he was in the class with a bunch of like 25 year olds. And he, he he's the first one to comment. And he says, wow, you know, this was the greatest, this was a great, remix of like the Jesus story and like the reinterpretation of the cross and like this had nothing like I don't even see how you could see that but then he kicked it all off and you know there were like five kids in the class that didn't want to be there and there was like three other ones that maybe did but they just followed him along and they in- were just like overly literally interpreting the story under this lens of Jesus instead of actually just reading the story for what it was and I guess that's what creative writing workshops are for but they could have maybe there were actually a lot of things like transition sentences and problems that I l- had to fix on my own la- later that they could have been talking 
talking about and said like, hey, like this bridge, this gap, this jump scene, like cut scene, like this didn't really work very well. But instead the, oh, like we've been trained to be way too literal and it's, a, it's an absolute problem. So do you, do you guys see this in our society now? People not being able to interpret mythology anymore and taking it too literally. And if you think about action movies and stuff, things are getting so realistic that all we can do is interpret literally. There is no room to watch a Marvel movie. A lot of these, there are, there's less and less symbols in interpretation because people can't handle that. People who, if there isn't a logical story, just like with, you know, the reduction of the attention span, if there isn't A through Z and everything is perfect, then people can't follow you. It's even on YouTube. You have to, like, there's a formula for YouTube. You have to write a script and do this. And there's, you, you know, a lot of YouTubers do it like an essay form. They have three main points. You make five points within those three main points, introduction, conclusion. There's a hook. There's an intro. There's subscribe. 90 seconds in, you're supposed to give an advertisement. There's this whole system, but, and they are doing that because we're losing the ability to take, you know, follow people, even if they've gone off into the ether in terms of their story. And I think that is a huge problem. We're going to get into why this is happening, transition sentence, in our next chapter, which is what is vertical thought? So the last chapter we'll be covering in great detail is called what is vertical thought? And I really want to take this one slow because I really feel like this is the pinnacle chapter of the text and it has so much to go through. A lot of the stuff we've been talking about has been important, but this is really Robert Bly firing at all cylinders and really one of the last times that he did for the end of his life. So we start off with a Yeats poem and I will be displaying everything we'll be reading through basically the whole chapter together let's make this a little bit bigger for everybody that is no country for old men the young in one another's arms birds in the trees those dying generations at their song the salmon falls the mackerel crowded seas fish flesh or fowl commend all summer long whatever is begotten born and dies caught in that sensual music all neglect monuments of unaging intellect eat presents these complaints, and we're quoting Bly here, as if he had thought of them only when he was old. Yeats was 62 in 1927 when he wrote about the abundant sexuality of young men and women, the abundance of the fish tribes, and the obsession in Irish society with, with whatever is begotten, born, and dies. He was growing old himself, but actually the contrast between sexuality and the ageless had been a prime element of his thought since he was very young. And Yeats here is commenting on that sexual energy, and Bly talks about it. When you start to retain your sexual energy, your creative spirit grows, and Napoleon Hill in his very famous famous book, Think and Grow Rich, talked about that being the secret to most men. They learn how to transmute their sexual energy. And as we've seen with pornography and other things, that is becoming harder for people to do. But most people, even pre-pornography, never figured out how to do that. And what do I mean by that? If we look at the East and what the East and the yogis and the Hindus figured out about sexual energy, they learned that when you especially ejaculate as a man or a woman, you will have this release of spiritual energy. And if we look at the chakras, once again, if we're going back, the whole idea of higher consciousness is taking energy from the bottom from our the from our groin area from our spine all the way up to our head and all the way out to the crown and you can do that through a multitude of things diet fasting yoga inversions meditation breathing exercises um celibacy or um, performing sexual practices without ejaculation there's a great book called the multi-orgasmic man and i know this may sound a little crude and this is a robert bly video but there are ways to have as a man for instance a 10 plus minute orgasm that feels 80 to 90 percent as good as an ejaculatory orgasm without ejaculating and Bly calls this you know idea that we need to have children raise them grow old grow sick and die hanging on the meat wheel and that's what we need to escape the meat wheel is not creative you can have kids you can copulate you can grow old and die but that is not the purpose of our life that and it is a revolutionary thing to escape that not through being an incel not through being a radical feminist or radical that says we can't populate because of climate change. No, choosing to not live that existence. If you have kids, giving them a different type of life, not attaching yourself completely to them and giving them the freedom to grow. Because a lot of people, when they get caught on the meat wheel, and I know I have a lot of listeners out there who actually are single dads or parents, and a lot of them, because of their quote unquote duties, have started to exist in horizontal existence. And once again, we'll come back to this from earlier in this video, that vertical thinking, as Bly put it, when you go up, it's more religious. You're moving into the ether. It's very, it can be religious in whatever context. We could call it moving up into higher consciousness and obtaining mystical states of whatever type. Going lower is more psychology though. Going into the shadow, it's a little bit more brooding and contemplative and deals with the emotions. And it does deal with the lower aspects of the self, which are just as important in mastering those and understanding those because there's actually a lot of depth down there. Quote, the sibling society is almost the pure antithesis of a Tibetan monastery. We have drunk beer so long that we have virtually forgotten the taste of real wine. Rumi and Hafez refer over and over to wine, which carries the flavor of the longing for God, the taste of the vertical, which is the after flavor of ecstasy. How blessed is the man who, like Hafez, has tasted in his heart the wine made 
before Adam. To become a genuine artist in our society is more and more difficult because fewer and fewer people have tasted in their heart the wine made before Adam. Even if an artist creates a spiritual work, the readers are so flat, the art critics are so horizontal that its wine is not recognized. So let's talk about some vertical poetry. Vert quote, vertical poetry and art like to imagine the patterns of water flowing under the earth, dragging, uh, dragons exploding out of earth waters and rising into the clouds. Vertical thought likes to imagine the vast distances between the stars. Giamco Leopardi, as he sat alone on an Italian hillside at dusk said, the hermit's hill has always been dear to me. Also this hedge grow, which keeps me hidden partially from the gaze of the wide horizon. Sitting here and looking, I fashion with my mind the spaces beyond the earth that have no end. And those silences that are not human at all. In the deepest of all quiet, for a little while my heart feels no fear. Then as I hear wind freshen through the leaves, I go farther and compare the sound to that everlasting silence. And I remember eternity and all the long dead seasons and this present season alive with her voices. And so my thoughts find themselves in that immensity, shipwrecked, and sweet to me is the drowning in that sea. Drowning and descent are not so much feared by the vertical gazers. Machado, Antonio Machado said, Mankind owns four things that are no good at sea. Rudder, anchor, oars, and the fear of going down. Hadewitch of Antwerp says, I do not complain of suffering for love. It is right that I should always obey her, for I always know her only as if she is in herself. Whether she commands in storm or in stillness, this is a marvel beyond my understanding, which fills my whole heart and makes me stray in a wild desert. The higher the spirit goes, the more deeply the soul sinks into the waters of melancholy, melancholy and tragedy. And going down into those waters is a sweet thing, Rumi says. The captain walks on the planks of fearful things that might happen. He walks on the decking of marvelous things that might happen. When both decking and planks are gone, nothing remains but the drowning. Crystal Art Projects, Detective Story, Disneyland's, Madonna-like singers, Muzak, Disney, Disco, Hollywood movies, and that water running under the bridge of Madison County carry a certain single-minded optimism that fits with the excitement of aimless murder and aimless art, making a sideways view that leaves out all drowning. The influence of popular art is so great that many human beings now live their whole lives without meeting vertical attention in any embodiment that makes it feel real. Vertical attention implies the ability or at least the longing to look downward or the ability to look upward at the stars, at the energy beyond the stars, at angels. One problem with the sibling society is that and its intense desire to get away from hierarchy, it unintentionally avoids all vertical longing. We could say that vertical longing has to do with feeling, hierarchy with power. The Catholic Church took over or adapted the power of hierarchies of the Roman Empire, and that has been conflated with conflated the two, longing and hierarchy, ever since. It has confused everything. The European monasteries of the Middle Ages, particularly the Fran Franciscan, with their guarding, gardening and vows of poverty, did try to separate longing and hierarchy. The bishops and Franciscans themselves violated these principles. The church said then and still set, can say to a priest, if you leave a hierarchy, you are forbidden to receive the communion that will save your soul. So a lot of problems were created by religion when you bring in vertical longing and hierarchy. And because of that, for instance, the Marxists, as Bly states, saw that looking upward to religion and downward to, toward psychology were a terrible idea. So they started dismantling everything. If we look at the great cultural revolution, they destroyed one third of Chinese history during just just in a couple of years, all the art, sculptures, poetry and old people, people that read and if I want, if I'm going to give you guys my interpretation of vertical thinking, step one, you know, for all my beginners out there, people who you have to just start going outside a little bit more and writing this is three line poems. You know, if you look, not even haiku, but if you look at Basho, the temple bells stop, but the sounds keep coming out of the flowers. You can go outside and I can't see anything because it's night right now, but I can think water sprays, red bushes sitting in dark corners of forgotten backyards. That took me 10 seconds to think in my head. I could write that down and just start observing, start writing, start thinking, start finding images and bringing images into your life. Start trying to move up and down the chain. I know you guys already are into shadow work and doing this, but if we want to start moving vertically, we have to, first of all, set up practices, routines in our life that guarantee that we can do it a little bit each day because it's great to think like, oh, I'll be able to do this and I'll write poetry, but you guys know sometimes life happens and we live in a very horizontal world. We're getting programmed horizontally every single day. Every time I go outside and see these advertisements and hang out with people, I almost, and work my job, I'm living in a very horizontal existence. So uh, establishing a baseline of routines and habits that actually create vert verticalness are really important. A meditation practice, journaling, writing one or two three-line poems a day, doing art, taking a daily walk out in nature. All these things can start helping you move out of the vertical scale. And then eventually, of course, you can start just ripping out and going all the way. You can go down all the way into the depths of psychology or establish a really deep yoga or spiritual routine and go all the way up or use psychedelics, whatever you want to do. But if you're having trouble, start somewhere. Don't just 
like for sure don't just go take psychedelics we talked about earlier in this video you know do that in a very safe manner don't just give up everything and say you're going to become a writer so move toward that start speaking less start feeling more start consuming less stop buying into like we saw the list disneyland the news all the movies sing single culture and i can guarantee you guys that your life will start going better so that's my recommendation for everyone out there try to eliminate some stuff and just add in a couple of routines and see where you go from there you'll start feeling better and that is the closing out of this beautiful chapter so our next chapter is titled the snake that wants to eat all its brides. And this is a Swedish story. And we were just talking about psychedelics. And let's hear a quote from Bly about the 60s. Many of the extravagant characteristics of the sibling society showed up in the 1960s. For example, the reliance on drugs. Many activities were done in genuine fear, even terror of the, elder, of the elders' culture. The new consciousness was not in the world to support the old culture, but to wipe it out and replace it. Jerry Garcia said at Al Altamont in 1969, the place smelled of sulfur. He said that the light was weird and demonic. The psychedelics promised and temporarily at least delivered a mythological or cosmic world of which the elders knew nothing. Many 60s youths felt that they had gone on far ahead of their parents. Elders were symbolically killed in the very taking of acid, done without any grasp of what that might mean. Native Americans felt horror that white people would take peyote with no elders present. No one to clear the air or to protect the souls from invasions by those spirit, spirits who do not wish to dwell with us. And, you know, if we want to take that literally or even metaphorically or find the middle ground, look at a lot of the people who take psychedelics now. They have lost. They've been consumed by the spirits, by the negativity. We, we're talking about sacred sons and the whole weird psychedelic movement now. And these people are not complete. These people are eternal seekers who have not connected into deeper empathy because if they did, once again, their lifestyle would be different. They'd either be trying to go and become more reclusive or they would be actually trying to help in the most potent ways possible. But instead, they are moving more into hedonism and their own enlightenment. All they care about is their own enlightenment. And that's not what our elders teach us. If we look at the elders, and I know we don't have many anymore, but they talk Talk about, first of all, protecting your family, protecting your community. And we haven't really got into this, but one of the solutions that, I mean, I guess we did, it's all about localism. If we don't find these local pockets who start resisting some of the tyranny that the government or whoever is trying to impart on us, we will start becoming more and more enslaved by institutions. And if you look at any really leftist, socialist, any revolution in history, one of the first things that happens is that they kill the elders, that you kill off the elder class. And it's really weird now because we haven't really made another elder class. When you look at most elders now, a lot of elders pretend you were born in 1950 you're now 72 years old you were um probably uh had maybe evolved in the vietnam war or something but there was so much tension there was always so much polarity that's the hippie movement that's the people that went to vietnam and had to fight in a brutal war that was unjustified and probably suffered a lot of ptsd it was it's also an awakening generation who had the influence of technology to remove a lot of their morality we're thinking of the, you know led zeppelin pink floyd Jimi hendrix a lot of and they were and so now when i meet people out of those ages i I don't feel that they have the wisdom and some of the deepness that people like, for instance, a Robert Bly have to have, even though I know he's like 25, was 25 years older than them. But if you go think back like 20 years ago, you think even let's, let's call it 15 years ago. When you think of some of the elders, people who are 80 and 90 years old in 2010, let's say, if you're 90 years old, that means you were born in 1920. That means when you were 30, there really weren't TVs around yet. You maybe didn't even have a radio growing up. Maybe you had, there was a radio around. You witnessed the start of cinema and we could access those people. I would was in high school and talked to people like that and knew people of that age and you guys did too and they had a different perspective on society but we are now at that point where all the elders have really been exposed to tv to culture to music and been stuck in whatever polarity from day one and it's getting harder and a lot of, some people haven't of course i i speak you know a lot of people haven't and they're out there but the, the the amount of actual elders with wisdom is decreasing every single day and not even book wisdom just that elder honor and face to hold you don't see you probably didn't see as much people People, you know, old people in in whatever era, if we look back even to the 50s and 60s, trying to act like they are young and wearing leather jackets and riding motorcycles and trying to act like a bunch of badasses, dying their hair, dancing around on TikTok. They had that smug look to their face. They kept it real. They wanted to spend time in their backyard, doing things in nature, working on things, taking care of their garden, seeing their grandkids, talking the talk, going out to their favorite place to eat. And, you know, that routine creates a sense of solid motivation for younger people. Like, for instance, my grandpa just died like five months ago. 
when he was 95 years old. I think he was born in 1927. And he was working until he was 95 years old as a lawyer, which sounds insane. Obviously not that much, just, you know, a case here or there. He was like doing like will, will law. But that man had, was that he was in World War II. He had a routine. He lived in this, he, he lived in the same house for 60 something years. And when you talk to him about certain things, because he was, you know, by the time all the hippie stuff was happening, he was already in his 40s having kids. And when you talk to him, the stories and the stability that he would give you and the things that he would say, yeah, wake up at four in the morning, work as hard as you can. These are the things that you need to read. Read the classics, read Churchill and Tolkien and, you know, all, all the other classics and participate in your local community and church. And even though maybe I don't do some of those things, it was very motivating and it, it helped me out at times of darkness and in times when I needed direction to know that there was someone out there who had been successful, who had a very fulfilled life and found purpose and found meaning. So I'm in a sense lucky, but now we, we had modern medicine come and help us out. But now with bad food and obesity, our elders are even dying too early. You statistically have a pretty high chance of your mother and father dying kind of early now. And obviously, if you go back in history, that was the case back then, but that doesn't need to be like this. These are a lot of these are preventable diseases. So now let's talk about the story, of course. So the story starts off with a queen giving birth. She's giving birth with the midwife and then a snake comes out and she throws it out of the window and then she has a son and they forget about it. Later on, the son is driving a carriage to go pick up his groom or, or excuse me, his bride to get married and there's this snake and he says, a, a, a bride for you, a bride for me. I'm the firstborn son. And then, you know, he figures out that his mom did this. So they start bringing wives to the snake, but then he eats them all and he keeps eating them. And then the 13th one tricks him. She wears a bunch of wedding shirts and she says, hey, take your, if you shed one of your skins, I'll take off one of my shirts. And he sheds enough of his skins and becomes a little, he becomes paralyzed. And then she scrubs them off some more and rips up, rips them open. And then there's a handsome man inside and they become, you know, they get married. Beautiful story. This is kind of going back to the Norwegian girl story that there's this wild being inside of us that was thrown out. Then there was this other being that was cherished and admired we went to school all the attention was on us but what about that wild being that's still outside at the crossroads and we're going to hear a poem from robert uh, richard wilbur now about a snowman who stands outside looking into the windows of a lit warm house seeing the snowman standing all alone in the dusk and cold is more than he can bear a small boy weeps to hear the wind prepare a night of gashings and enormous moan his tearful sight can hardly reach to where the pale-faced figure with bootman's eyes returns him such a god-forsaken stare as outcast gave as outcast adam gave to paradise when you look at the sibling society its aptness its absences its flatness its numbness realize that most pe that people have been thrown out the window Women, Marines, Black people, Hispanic people, and children. The story says that the people being thrown out the window will prevent us from marrying. And if you look now, like a lot of people are very resentful in our society. A lot of people have been thrown out. A lot of people have had a lot of crap done to them in our society. If you look at the plight of African Americans, of Blacks in the United States, starting with obviously the Atlantic slave, slave trade, slave trade, slavery, all the crap that happened after slavery. Then if you look in, you know, Jim Crow laws, a lot of the stuff that happened with the um, in the early 1900s with keeping certain black groups down. If you look at what happened with Marcus Garvey and how the FBI, the pre-FBI, then the FBI was, inf you know, J. Edgar, Edgar Allen Hoover was infiltrating these groups and keeping them down. And, you know, we, we can talk about, um, for instance, you know, the movie Cocaine Cowboys and how the CIA was bringing coke into ghettos and creating the crack epidemic. There's a lot of stuff that happened along the way to just one group of people. And they're like, if we look at every single other, like, like for instance, Marines, women. I mean, we've talked about a lot of these in our story, in our video already today. A lot of people have experienced a lot of trauma and grief and, and a, a lot people get mad when they come back. And obviously they're going to even at some level be irrational. They've experienced and they're, they, when you experience a lot of crap. You are going to return one day when you are on top or you're doing a little bit better and want your piece of the pie. And Bly gives some interesting ideas about this. He says that giving the rage a chance to express itself does not solve the problem. And yet the rage is a fact. We know that drive that from drive-by killings, if from nothing else, simply allowing children to watch television as many hours as they watch is to throw them out the window. Garbage is what we throw out the window. Metaphorically, the place where we throw them is not far away, just over there. And, you know, we look at like the rage of a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of groups of, in the past couple of years when there's protests and things happen, it never ends. There's always rage, there's always problems. And that's unfortunately not the way out, but that is the initial reaction. Sometimes that's all you can do is just rage. And we're throwing our children out all the time and it's getting worse and worse. And they're going, these, all these kids, all these people. So a lot of, I, I, you know, obviously a lot of race, race relations have gotten, even if it doesn't seem like it better in our country, for instance, you just go back to the sixties, like segregation is over. We have things such as affirmative action 
and a lot more programs, places, ideas, diverse voices out there to help marginalize people in our country. Even though racist and sexist still exist for sure in every single town and every single neighborhood, there's a little bit more of community support and padding than there was four or five decades ago. So now with that though, we are all starting to now experience a lot of more of the same problems. Like I grew up with people from all different types of races. You probably did too. I'm still friends with a lot of them. And most of the time, our biggest problems are all the same. It's from getting thrown out the window. It's not some of the, it's, it's a lot less of the classic problems that people, if we went back to the 60s, if I was in the 1960s and I had a bunch of friends of all races, we would have obviously different problems. But now our problems are the same and they're probably getting worse. And what happens when 30 years from now, the millennials come back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, and they come home to roost. And we're starting to see that with school shooters and a lot of these problems with the great resignation, problems with the economy. We're all coming home to roost with student loan debt and all these different things. And no one has a solution because there are no good solutions. Because of downsizing, parental neglect, and bad schools, almost every member of Generation X or the daycare generation feels thrown out the window. Inner city of all races have been thrown out into a wasteland. And I agree. And it's sad with all the technology and the food that I've worked, you know, in person in inner city schools before as a teacher and seeing kids not just deal with the problems of living in poverty or a bad situation, which create a lot of stress and problems, but then having to deal with depression, anxiety, and all the other things that are getting created by technology, bad food, and other things in our life. It, it, it's really crazy to see. And they don't have the resources that other kids have you know, maybe at richer schools to help with that. They you know their parents most of the time work really hard, you know, at lower paying jobs and they don't maybe sometimes understand they give their kids a lot of affection and a lot of time, but maybe they don't understand that their kids may be dealing with mental health issues and need help. And obviously a lot of parents don't, but you know, it's just something I've noticed and I'm very sad about that. I've, I saw it get worse when, when I was working at some of those schools from when I started and when I ended, maybe we'll call it three or four years with some of that compounding effect. And what it does is somebody feels thrown out the window with the body language. And you know, I just want to help. I want all of us to come together and create entertaining content online that can reach more people. And I know that's not the solution. That's just more flatness. But we need to tell people this message and it maybe doesn't happen in a four hour video. And as Robert Bly says here, when you actually speak to these people, when you speak all different types of people who've been thrown out into the wasteland underneath all of them after a layer or two, like rich kids, poor kids, doesn't matter. A layer or two deeper, there's a grief and sadness and a longing for a connection with anyone they can find it with. It doesn't matter, you know, the, the, even the worst kids. I remember I had these had these one students, man, and can't remember this kid's name, but he loved to read, man. He would read Ernest Hemingway. He read almost all of Ernest Hemingway's books and existentialists and a bunch of other people. But this kid was a rough writer, man. Like he was, it was lucky if you saw him in school. I don't think he was passing most of his classes. I One day he came in, he had a he had this swollen eye. He's like, look what we just did. Because the kids would, kids in mass would walk like 80 to 100 of them would walk across the street to the apartment com an apartment complex, go around the corner so no one could see them and just have big brawls and fights and walk back. And I, they showed me this video of, oh, look what we did. And they were just having this big brawl and kicking people on the ground. And this kid was getting kicked on the ground and getting up and punching people. And I'm like, wow. But like when him and I would talk, man, he would literally shed so many layers. Like when, like, he, he cried about the old man in the sea to me. Like we were on a one-on-one -on -one and no one was there after school. And he was crying about Erne an Ernest Henningway story. It's like, it's like, wow, like we're not that far off. And that's why I always say that if we got people into these holes, if we've thrown them out the window, like Bly says, they're not that far away. We can go grab them and bring them back inside. And it starts just like the Norwegian girl story with just asking like, why? Like what's wrong? Like, why are you acting like this? Why are you feeling like this? And not doing it from some like, high fluid in place, but getting to know them. And then later on being like, you know, do you really need to like be participating in this lifestyle? Like it's maybe not the best thing for you. And we can't do it. Cause a lot of the time, unfortunately, a lot of the people doing this are cops. Like a lot of cops, get to know kids that are getting in trouble and they start asking like, hey man, if you ever need anything, but no one wants to get help from the cop that's been arresting them and arresting their friends. We need, and you always hear this, this is something that I agree with and I understand why it's problematic that people on the left say we need more social workers and more mental health workers in a lot of these, in schools or like impoverished areas and, and people will say, oh, we don't, how are we gonna afford that? That's not gonna do anything. When we put people in there, they don't do anything. There's no help. It might take a very long time to actually penetrate into these. It's much like if we view this, for instance, all all of society, everyone that's been thrown out of the window, all classes, all races, all genders. It's almost like a counterinsurgency that we need to perform a counterinsurgency on these people. And we need to go in and win over hearts and minds over the long haul and help individual families and find the connections and find who we should talk to and find the inroads instead of just sitting there and hoping that people come to us and hoping that people find us. No, we need to go there. So working communities. And 
there's a whole aspect to this that's also, and this is what the Marxists know, that's all economic, that this is all fun and games, but the best thing that you can do is actually create wealth, that if the more wealth you create, actually a lot of these problems start to alleviate. And that's where people on the right, for instance, would be like, that's why, you know, free market economics are better. You know, there's a lot of arguments here that we don't need to get into. This is a call of action. We need help. People need help right now. People are getting thrown out the window left and right, and it's compounding with whatever situation they are in. It's not helping because people of, and especially kids of all across the, the country and, and Western society have their own set of unique problems. But now we're giving them a very similar set of problems and we need to remove a lot of that and get back to solving their unique problems again. Because back in the 60s and 70s, before technology, and, you know, to the 20s, to the 70s, maybe when we had the opportunity to do that, we didn't even have the language, we didn't even have the psychological language or the structure or the way in to do that. And maybe I'm just, you know, being on, on some progressive hippie high horse here, but what else are we going to do? The story can also be seen as the hostile being inside of us. There is this hostile being inside of us that creates a lot of problems. I know you guys have experienced it. I've been self-destructed before. I've gone through periods of my life as a criminal, as maybe not the most honest person. And it wasn't until I started pulling off my skins and going down in those layers because I became hard. The reason I became that is because of trauma, of you know having maybe not the, the most loving upbringing, having some of my best friends die from drugs and drug-related incidents around me, from violence. It does a lot to you know an 18, 19, and 20-year-old soul to be experiencing death, drugs, violence, and not know how to process it. It can take a while and it can affect people in a very weird way. I know it did to me. It sent me down an absolute spiral. And luckily I had, I had the grounding. I had men around me. I was, I don't know what I would have had. Like I was during my worst moments, I was doing jujitsu for four or five hours a day and hanging around with men who were at least trying to keep me a little bit grounded and in the right direction and doing yoga a little bit, a little after martial arts, doing yoga with people who were trying to help me, and invite me to reading groups or to nice bougie parties. And I had professors at university telling me that I was better than some of the stuff I was doing and being involved in. And that helped me raise up, and start shedding those skins because I, you know, and I was thrown out the window too by my, in high school, you know, I'll just get super personal here, like physically bullied for years and then suddenly I came into at least some semblance of self but no one around me even understood me and then I find a, found a small conglomerate of people who had gone through the same thing I did and what do you think we did? A lot of rage, a lot of destruction. Never any physical violence toward people. I've never hurt anyone in my life. Graffiti, property damage, mindless insults, hurting people's feelings. That happened a bunch. And it's crazy because once again, I had at least, you know, I had my parents and a couple other human beings out there, or just the thought of them, like in sports, just like these things that were barely holding me in. Like I was so close to being dead also, to being and having the same fate as some of my friends who were running around with me back then, so came to. But just a little bit of support from other men who were looking back, not even gods, not even anyone who I would necessarily call smart, call intelligent, but just who had a good heart and who wanted to help or just listen to me and understand me. Like I've never felt more shame than when my coach figured out about some of the illegal stuff I was doing. Like when that, I avoided him for months. Like it happened, a lot of it kind of came to a head in my senior year. And it was kind of, af it was after right after the sports season that I participated in. And I have never felt more scared to see someone and felt more shame in my entire life. We'll say it happened in like November. I didn't see him. I avoided him completely. I was ditching school, so I didn't see him. I would, if I saw him anywhere, I would be running away. And I didn't see him until I had missed some application, uh, turning in some application. I missed some important deadline to graduate high school. And I was sitting there with like the council and they're like, man, you're screwed. Like we're gonna have to do, you know, who's going to help you? Like we don't have time to help you right now to do this. And at, the, at that very moment, my coach walked in and he was talking to them about something. He was like, hey, what are you doing in here, Ian? And they're like, yeah, Ian screwed this up. And he was like, oh, I know exactly what to do with that. I used to, at this other school, I did this all the time. Ian, come with me. And, you know, he sat there and he treated me like a human being, man. Like he didn't mention any of the stuff. He said, have you been avoiding me? And like, I haven't seen you at all. And, you know, I think that was maybe the last time I ever saw him. And like, he didn't mention any, because it affected him. Like he was very, he was such a stickler about his reputation and like, who he was and like we had to wear like we were having to dress up for competitions and act a certain way and no one could act out and like what we did was like an absolute bombshell story in terms of like that little pockets rumor world and everyone knew and it was super shameful that we what we did and I, I can just say what we did we went on this absolute egging spree you know like throwing eggs at, of all our uh all our competitors houses like you know just like everyone and somehow you know obviously we got caught you know you know when you do it when you um hit enough people there's enough camera footage to start linking anyway we got caught and it was a big deal 
deal and like very dumb thing to do but just un just excuse me relentless rage and like he never said anything to me or the other culprits because he already knew that we felt bad because we did like i never did anything i never participated in property damage or like screwing with people's stuff ever again after that and like what was, i was like 16. It, it didn't last very long that period was like 15 16 and like I never did anything after that again because like I did feel shameful. I did feel really bad. Like we had to go and apologize and talk to and like reason with all these people that we egged like one by one. Like, can you imagine how embarrassing it is to walk into people's houses and they're just yelling at you and asking you why you did this? And they have known you for years because you've been a part of this small sport and been participating with their you know sons and daughters in the sport. And they thought that you, you know, you I thought you were a good kid. You know, it was I, you know, we heard every, I mean, it was like just an onslaught of like anything that you could imagine. But one figure right there ended that whole period of my life. I never went back to that. And then later on, you know, things got bad again. Like I said, things when I was later on got bad in a different way. And when I was going down that spiral, once again, just a yoga teacher, like I was just, you know, I was very honest and frank about what I was doing and who I was. And he just, just a couple words, just a couple paragraphs of like him saying like, dude, like, look what you're doing. Like, look what you've done with yoga. Like, look at your mind. Look, you're different than these people. Like you don't have to be doing these things. You don't have to be involved in any of this stuff. And boom, in an instant, that era of my life ended. And you know, when it come came to substance abuse, one conversation with one male professor and him holding me accountable for like staying on the right path. Literally, that's all it took. That's just took me, just took one person first semester, just giving me that support and just asking me like, hey, how you doing with that? Like, hey, how you doing with like not going absolutely crazy with substances and like, boom, never had any problems again in my life. You know, it's been eight, nine years now since that. Many other small victories have happened like that too throughout my life with, you know, men and women, you know, the only reason I'm talking to you now is from some of the encouragement that I got from going back to school. You know, I went, I went, you know, here, I just told you guys like for, from 19 to 23, 24, I was just wiling out doing anything that you can imagine. But I was reading the whole time. I was still reading 200 books a year and writing and like I was the knowledge kid, but I decided to go back to school. I decided to go back and try to finish an English degree. And I walked in there. I had a lot of professors who matched my energy, who I, you know, I said, I'm going to research this. Like, and I, came to them and they helped me. They got helped me get papers published. They invited me to conferences. They did whatever they could help me and they didn't need to do that. And that gave me the confidence to say like, I, I don't need to become, I don't want to be an academic. Like this just isn't for me, but I can speak online and make money and like turn English into a career, into a hobby or like whatever I'm doing here and change the world through my voice. And all it took was just a couple people to help me bring me back inside in a couple areas of my life or to just coax me back and say, hey man, like why, what are you doing out there in the rain? And if you're out there in the rain in certain aspects of your life or like you know people out there, like you don't know how big of an impact that you are because if every single one of those people were missing, I'd either be dead or in prison by now. Or best case scenario, you got some just dead end job. And I think it's now a good time to move into the epilogue after that very emotional story of my own personal life and what I went through. And Bali talks about how sibling society at some level isn't bad. Like there's been an equilibrium in our society. There's been a lot of things that we were talking about in the earlier chapter with in terms of race and gender that have gotten a little bit better that are moving probably in the right direction. The internet even, if we look like I, right now you can go to Library Genesis and have instant access to 8, mil, 8 million books for free in one click. Anywhere, anyone in the world with an internet connection can have whatever they need to grow and to love and to escape whatever situation that they are in. And I should have mentioned in that big rant earlier that so many people that also kept me on track on this journey, there were a lot of people in person, but there were so many thinkers. Robert Bly helped me. I just had gotten out of this abusive relationship and I was at rock bottom. I was, it was either suicide or a breakup for me, man. I was absolutely done. And luckily with the help of, hey, look at that. Once again, a male therapist who really helped just encourage me and like just listen to me and gave me some very simple advice. Literally took two sessions of talking to an actual adult, someone that I hadn't been ostracized from in this abusive relationship who helped bring my life back. And after that, you know, I came back to reading and to poetry and to writing and all the things that I had lost. And I found Robert Bly and it changed my life. I realized how important my relationship with my father was and how important my relationship with nature. And I discovered all these new poets and these new ideas about life and masculinity that I had already known were important. But I got to see the real display of the warrior poet path through Robert Bly because he is a champ. You hear all these sacred son, fake men out there acting like they're these warrior poets. But Robert Bly is an actual warrior, an actual man, someone that stood up to the government in the Vietnam War and took a stand. And he's a poet, like lit a literal artist, a high level poet and a father, a community organizer, a thinker, you know, a scholarly type, a man who tr could tr translated so many poems and brought so many and helped so many people come into the, come into 
the English ridden world's consciousness. Are any of these fake men's group out there have leaders who are doing that? No, because they don't have the time. They are viewing this as a business. They're viewing this as an opportunity to make money or to gain followers or to gain some clout. They're taking psychedelics and living this fast paced lifestyle. They don't, they didn't have four years like Bly did living in a New York City apartment. They didn't have those months and those years out on the Minnesota farm. They weren't hanging out with James Wright and Berryman and meeting T.S. Eliot and reading poems to Robert Lowell and being friends with Gary Snyder, Donald Hall, Pablo Neruda. Like, but all of us have access to this. Like I've met and hung out with high level writers in this world. It's not that hard to do it. You just go and talk to them and ask them. And if they're cool and if they like you, you can have a connection with them. We can live in such a beautiful reality if we accept the love that, you know, people like Robert Bly and the people, like I said, who are just around us that maybe we don't notice when it's happening that are trying to give us. And I'm here to encourage you as we're concluding and reading the last couple pages to not be cynical, to not give in, to not fall into that darkness, to not go into Insulan or any of these places that are problematic, to find the light, to continue moving upward, up the chain and you know, going down into your inner psychology and to remove the horizontal gazing, to actually build the self-esteem and believe in yourself, to create a personality. I just read something crazy today that AI is coming, man. AI is going to create videos and write things that are really good, but one thing that AI isn't going to be able to mimic and be as unique as is our personality and all our weird synergy synergies. I just told you all these crazy stories and I'm this unique individual and so are you, but we have to build that and share that with the world, whether, whether that be in person or online. Look at how esoteric a Robert Bly is. Look at all the people around him. Look at all those watching men, one of those men's conference videos. All those guys decided to show up at a, when's the last time you went and hung out with poets and played drums and it wasn't some weird, that this doesn't happen anymore. And like, that's one of the things I guess I want to say at the end of this video that like, that is what my goal is to recreate at some level that mythopoetic movement. It may take me two or three decades, but I am a soldier for that. And I am finding people who want to do that with me. Like I said, I don't need you now. This isn't something that's looming <laughs> on the horizon. This is a, this is across state lines. It, unless, you know, there are, unless I'm just going to be, you know, the igniter and there are people out there who are, you know, Robert Bly type level people who just want, who just need a little bit of motivation or structure to get this thing going. I feel like that, but I also know how easy it is with the horizontal people of our society to let that go to shit. And it probably will be, it needs to be a big enough group of people in an application based scenario. So we don't have too many duds quote. No one is allowed to get that big as Caesar or queen Bodacia seeing images of oneself in our chosen group, whether our group be Hispanics or poets or doctors, one doesn't decide to go anywhere. One can't take a passionate, any passionate steps nor feel any admiration for Beethoven or Mother Teresa or Freud, one's own marital partner. Because by being hobbled, cut off from that horizon by the hundreds of mirrors on all sides, we have nowhere to rest but in envy. The look associated with gratitude upward breaks our contact with the mirrors. As for husband and wife, if they accept the resemblance model, they'll find themselves facing a mirror that is disguised as a partner or a husband or a wife or lover. Then stunned by seeing only herself, woman will lose all passion and inwardness and will not know what she wants and can only envy manhood or masculine freedom. And the man seeing only himself will lose all passion and inwardness and will not know what he wants and can only envy motherhood, woman's freedom or genuine laughter. Each feels a Euclidean emptiness. The recovery of inwardness could free each of us, if not the culture, from the compulsion to see ourselves and others. And now here is Robert Bly's call to action. What is asked of adults now is that they stop going forward to retirement, to Costa Rica, to fortune, and to face the young siblings and the adolescents. One can imagine a field with the adolescents on one side of a lawn drawn on the earth and the adults on the other side looking into their eyes. The adult in our time is asked to reach his or her hand across the line and put the youth into adulthood. That means, of course, that the adults will have to decide what genuine adulthood is. The adults do not turn and walk up to this line and help pull the adolescents over. The adolescents will stay exactly where they are for another 20 or 30 years. If we don't turn to face the young ones, their detachment machines, which are louder and more persistent than ours, will say, I'm not a part of this family, and they will kill any real relationship with their parents. Their parents ha have to know that. They're in the parental society. They were representatives of the adult community. High re highly respected grade and high school teachers, strong personalities, of, the, of novels and epics, admired presidents and senators, Eleanor Roosevelt's, priests untouched by scandal, scandals, older men and women in each community, both visible and capable of renunciation, who drew young people over the line by their very example. But envy and the habit of ingratitude have ended all that. Hope lies in the longing we have to be adults, 
We take an interest in younger ones by helping them find a mentor, by bringing them along to conferences or other adult activities, by giving attention to young ones not in our family at all, then our own feeling of being an adult will be augmented. And adulthood might again appear to be a desirable state for many young ones. In the sibling society, because of the enormous power of le the leveling process, few adults have mentioned remain publicly visible as models, but they are invisible. The very idea of the adult has fallen into confusion. As ordinary adults, we have to ask ourselves in a way that people have 200 years ago did not. What an adult is. I have to ask myself what I have found out in my intimate home written attempts to become adult. Some who has succeeded, someone has who has succeeded better than I can name more qualities of adult than I will, but I will offer a few. I will say that an adult is a person not governed by what we have called pre-edible wishes, the demands for immediate pleasure, comfort, and excitement. Moreover, an adult is able to organize the random emotions and event of his or her life into a memory, a rough meaning, a story. It is an adult perception to understand that the world belongs primarily to the dead, and we only rent it from them for a little while. They created it, they wrote its literature and its songs, and they are deeply invested in how children are treated because the children are the ones who will keep it going. The idea that each of us has the right to change everything is a deep insult to them. The true adult is the one who has been able to preserve his or her intensities, including those intensities proper to his or her generation and creativity, so that he or she may has something to which to meet the intensities of the adolescence. We could say that the adult becomes an elder when he or she not only preserves those intensities, but adds more. The adult is a person who, in the words of Ansari, goes out into the world and gathers the jewels of feelings for others. Finally, the adult quality has been the hardest for me, as a greeting person, to understand is renunciation. The older I get, the more beautiful the word renunciation seems to me. We need to recreate the adult and honor the elder. The hope lies in our longing to be adults and the longing for the young ones. They know what an honorable adulthood is to become adults as well. It's as if all this has been newly to be newly invented, and the adults then have to imagine as well what an elder is, what the elder's responsibilities are, and what it takes for an adult to become a genuine elder. In this problem, the example of the Native American community will be of great help. The last story is a Norwegian story where a man comes and he asks, hey, can I stay in this house tonight? I'm a traveler. And he keeps asking. They keep saying, ask the father of the house. And they keep going. And eventually they get to this father that's only six inches. And, you know, the man says yes. And then also in that house of, you know, multiple generations of, of fathers, that there's a mother and she gives life and all the mothers. And we are, for, we've forgotten the generations in our life and our lineage and we don't even know what that means anymore because their lives are so different from us and we live in these places i don't know what it means that my great great grandfather worked for the hudson bay company and killed the polar bear with an axe that's kind of motivational but what does that mean for me what does your ancestry mean to you some of us don't even know our ancestry some of us have no connection with the past or with oral stories we're just floating out in the world and no matter what we have can do we have to clean our own room as jordan pearson would say and start reaching across that line and bringing the adolescents over over bringing the children over we have to help them we have not helped them it is getting worse that line there are less adults than ever and there are billions of adolescent adults and adolescents and children that need our help and what are you going to do are you going to sit and live like a recluse are you going to give up the opportunity to help the rest the rest of time this isn't just about the next generation what happens with the united states of america this is your one mark on the world in the next generations and the story after sitting here for four plus hours what are you going to do let me know you are probably already a part of the course and i'm here with you to work together to do whatever we can to whatever we can mastermind to bring in a loving way in an open way anyone we can over and then start i hate to say it a movement start the revolution but it won't be a revolution because it will be stillness it will be quiet there won't be any things on the street. There won't be any vengeance or retribution. It'll be a revolution of the soul. And if you're with me, when this video is about to end, contemplate in silence where you came from, where you are going, most importantly, where you are right now. Thank you guys for being here. Love every single one of you guys. From my voice to your consciousness, back to my heart. Peace.